April 20. Can one continue to drift like this? Must one not now decide upon some direction, some course? I should like to lay all the given facts out before me, as one arranges a bridge hand, and make my decisions on mathematical considerations. What do I actually want in life? Which is within the conceivable realm of possibility? For myself, I would wish, one, a happy, balanced personal life, and two, work which I considered positive. The first of these is out of the question because of the tragedy that has occurred. The second is out of the question, largely because I am an American. If a people were only deluded, you might do something about it. But when it is biologically undermined and demoralized, there is no future for it, regardless of the outcome of the war. But to suffer the consequences of its deficiencies. Someone with power might be able to do something about this, but no one has power in America. The system makes no provision for it, and it is probable that anyone who set about to overthrow the system in order to attain power would, if successful, merely open the floodgates to evils worse than anything he thought to combat and end up by making himself the tool of the forces of disintegration. The only solution, then, personally, is gardening, or the sort of glorified gardening called gentleman farming. That is perhaps the only form of playing with toys which is not ridiculous in elderly men, and it gives us a chance to acquit our responsibilities toward at least a small section of that earth which, in the main, we men have so abominably misused and disfigured. Stronger, though more defensive in quality, than this wish for myself is the wish for my family, that they may be preserved from the cruelty of others and from natural catastrophe, and that the children shall have an opportunity to grow up in peace and health. What offers these assurances? There is a real problem. Neither the Foreign Service nor farming offers any complete assurances along these lines. The ideal thing would be to combine the two, for the same sort of catastrophe is not likely to hit both of them simultaneously. The Foreign Service is pure drudgery. Its sole merit is that it pays a cash income. Otherwise, it has no significance. If it were not for the family, I should probably not remain in it a day longer than I needed to. On the other hand, having the family, I cannot see my way clear to leaving it. I cannot ask wife and children to follow me into a sort of early Christian renunciation of this world, such as farming would be, to renounce all the advantages of education and all social amenities. I can try to hold such a thing in reserve against the possibility of even greater misfortunes, but I cannot sink back into this form of proletarianism at once on the theory that some day I might have to do so anyway. Why are you behaving as you are? Be honest now. You are doing it because you are ashamed and humiliated. Let us rather say I am shocked, discouraged, and humiliated. What I have been guilty of was in my eyes a folly, to be sure, but a minor one, and there were plenty of ameliorating circumstances. That it should have been punished in so grotesque and humiliating a manner is what sets me back. Why, in the name of God, must I be pursued by misfortune in this relentless way? But you still haven't answered my question. Why are you behaving as you are and not in some other way? Because I cannot face these people now. I am burning inside with rage and humiliation. To think that I, George Kennan, should be in the position of having to conceal anything. If I go among them and lead a normal life and the thing later comes out, I have made myself a double hypocrite. I should have to withdraw from them anyway, then. I should rather do it now and anticipate them. Furthermore, what to me is life among them? I have done my duty towards them. I cannot in the circumstances do any more, nor can they, God knows, do anything for me. But you didn't think of that before. Yes, I did, occasionally. But this gave a great and final push to it. There is, of course, a certain element of stubborn boyish waywardness in it. 
I have been thwarted as I was when I was a boy, and my pride has been hurt. As then, I react by breaking things, figuratively. I say if I can't have the real things, I shall not allow myself to be put off and satisfied with little things. But is that logical? What are the real things you can't have? Women, there's one thing. Liberty is another. Peace of mind's a third. Isn't that enough? Yes, I suppose it is. April 22. The important thing with respect to age is, after all, as in all other things, not what you do, but how you do it. A man is as old as he feels, and the time has come for me to feel old, to force myself to feel old. But if I am to do this, then I must do it with good grace and dignity. That takes courage, resolution, Selbstverfindung, willpower. Above all, it takes the strength of character that enables one not to look back. Why is it necessary that you should feel yourself old? Is this not a stupid, dangerous bit of extremism? For a man to feel himself young in my circumstances means that he must of necessity be very tough of heart, very gay, very well balanced in his human relationships, and relatively irresponsible. I am none of these things. I cannot, therefore, be young successfully, nor can I continue to be young unsuccessfully. The resultant fiascos would soon be too much for me and would affect not only me, but likewise the people I love. May 5. This morning, Patsak told me officially that we would leave here for Lisbon by train a week from today, the 12th, at 10.26 p.m. Valentin Patsak was the German SS captain in charge of Bad Nauheim. This was the news that we have been waiting for in this hotel for 136 long days. I drew up a notice about it, got it signed by the chief, took it down and pinned it to the bulletin board in the deserted front hallway, and returned to my room without feeling any interest in the reactions of my fellow internees. It represented months of labor on the part of many government officials, and months of constant unpleasantness, self-restraint, and trial for those of us who were in charge of the group here. For all of this, many of the people in the group are incapable of feeling understanding, and they will repay us for it with nothing but ingratitude and criticism when they get out, all of which is not of much importance. But now that the break has come, I think that I must resume the writing of notes of this sort as a means of collecting myself mentally and spiritually for the plunge back into life. I am utterly worn out by the strain of living uninterruptedly for five months under one roof with 135 other people among whom I have no single intimate friend, and of trying to save them from dangers for which they have had no appreciation. My own personal life and strength have been so neglected that I have felt during the last four days something close to an incipient disintegration of personality, a condition of spirit devoid of all warmth, all tone, all humor, and all enthusiasm. If this writing will help me to gather and order my spiritual forces again, and writing sometimes does, it will be worth the time. The afternoon was made unpleasant by the voices of other internees, including some of the higher officers, who object to letting all their hand baggage go in the baggage car, except one single overnight bag, and to carrying said overnight bag to the train on the day of departure, as the Germans would have them do. As though it mattered. This on a day when the British have been starting into Madagascar, when the further fate of France hangs in the balance, when thousands of people are dying and hungering cheerfully for what they conceive to be important issues. Oh, my tender charges, if you only knew what burdens you will have to stumble under some day, if civilization is to be held up at all, you would not mind practicing a little right now with your weekend bags. I was so disgusted at the last manifestation of false dignity and sissyishness that I couldn't bring myself to go down to dinner and have locked myself in my room for the evening. May 14. We finally left Bad Nauheim night before last, 
At 8.15 p.m., I had the outer group assembled in the hall of the hotel, and we walked over to the railway station. It was a warm May evening, but overcast. The inhabitants stood along the curbs or in the windows and watched with superficial impassivity the departure of the Americana. Inwardly, most of them probably felt, despite all German military successes, a mixture of hostility, envy, and an uneasy questioning. What if they should win the war after all? At 9.30 the wheels began to move, and our stay in Bad Nauheim, having lasted just about five months, had come to an end. About noontime we were circumventing Paris on the Beltline Railway through the southeast suburbs, an abandoned tennis club, with weeds growing three feet high all over the courts, expressed succinctly the horrible rapidity with which a great city can suddenly lose the spirit of a metropolis and become a mere collection of buildings and ruins in the midst of the countryside. The afternoon found us spinning southward through Orléans and Tours, behind an electric locomotive. Our long train of sleepers, drivers, and baggage cars was evidently a sensation in that subdued occupied area. At lunch, a missive of some sort broke the window across from me in the dining car. The crash was like an explosion, and we all sat motionless and bewildered as the shower of powdery glass fell on the occupants of the table under the window. Somewhere along the way, a man rose up in the middle of a field, unrolled an American flag, and waved it as we passed. In a station where we passed by one of the few French passenger trains we saw, a woman put her head out of a window and made faces at us. Undated From you, embattled comrades in abstention, compatriots to this or that degree, who have shared with me the hardships of detention in Yeshka's grand and guarded hostelry, from you, my doughty champions of the larder, who have fought with such persistency and skill, such mighty hearts, such overwhelming ardor, your uninspiring battle of the swill. From you, my friends, from your aggrieved digestions, from all the pangs of which you love to tell, your dwindling flesh and your enraged intestines, permit me now to take a fond farewell. For five long months you've slept and nursed your bellies, or strolled along the Usa's quiet shores, eaten your rolls and failed to eat your jellies, while others toiled and tramped and fought the wars. The world might choke in food-restricting measures, Chinese might starve and Poles might waste away, but God forbid that you, my tender treasures, should face the horrors of a meatless day. In September, the State Department sent Kennan on a mission to Lisbon, a center of wartime intrigue. As counselor of the U.S. legation in Lisbon, he was to help block the Portuguese from supplying Wolfram to Germany while encouraging them to grant America and Britain naval and air bases in the Azores. George, Annalise, and Joan, Grace was in a Washington boarding school, left for Portugal with a firmer stake in America. In July, they had paid $14,000 for a 238-acre farm in East Berlin, Pennsylvania. The farm was close enough to Washington for getting away on weekends. In a pinch, George calculated, they could wring a living from the land. Washington, August 28. After conferences in the department in the morning, I started back to the country at noon to enter upon the last lap of preparations for another and final tour of war duty abroad. How different these preparations are from the many we have made in the past. Before, there was always the sense of adventure, of hope, of anticipation. This time, these luxuries must go by the board. Six months ago, I was a prisoner in the heart of Germany. Whether we would be exchanged at all seemed, to those of us who were in the know, nip and tuck. I knew that if we were not released, we faced catastrophe— in the sense of deterioration of personality and of physical strength. I learned then that for men who are really on the spot, there is nothing worse than a vacillation between hope and despair. The only ones who really have great strength are those who have great faith or resignation, and possibly they are the same thing. I cannot afford this time to hope that I shall come out of this unscathed. 
The dangers, which again few people realize but myself, are not small, and I am just provoking fate, which has once been kind, by going into them again. In this, my position is no different from that of tens of thousands of men who are now going abroad with the armed forces. And yet I sincerely envy these others. Their responsibilities are relatively few. If they survive at all, they return with the laurels of heroism on their brows, simply by virtue of their participation. In the task they have given me, I cannot succeed. I can hope to do better than other, less experienced men, but what I can do will be known to very few people and appreciated by fewer still, and the effort will probably end in personal catastrophe for myself and the family. That is war, and I record these gloomy prognostications not with any sense of heroism, but because I feel that if I hold them constantly before me, I shall be able to do my job with greater detachment, greater humor, less nervous wear and tear, and, paradoxically, greater enjoyment. What follows is a letter to George's sister, Jeanette. Lisbon, December 1. I have a good-sized job which usually keeps me busy until about seven o'clock in the office. A lot of social obligations go with it. The result is that we have very little time to see Portugal, which is an amazingly beautiful country. We are broke, as usual, but the edge is taken off the hardship by the realization that there is always the farm at home. I am neither happy nor unhappy. It's not the place I should choose to live for my own pleasure. I'm used to the accepted seasons of northern climates, and I don't think I'll ever feel at home in a place, however beautiful, where it never snows, where the hot summer is the dead dormant season, and where the grass gets green and the crops are put out in the fall. But I'm doing my best as best I can. And hell, it's war. 1944 Although the diaries lack entries for 1943, the year proved pivotal in the outcome of the war and in the development of Kennan as a diplomat. With fierce fighting in the Soviet Union, Italy, and the Pacific, the Allies finally won important victories. In Lisbon, Kennan confronted confused orders from the state and war departments regarding negotiating base rights in the Azores. He ignored those instructions and appealed directly to the White House, where President Franklin D. Roosevelt heard Kennan out and endorsed the diplomat's plan for approaching Antonio Salazar, a Portuguese dictator. By March 1944, the State Department had transferred Kennan from Lisbon to London, where he served as political advisor to the ambassador to Great Britain, John G. Winant. Winant was also the U.S. representative on the Anglo-American Soviet European Advisory Commission, EAC, whose responsibility was to agree on plans for the post-war occupation of Germany. In June, the month of the D-Day landing in Normandy, Kennan was appointed to the number two position to the ambassador to the Soviet Union, W. Averill Harriman. With the Germans still occupying much of Europe, Kennan reached Moscow by flying via military transport from Italy to Egypt to Iraq to Iran to Russia. He arrived in Moscow on July 1. Annalise and the children would later join him. March 1944 In instructions to our EAC delegation, there has been no trace of a foreign policy. We have evidently preferred to see the German satellites sink back completely into the arms of the Axis, rather than to depart from unconditional surrender and make political choices. In the case of Germany, our lack of policy is having the following effects. One, we are allowing serious misunderstandings to grow up with the Russians, not over any real issues, but simply through failure to take into account their psychology. War guilt clause. Zones. Two, our proposals for surrender terms indicate an utter absence of concern on our part over the amount of responsibility we are assuming in Germany. They are so phrased as to give the three allies unlimited responsibility for the future of the German nation. They show no desire and no real place for acquiring allies and helpers among the German people. I doubt the soundness of this, even from the military government standpoint, but I am not competent there. Where I know it is unsound is in the sphere of international collaboration in treating the German question. 
If we are not to achieve any real understanding with the Russians on political purposes, let us not, for God's sake, rush into unnecessary responsibilities of governing a great people jointly with them at the most difficult possible moment for any government at all. If we cannot defeat Germany without them, and if we cannot agree with them on the future of Germany, then are we right to insist on our terms of unconditional surrender with the enormous commitments which they contain? What else could we do? We could exploit the fears of the Nazi leaders in order to leave them in control in such territorial and other circumstances that they could not survive. We could drop all talk about war criminals, about our unlimited rights in Germany, etc., and concentrate on such measures of disarmament as would solve the problem of Germany from the standpoint of our war with Japan. This means something like the Russian document. But to be on sound ground, it should be accompanied by a very clear tripartite understanding about the military occupation which is to follow. And in arriving at this understanding, we should press for a minimum rather than a maximum of direct Allied military government and of interference in German internal affairs. We should avoid all measures of disbandment or demobilization. We should plan our own occupational measures in such a way as to constitute a minimum of interference in the internal life of the country. Why be so soft on Germany? In the first place, this is not being soft. Measures of military disarmament constitute the harshest ones in reality that we can take, short of actual physical extermination. Secondly, the other measures, measures other than the ones I have mentioned above, require great policing strength, clear-cut political objectives, and unity of purpose. None of these we have. Without these things, policies of coercion and internal interference have a way of becoming more binding and restricting on the authors of them than on the objects. It is incumbent on the authors of persecution, says Gibbon, previously, to reflect whether they are determined to support it in the last extreme. They excite the flame which they strive to extinguish, and it soon becomes necessary to chastise the contumacy as well as the crime of the offender. On his seven long transatlantic flights in 1942 through 1944, Kennan read much of Edward Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 1776 through 89, it reinforced his belief in the difficulty of any nation succeeding in maintaining long-term control over another. Before we undertake any extensive responsibilities for the running of internal affairs in Germany by means of force and coercion, we would do well to reflect, as Gibbon suggests, whether we are determined to go through with it, come what may. It may require an exertion of force quite out of proportion to the positive results obtained, it may require a ruthlessness now foreign to our troops, a ruthlessness which can serve only to brutalize those troops themselves and to give them the worst possible lessons in the practices of government. It will certainly require to be successful a far greater degree of unity of purpose and method than can conceivably be achieved at this time between the Russians and ourselves. What we must ask ourselves is this. Is it more worth our while to fight the Nazis longer in order to force them to put themselves blindly in our hands, or to ask them to do at once, as a condition of the cessation of hostilities, such things as we wish them to do? What must we accept as our objectives in the case of Germany? When I say accept, I mean in view of our existing commitments. 1. Complete disarmament of Germany. 2. Complete Allied occupation for purposes of assuring, one, and of psychological demonstration. Three, removal of Nazi leadership and punishment of war criminals. Four, reparation and restitution. Points three and four are mutually contradictory and cancel each other out. Suppose we take just one and two. For that, the Russian document suffices beautifully. We must keep quite separate in our minds our program for the treatment of Germany and the type of surrender document we want. The latter should serve the former. If we wish to make our participation in the Commission effective, we must do the following. 1. Replace Mr. Winant by a vigorous, experienced man who can give the Commission his full time and attention. 2. Replace Admiral Stark, Harold R. Stark, as his naval advisor with a single young active officer, whose mission would be to advise the representative, when called upon to do so, on strictly naval matters. 
and who would not correspond direct with the Navy Department on these matters. 3. Have the military advisor cease to be a representative of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and function solely as an independent advisor to the representative. 4. Cause the resolution of the JCS dealing with the work of the Commission to be cancelled. 5. Have the War and Navy Departments. Entry ends. Naples, June 16. I drove around at length with Murphy and Offie in the city. Carmel Offie, William Butlett's former advisor, worked for State Department political advisor Robert Murphy. It was not yet a pleasant sight. People looked reasonably well-fed, but ragged and dirty. The worst of their hardships to me seemed the complete lack of transportation. Once I saw a train of three incredibly dirty and battered tram cars crawling along a street on the outskirts, and at one point an American Red Cross bus seemed to be moving civilians. Otherwise, there appeared to be no public transportation whatsoever, and the collection of ancient horse-drawn vehicles which had been pressed into service was ludicrous and pitiful. We dined at a very melodramatic modern villa on another section of the heights overlooking the city. It was the home of the French representative on the Advisory Council for Italy. We kept off all controversial topics, but behind the pleasant company and the beauty of the evening, there loomed the vast tangle of contradictions and complications, both with ourselves and with the Italians, which must inevitably attend the internal and international restoration of France. With us Americans, it will be particularly difficult. The French know exactly what they want and are quite unreasonable about it. We are the soul of reasonableness and have only the dimmest idea of what we are after. June 17. If there is anything more hopeful than the skill with which our military men pursue the responsibilities of conquest, it is the alacrity with which they again drop them once their possession is no longer in dispute. Sam Reber, Samuel Reber was a member of the Allied Control Commission in Italy, down from Rome for the evening was also at dinner, with tales of SS torture instruments, of bodies without fingernails or toenails, of tons of high explosives hidden in the German embassy. I hear various reports here about German prisoners. Some say they are depressed and discouraged. Others say they are defiant and bitter, that they reproach us for our action, saying that we are destroying the cultural values of Europe and delivering it up to Bolshevism, that we understand nothing of the continent and have no plan for its future. To this, my answer would be, if you drop the rot about Bolshevism, for it was not we who first invited the Russians into Eastern Europe and then attacked them, and if you regard Europe as a cultural museum rather than the seat of a living organic cultural development, then perhaps the reproach is justified. Let us assume in any case that it is, and that we represent a catastrophe for Europe. Then the fault is still with the Germans for having provoked our intervention. We are bound to come over here every time anyone threatens the security of England, and if continental peoples do not wish to bring down upon their heads this dread plague of ununderstanding Americans, they must learn to leave the English alone. Let the Germans take a lesson from this and not repeat their folly. Among the things which I saw today were the records kept of the progress of our long-range strategic bombing and its effects. These records were maintained with a scholarliness, a conscientiousness, a devotion to detail, an imaginativeness of portrayal which were a tribute to the talents of the American people. Tonight I lay in bed while the thunder pounded and echoed through the hills and the rain roared down on the roof of the tent and wondered why it was not possible to put a thousandth part of that energy, that talent, that devotion into the conquest of the social and cultural objectives which so obviously lie ahead of our people. June 18. Lunch at Kirk's Golden Brothel. Kennan would later recall that he had learned much from Alexander Kirk, an eccentric old-school diplomat. A house near the sea which was once the dwelling of a royal mistress. I sat beside the wife of the Soviet representative throughout lunch and afterward and talked to her about Russia. She was, of course, an engineer by training, and was struggling hard, like all official Soviet wives abroad, to reconcile her duties with her feminine instincts. Whoever would understand Russia today should study the Soviet woman, 
not just the bar girls in the Metropole Hotel, but the great mass of women of the educated official class. They are being trained in a manner which, to my knowledge, has never before existed. Emphasis is on the social rather than the personal morals and bearing of the Soviet woman. Her dignity rests not alone on her feminine and maternal functions, but on her function in society. Who does not live in order to love, nor does she love in order to live. Our women work too and are often independent, but it is a different sort of a thing. With us, the personal note is always there, the straining for smartness, the desire to please as a woman, the limbo of a glamorous and successful personal life in the offing. And with us, there is the pride which strives, however unsuccessfully, for independence of thought. In Russia, woman's work is not a decoration to private life, but a stern duty to the state. An independent thought is, as in Nazi Germany, a form of self-corruption, unnecessary, dangerous, immoral, this in both the women and the men is to me the most terrifying and discouraging difference from our own mentality. And I see no end to it. People brought up in that way have an unlimited faith in the guidance of those who are in authority. I see nothing that could break that down. Inconsistencies and reverses in the party line are as nothing to them. If the line changes overnight, there must have been a good reason for it. Setbacks and suffering in national life being always the result of the infernal workings of some persons other than their leaders, leave them cold or even strengthen their glowing faith. And what they are told to believe, they do believe, with fervor and sincerity, even though it may be logically irreconcilable with something else that they believed, with no less fervor and sincerity a year before. After leaving Kirk's, we drove through the harbor district, where I saw destruction worse than anything I had ever seen in one concentrated area, with the possible exception of Rotterdam. Most of it, I am sure, was done by ourselves, and I cannot help but wonder whether it was worth the cost. The talk turned on political matters, and I soon found myself delivering a bitter polemic about the tendency of intolerant regimes to surround themselves with enemies of wicked and diabolic intent and about the way in which they often succeed, through their miserable intolerance, in making real enemies out of people who never needed to be enemies at all. When I am asked whether Mikołajczyk, for example, Stanisław Mikołajczyk was premier of the Polish government in exile in London, or numbers of decent, unhappy Frenchmen, or let's say numbers of Poles and Finns are agents of Hitler, my answer would be, not yet but they probably will end up in that camp if the intolerance and hostility and imperiousness with which they are received elsewhere leaves them no decent choice. As long as these forms of intolerance exist in the United Nations camps, we are going to find ourselves being amazed to learn that still more and more groups of people whom we are accustomed to think of as fairly decent have turned out to be veritable agents of the devil. And if we join with sufficient savagery in the chorus of hatred and vilification, we stand a good chance of making them, in reality, just that. Cairo, June 21. These two days were too alike to describe separately. Egypt, that triangle of irrigated desert around the delta of a polluted stream, was suffering from a heat wave. The hot breath of the Sahara enveloped the miles and miles of brown plaster walls, the mud flats on the outskirts steamed and stunk under the fiery African sky. In the streets of the foreign quarter, the glare lay white and burning between the blank concrete walls of the villas. People barricaded themselves in their houses against the heat, and limousines were parked in shady basement garages that they should not become too hot to sit in. In the evening of the first day, when the sun had set and the sky had cooled, the heat could be felt rising back like steam from the baked earth. Elderly Britishers, groggy from their siesta, sauntered out for their game of golf. Itinerant Arabs, who had lain stretched out in the shade of a wall on the pavement through the heat of the day, arose, shook some of the dirt out of their robes, and began to beat their torpid donkeys into a resumption of the interminable trek from nowhere to nowhere. The jeeps and command cars, coming down the road from the pyramids, past a string of dromedaries plodding slowly, patiently up the timeless hill 
to the timeless desert. In the Hotel Mena, the doors were thrown open to the terraces. The bar began to serve drinks outside. In the music room, surrounded by elaborate Morris gratings, a pale-faced Polish refugee woman with a dog played Chopin on the piano. And a lone rat, sick and confused with the heat, ducked miserably around on the tiled floor among the potted palms, searching for the exit to the darkness and freshness of the garden. At dawn, when I got up to go to the airport, it had become cool, and a clean, fresh air lay over the sleeping city. But the sun was rising, great and ominous, on the cloudless sky, and it would not be long, I knew, before the heat and corruption of the day would descend once more upon the fertile, sinister land. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook, so please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Kennan copied the following letter into the diary. June 21. My own darling Annalise. A few random impressions will perhaps give you the best picture of these last few days. A bucket seat in an air transport command plane from Algiers to Naples, next to a severe and intellectual GI who repeated all the clichés of PM. PM was a left liberal magazine. and took me sternly to task for the reactionary lapses of the State Department. Offy at the airport, lunch with Kirk and Murphy and Offy in a house overlooking the Great Bay. Kirk, full of his usual quips, objects violently to being called the American member on the advisory council, particularly for a man of my age. Dinner in a very modernistic and spectacular villa still higher over the city, where our host was the free French representative. A tent, all to myself, at a military headquarters, where the heavy summer thunder showers droned on the roof at night. Luncheon with many generals and other celebrities. Consultations with an American Air Force general four years younger than myself, and as efficient as any officer I ever saw. The implausible spectacle of slouching, impassive young American kids, running much of the life of Naples and running it pretty damned well. Sam Reber down from Rome with tales of German cruelties and stupidities, Walks in the forests on the hills near Naples. The vast and depressing destruction along the Naples waterfront. Cocktails with royalty, the latter rather laboring the royal prerogative of frankness. Luncheon again at Kirk's with the wife of a Soviet diplomat for my table companion. And all the old potboilers about the wonderfulness of the theater in Moscow. Thirteen-hour trip in bucket seats in a blacked-out plane, too dark to read, from Italy to Egypt. Baghdad, June 23 through 25. The chief impression of Baghdad in the summer, which I carried away from those three days there, was one of claustrophobia. All day we were barricaded in the legation, where the temperature never fell below 90 degrees, by the much fiercer heat outside. We might look out the windows, as one looks out the windows in zero weather in the north, and see the burning, dusty wind tearing at the eucalyptus trees, and the flat, bleached country enveloped in the colorless sunshine of the desert. A sunshine with no nuances, no shades, no shadows. A sunshine which does not even brown the skin, but only strikes and penetrates and dissolves with its unbending hostile power. Into this inferno of heat only mad dogs and Englishmen, as Noel Coward used to sing, could dream of venturing, at night it cooled off considerably, and we slept in reasonable comfort on the roof. But by that time the real mad dogs and the jackals had come in from the desert, and it was not safe to walk in the outlying district where the legation was situated. The only tolerable time of day, when it would have been possible to break out of the prison walls, was the early morning. What of the possibilities of service in Baghdad? a country in which man's selfishness and stupidity have ruined almost all natural productivity, where vegetation can survive only along the banks of the great rivers which traverse its deserts, where climate has become unfavorable to human health and vigor. A population unhygienic in its habits, sorely weakened and debilitated by disease, inclined to all manner of religious bigotry and fanaticism, condemned by the tenets of the most widespread faith to keep a full half of the population 
namely the feminine half, confined and excluded from the productive efforts of a society by a system of indefinite house arrest, deeply affected and bound to be affected by the psychological habits of pastoral life, which have ever been at variance with agricultural and industrial civilization. This people has now come just enough into contact with Western life so that its upper class has a thirst for many things which can be obtained only in the West. Suspicious and resentful of the British, they would be glad to obtain these things from us. They would be glad to use us as a foil for the British, as an escape from the restraints which the British place upon them. If we give them these things, we can perhaps enjoy a momentary favor on the part of those interested in receiving them, but to the extent that we give them, we weaken British influence, and we acquire, whether we wish it or not, responsibility for the actions of the Iraqis. If they then begin to do things which are not in our interests, which affect the world situation in ways unfavorable to our security, and if the British are unable to restrain them, we then have ourselves at least in part to blame, and it is up to us to take the appropriate measures. Are we willing to bear this responsibility? I know, and every realistic American knows, that we are not. Our government is technically incapable of conceiving and promulgating a long-term consistent policy toward areas remote from its own territory. Our actions in the field of foreign affairs are the convulsive reactions of politicians to an internal political life dominated by vocal minorities. Those few Americans who remember something of the pioneer life of their own country will find it hard to view the deserts of Iraq without a pang of interest and excitement at the possibilities for reclamation and economic development. If trees once grew here, could they not grow again? If rains once fell, could they not again be attracted from the inexhaustible resources of nature? Could not climate be altered, disease eradicated? If they are seeking an escape from reality, such Americans may even pursue these dreams— and enter upon the long and stony road which could lead to their fruition. But if they are willing to recall the sad state of soil conservation in their own country, the vast amount of social improvements to be accomplished at home, and the inevitable limitations on the efficacy of our type of democracy in the field of foreign affairs, then they will restrain their excitement at the silent, expectant possibilities of the Iraqi desert, and will return like disappointed but dutiful children to the sad deficiencies and problems of their native land. I had occasion, during the period I was in Iraq, to reflect on the Polish-Russian question. For millions of people in our country, this question has become the test of the willingness of Russia to pursue a decent, humane, and cooperative policy in Europe. If Russia is prepared to pursue such a policy, then the tremendous latent possibilities of American-Russian relations have before them an open road to fruition. If not, then there remains for the Anglo-Saxon powers only the division of Western Europe into spheres of influence and the establishment of a relationship to Russia which can serve the interests of neither party. For many people in our country, the attitude of Russia in the Polish problem will be the touchstone of Russia's relations with the West. I think that I understand as well as anyone the complications of the Russian position— it is, of course, not the territorial question which causes the real difficulty, but the question of the Polish government. Here the Soviet government is making things unnecessarily hard for itself, and it is clear that those responsible for Soviet policy are either incorrectly informed by persons within their own sphere of authority, or have arrived at an incorrect appraisal of the situation. Reasonable people everywhere will understand that the current policies of the Soviet government with all their tremendous importance for the future of Europe, cannot and must not be compromised by disputes over past errors in judgment of individual groups or individuals within the Soviet government. I am sure that the Polish government, whatever tactical mistakes it may have made in the past, would understand this as well as anybody else at the present moment. The demand in Russia for the complete suppression and liquidation of the Polish government, with all its records and archives and memories, may serve the interests of certain groups within the Soviet government who know themselves to be responsible for past mistakes. It will not serve the interests of the Soviet government or of the Soviet people as a whole. For if the present Polish government is ruined and driven to despair, 
It will merely become the core of a Polish emigration which for years will continue to make propaganda over the alleged excesses of Russian authorities toward Polish forces and civilians during the period of the Russo-German non-aggression pact. Whereas, if any reasonable arrangement can be made with that government, and such an arrangement would not necessarily preclude either extensive territorial arrangements or the reconstitution of the Polish government to include people such as Vincenzi Vitos and others, there can be no doubt that the Polish leaders would be willing enough to let bygones be bygones. Vincenti Vitos was a former Polish premier, and the Russian government would always have, in its own tremendous strength, the guidance of that undertaking. If the present course is continued, it means that the entire international future of Russia is to be jeopardized for the internal political security of a few individuals in Russia who once gave unsound advice, or who took unsound decisions. Tehran, June 28. I went for a walk in the evening. I was surprised to find myself in a city that seemed, after all, very Russian. In the straight cobbled street, the high fences, the Russian signs, the crowds strolling in the evening darkness, and the cosmopolitan babble of tongues, I could even sense the familiar breath of summer evenings years ago in Reval. It was impressive to think of those two capitals, so far apart and yet so near, bound together by that vast, fluid influence which is Russia. I began today to read a collection of wartime articles of Ilya Ehrenberg. Ehrenberg was a prominent Soviet journalist and novelist. Under the title of War, and I was greatly disappointed in it, it is nothing but the nastiest type of wartime propaganda, devoid of every appreciation of the tragedy of this war, replete with accusations against the Germans on points which a Soviet writer might better have passed over in silence, unless what is evil in a German becomes good in a Russian, full of the most childish distortion and misrepresentation of cited texts, lacking in any attempt to understand seriously the nature of the enemy with whom we are dealing can it be that Russia's case in this war is so weak that it can be defended only by this mendacious, abusive drivel? I find it hard to believe. Ehrenberg's style is no more elevated, his distortions no less ugly and shameful, his intellectual position no loftier than those of Dr. Goebbels. Either something is wrong with Ehrenberg or something is wrong with Russia's position in this war— no one with a clean conscience need descend to such abusiveness. Nor are the faults of the Nazis so complex and subtle that they should require such vehement exaggeration to make them plausible to the reader. Moscow, July 1. At Stalingrad, everything except the airport building, which they were still working on, appeared to have been destroyed. How deeply one sympathizes with the Russians when one encounters the realities of the lives of the people and not the propagandistic pretensions of their government. August 1. Had dinner last night at the British Embassy with the Polish Prime Minister, Mikołajczyk, and the members of his entourage. They had now been here two days. The Prime Minister had seen Molotov. Vyacheslav Molotov was the Soviet Foreign Minister. He had not yet seen Stalin. He himself was apparently encouraged by his talk with Molotov. The members of his entourage were depressed. The British ambassador proposed a toast to the success of their mission, and since Mikołajczyk had been encouraged to come here by our president and by the British prime minister, we clearly had to maintain a general attitude of confidence and good cheer. I found the evening a hard one. I was probably the only non-Pole present who had enough experience of Eastern Europe to be thoroughly aware of factors involved. I knew that an agreement between the Poles and the Russians would be possible. I knew that such an agreement could even contain strong assurances of the independence of Poland. I knew that there could be solemn engagements on the part of the Russians not to interfere in Polish internal affairs. I knew that the Red Army itself, during its period of occupation, would be entirely dignified and decent in its attitude toward the Poles. But I also knew that entirely regardless of present intentions— the force of circumstances would eventually transform such an agreement from a charter into a harness for the Poles, that Russians in the long run would be no more inclined at present than they were a hundred years ago 
to accept the contradiction of the grant to Poland of rights which were not yet given in Russia, that Russian conceptions of tolerance would not go far beyond those things with which Russians were themselves familiar, that the Russian police system would inevitably seep into Polish life unless sharp measures were taken on the Polish side to counteract it, and that such countermeasures would inevitably be deemed provocative and anti-Russian in Moscow. I knew, in short, that there is no border zone of Russian power. The jealous and intolerant eye of the Kremlin can distinguish, in the end, only vassals and enemies, and the neighbors of Russia, if they do not wish to be the one, must reconcile themselves to being the other. In the face of this knowledge, I could only feel that there was something frivolous about our whole action in this Polish question. I reflected on the light-heartedness with which great powers offer advice to smaller ones in matters affecting the vital interests of the latter. I was sorry to find myself for the moment a part of this, and I wished that instead of mumbling words of official optimism, we had had the judgment and the good taste to bow our heads in silence before the tragedy of a people who have been our allies, whom we have saved from our enemies, and whom we cannot save from our friends. August 2. Much news today. Turkey had broken relations with Germany. In Finland, Mannerheim replaced Ritty. Karl Gustav Mannerheim, who negotiated an armistice with the Soviets, replaced Risto Ritty, who had cooperated with the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Our troops had broken out of Normandy. The Russians had driven through to the sea, near Tukums, Latvia. In Riga, there would be general relief that the Germans were leaving, rejoicing in a few at the approach of the Red Army, panic among a few others, and finally among the majority a sense of bitterness and sadness that the dream of national independence, which for one brief period had once become reality, was never again to be realized in their time. And perhaps it is hardly worth mentioning that if, after the vicissitudes of the last five years, any people still remained in Riga who had been brought up to love the gentler things of life, such things as quietness and privacy and personal dignity, those people must have reached the stage of total despair. For there will be no place for them in Eastern Europe within the field of contemplation of people living today. Of most of this, the Red Army troops, bathing in the faintly salty waves of the Gulf, washing off the grime of an unprecedented military campaign, will have been ignorant. To all of it, they will have been indifferent. The nationalist aspirations of the Letts they will despise, as lacking power and grandeur. The personal fastidiousness of those who have cultivated the art of living will seem to them, if they ever run across it, a useless and foppish idiosyncrasy. Only the future is interesting, not the past. And theirs, in their own smug conviction, is the wave of the future. August 3. Lunch at the embassy with the Polish Prime Minister and his suite. He was due to see Stalin later in the day. One of the Poles asked me point-blank what I thought of their chances. I replied that I thought the Russians, all things considered, wanted an agreement but that I could not imagine that they would be inclined to go far out of their way to get it. I thought that the Poles could consider themselves well out of it if they could reach any satisfactory arrangement which would make it possible for Poles in exile to return to their native country and work there for its future. But I warned him that I usually leaned to the pessimistic side and advised him to take that into account. August 4. In bed all day with a cold perused various documents, including our government's proposals for what we call, with refreshing simplicity, an international organization, the United Nations. By this is meant the international organization which is henceforth to keep us all at peace, and which we propose to discuss in the forthcoming conversations in Washington. It was a long and detailed document, designed apparently to preserve a status quo. What that status quo is, we don't know. And official Washington says, in effect, like Woodrow Wilson many years ago, it doesn't matter what the status quo is if we get the document. Ours is a unique system of the conduct of foreign affairs. 
There are other countries which are democracies, but none of these has our strength or our favorable strategic situation. They are all threatened by dangers so formidable and so permanent that they are compelled to be relatively serious and realistic in their foreign policies. Otherwise, catastrophe rapidly overtakes them. None of them can afford to make foreign policy the football of internal popularity-seeking. In our country, the conduct of foreign affairs, and particularly of policy toward Europe, is governed by strange rules. Our people, having grown up chiefly from the most varied European elements, the affairs of Europe rarely fail to strike chords in one sector or another of our public opinion. This is particularly true of the foreign language and recently arrived groups. And it just happens that these groups, which still retain the European passion for organization, exercise a degree of political power in our country far greater proportionately than the older American elements themselves. Almost no step can be taken by our government in European affairs that does not arouse criticism in one or the other of these groups. But no president wants to risk criticism. The result is that public opinion acts as a constant paralyzing factor on the formulation of policy toward Europe. To this must be added the fact that the average American of longer standing, being himself incapable of understanding the Europeans, finds it comforting to wish a plague upon them all and to take refuge in the sense of self-righteousness, which is his American birthright. In his mind, there is something sinful about Europe and about those who interest themselves in it. He regards any serious preoccupation with its problems in a born American as a suspicious thing, smacking of immorality and betrayal of the simple American virtues. The president who gets involved in European affairs receives his censure. The president who strikes an attitude of moral superiority and aloofness toward Europe receives his praise. Newer elements who still have axes to grind in Europe exploit this popular prejudice and when anything is done by our government in Europe which arouses their displeasure, they quickly interpret it to the country at large as a departure from sound American principles. All in all, our entire system of government runs counter to the creation and pursuance of a considered, consistent European policy. Such a policy could be created and pursued only by specialists and professionals. We persist in placing foreign affairs in the hands of amateurs. Such a policy could be created and pursued only with discretion, without any tipping of our hand. We insist that all our cards should be face up on the table so that the American people and everybody else can see them. The American public is by no means indifferent to Europe. It has certain definite demands to make on Europe. It would like Europe to be well-mannered and peaceful and stable. It would like things arranged in such a way that we would not be bothered by Europe would not have to think about it, in particular that we should not have to go to war in consequences of Europe's quarrels. It becomes the duty of every president and every secretary of state to cater to these conflicting demands of the American public, the demand that we should remain undefiled by contact with the sordid and detailed realities of Europe, and the demand that our government should take action to prevent Europe from becoming a source of trouble and the unvarying tendency of these presidents and secretaries, when confronted with this dilemma, is to take refuge in general and abstract schemes, which can serve at once to conceal the absence of a real policy, to cater to the American fondness for dealing high moral principles, and to throw unto other governments the responsibility for future outbursts of violence. Underlying the whole conception of an organization for international security, is the simple reasoning that if only the status quo could be rigidly preserved, there could be no further wars in Europe, and the European problem, as far as our country is concerned, would be solved. This reasoning, which mistakes the symptoms for the disease, is not new. It underlay the Holy Alliance, the League of Nations, and numerous other political structures set up by nations which were, for the moment, satisfied with the international setup and did not wish to see it changed. These structures have always served the purpose for which they were designed, just as long as the interests of the great powers gave substance and reality to their existence. The moment that this situation changed, the moment it became in the interests of one or the other of the great powers to alter the status quo, none of these treaty structures ever stood in the way of such alteration.
International political life is something organic, not something mechanical. Its essence is change. And the only systems for the regulation of international life which can be effective over long periods of time are ones sufficiently subtle, sufficiently pliable, to adjust themselves to the constant change in the interests and power of the various countries involved. An international organization for preservation of the peace and security cannot take the place of a well-conceived and realistic foreign policy. The more we ignore politics and our absorption with the erection of a legalistic system for the preservation of the status quo, the sooner and the more violently that system will be broken to pieces under the realities of international life. The provisions of our proposals designed to prevent a great nation from conquering and dominating a small nation reflect a thinking which is naive and out of date. We ignore completely the time-honored conception of the puppet state, which underlies all political thought in Asia and Russia, and occasionally appears in Eastern and Central Europe as well. This conception alone mocks any legalistic formulas for the regulation of international life. Try asking the head of the Outer Mongolian Republic whether Mongolia has any grievances against Russia. He will pale at the thought. He is personally in the power of the Russian police system, and his people live under the shadow of the Red Army. Why should we suppose that it will be otherwise among the regimes agreeable to Moscow, which are being set up along Russia's western border? Can't we see that the greater the degree of Russian domination, the less apt they will be to complain about it? Can't we see that they will be in the position of prisoners whose terror of their immediate jailers is far too great and too immediate to permit them to risk an appeal to a higher and more distant authority? Or to take another metaphor, the position of those victims of American gangsterdom, whose fear of the certain vengeance of the gangsters prevented them from seeking the less certain protection of the police. The conception of law in international life should certainly receive every support and encouragement that our country can give it, but it cannot yet replace power as the vital force for a large part of the world and the realities of power will soon seep into any legalistic structure which we erect to govern international life. They will permeate it. They will become the content of it, and the structure will remain only the form. International security will depend on them, on the realities of power, not on the structure in which they are clothed. And we are being almost criminally negligent of the interests of our people if we allow our plans for an international organization to be an excuse for failing to occupy ourselves seriously and minutely with the sheer power relationships of the European peoples. August 6. Mikowajczyk saw Stalin as scheduled day before yesterday. Stalin showed interest in his statements about underground activity in Poland, on which it is unlikely that Stalin had previously been accurately informed, manifested a willingness to explain the Russian attitude about frontiers, but referred Mikowajczyk to the Polish Committee for the all-important question of changes in the Polish government. This was the Lublin Committee of pro-Soviet Poles. Yesterday, the Polish Committee leaders, accompanied by a hitherto unknown figure called Bierut, who was described as president of the Polish National Council, arrived at the Moscow airport and were received with great pomp and with all the honors usually accorded to very distinguished visiting statesmen. Bolesław Birut. All this was given publicity in the Soviet press, but not a word was said to indicate that the arrival had anything to do with Mikowajczyk. The Soviet public, in fact, has never been told that Mikowajczyk is here. Meanwhile, in Warsaw, Mikowajczyk's supporters have allegedly seized whole portions of the city and are desperately trying to hold them against the Germans, while Russian troops lie across the river in the Praha suburbs. There is apparently no liaison between the two forces, and there is some suspicion that the Russians are deliberately withholding support, finding it by no means inconvenient that the Germans and the members of Mikowajczyk's underground should destroy each other. The British here have now sent a written communication to the Soviet government asking that the Red Army arrange for the dropping of supplies and munitions to the beleaguered Poles. The answer which the Russians give will tell us a good deal about the future of international collaboration in Europe, more, perhaps, than the conversation which Mika Wysik will be having today with the members of the Polish Committee. September 18. 1. 
There has been no change in Soviet policy since Moscow and Tehran. The Moscow Foreign Ministers Conference convened on October 1943. The Tehran Summit Conference met in late November, early December 1943. The Soviet government, since the time of Munich, has never relaxed its determination to have a fairly extensive sphere of influence in certain neighboring areas of Europe and Asia in which its power would be unchallenged. In the mind of the Kremlin, this has been a sine qua non for Soviet post-war policy. In contemplating and discussing collaboration with other great powers, they have always gone on the assumption that this requirement would be at least tacitly recognized. They have also never envisaged that collaboration with other powers would mean the permanent relaxation of any of the controls they have set up to prevent the outside world from learning too much about Russia and the Russian people from learning too much about the outside world. Two. Of Moscow and Tehran, and immediately thereafter, the Soviet government, feeling it essential not to offend unnecessarily public opinion in the Western countries, took pains not to emphasize these aspects. In the spring of this year, their sense of dependence on the Western powers was lessened, and they became more open in the promulgation of these policies. Three. There is probably no threat nor allurement which could cause them to part in good faith and permanently from their sphere of influence policy. Their stand on this matter has been more intransigent by a certain type of development with respect to Poland and the Baltic states. These developments have apparently left a sensitive nerve somewhere in the highest Soviet political circles, which prevents their being entirely reasonable on this subject. Four. We must find a means to adjust ourselves and our plans to this situation. If we approach it realistically, I do not think that the Soviet position need be a cause for the peace of the world. If we are to adjust ourselves successfully to Russia's position, we must do the following. A. We must reconcile ourselves to the fact that the Russians will insist on having in addition to those areas which they are incorporating into the Soviet Union, a certain sphere of interest along their western border. They themselves have probably not made up their minds exactly how far this sphere will extend and are waiting partly to see how we will react to their efforts toward expansion. We must determine in conjunction with the British the limit of our common vital interests on the continent, i.e. the line beyond which we cannot afford to permit the Russians to exercise unchallenged power or to take purely unilateral action. We must make it plain to the Russians in practical ways and in a friendly but firm manner where this line lies. In this way, without the necessity of any direct discussions with the Russians, I think we can reach an effective understanding as to how far we each can go. We must be prepared to use all the means at our disposal to maintain our position in this respect. B. Having reached a basic understanding in this way, we can proceed to accept Russian participation in whatever arrangements can be established for international collaboration in the interest of peace and security. These arrangements may not be as far-reaching and binding as we would have liked to have them, but reinforced by a realistic understanding with the Russians, they would probably bear up well enough. In doing this, however, we must remember that broad generalities, such as collaboration or democracy, have different meanings for the Russians than for us. We must not expect them to enter into forms of detailed collaboration which run counter to their traditional conceptions of Russian state security. Despite his criticism of the Soviet government, Kennan delighted in the Russian people and their culture. Returning to Moscow after a seven-year absence, he found himself fascinated with it every minute, it gave me an indescribable sort of satisfaction to feel myself back again in the midst of these people, with their tremendous pulsating warmth and vitality. I sometimes feel that I would rather be sent to Siberia among them, which is certainly what would happen to me without delay if I were a Soviet citizen, than to live on Park Avenue among our own stuffy folk. That yearning for closeness with the Russians made it harder for Kennan to accept that, because of Kremlin-imposed restrictions on contact between Soviet citizens and foreigners, I must always remain a distrusted outsider. Kennan to Jeanette Kennan Hotchkiss, October 8, 1944, Kennan Papers. 
1945. The year 1945 was one of transition for Kennan, with the death of President Franklin D. Roosevelt on April 12 and the surrender of Nazi Germany on May 8, U.S. policy shifted toward Kennan's preference for a tougher line against the Kremlin. During what would turn out to be his last year as a relatively unknown diplomat, Kennan journeyed to Siberia. There he enjoyed mixing with ordinary Russians and even some Soviet officials. Trip to Novosibirsk and Stalinsk Stalinsk was later renamed Novokuznetsk. June 1945 Left Moscow on Saturday, June 9 at 3 p.m. on the Trans-Siberian Express. Within little more than an hour, we were stopping at Zagorsk and suffering the first of those invasions of women and children selling food, which were to beset us at every station for four days and nights. Barefoot or be slippered, but always with clean scarfs on their heads, looking exactly the same at one station as at another, they came bearing their offerings. Milk, fresh, boiled or curdled, cottage cheese, cream, eggs, raw or hard-boiled, radishes, berries, pancakes, boiled potatoes, onions, garlic, pickled carrots. In Siberia, butter. Some of them traded at wooden stands, set back a bit from the tracks, but most of them did business at trainside. There, on the black cinder track, hard-trodden and greasy with the oil and the droppings from the trains, under the feet of the milling crowds of passengers, train personnel, and station hangers-on, without regard for the clouds of soot and dust, a thriving business was done. Milk was cheerfully poured from old jugs into empty vodka flasks or army canteens. Greasy cakes were fingered tentatively by hands black with train soot. Arguments ran their course, bargains were struck, Passengers pushed their way triumphantly back to the cars, clutching their acquisitions, and timid little girls with bare feet, who had not succeeded in selling their offerings, stood by in sad but tearless patience, awaiting with all the stoicism of their race the maternal wrath which would await them when the train had gone and they would return home with their tidbits unsold. Sometimes odd items were offered. American corned beef went for thirty rubles a can, a can of Vienna sausage, Derby Foods, Inc., Chicago, was held up for sale at one station for 125 rubles. A Red Army officer who looked at it turned away in disgust. I've been eating that stuff for four years, he muttered. He won't get 125 rubles for it. There was little bickering. Where it occurred, it was generally over quantity, not price. In view of the great variety of receptacles used by buyers and sellers, each had to supply his own, there was considerable vagueness and sometimes disagreement over quantities. Strong words were passed, but they were passed for the most part with humor and good nature. I witnessed one scene where a soldier, surrounded by a sympathetic crowd of onlookers, accused an old peasant woman of tricking him over a purchase of milk. "'You'd better be careful, little mother,' he said gaily. "'Not to run across me in the other world. The archangels are all my friends.' To the crowd's delight, the old girl crossed herself anxiously, and the incident ended in general laughter. The car was captained and tended by two husky and good-natured girls, Zinya and Marusia. They had a tiny kitchen where they made tea from a samovar for the passengers. They fed the samovar from scraps of wood which they picked up along the right-of-way. It was their duty to emerge with little red flags at every stop, guard the entrance to the car and drive off the ragged little boys and other species of humanity who tried to hide on the steps, the couplings, or the bumpers. This task they performed with vigor and dignity, but without exasperation. They took turns at their duties, one sleeping while the other worked. Most of the passengers were pleasant to me, but we didn't talk much. Only one evening, when I produced copies of our Russian magazine— as part of the wartime alliance, the Soviets allowed the U.S. Embassy to distribute a glossy Russian-language magazine about life in the United States. A lively meeting formed in the corridor of the car. The party organizer at once took charge and made a speech about how they were worried about the future, how they had trusted Roosevelt but weren't sure about Truman. And look at this fellow Hearst. We had a lively hour of fraternization, then suddenly everybody began to look guiltily over his shoulder and the meeting quietly dispersed. After that, Russian inhibitions claimed their own, and hardly anyone spoke to me for two days. 
We were now on the sector of densest traffic, and we were only one link in the long chain of trains, tiny trains against the surrounding distances, crawling eastward like worms, haltingly and with innumerable interruptions across the dusty, swampy steppes of Barabinsk. We stopped more than we moved, and when we stopped, we could see the freight trains piling up behind us and hear them whistling for the right of way with the deep, throaty voice which only trains in Russia and America have and which brings nostalgia to every American heart. There was a warm, dusty wind. Everything in the car was gritty with soot and dust. When the train stopped among the swamps, we climbed down the embankment, took off our shirts, splashed off the yellow scum from the surface of the swamp water, and washed our hands in the cool, dark liquid from underneath. At nine o'clock in the evening, ninety-eight hours out from Moscow, we clattered slowly across the long bridge over the Ob and pulled up the grade into the station at Novozibirsk. Alexander Vladimirovich Tereshenko, deputy chairman of the Novozibirsk City Soviet, was standing on the platform when the train pulled in, uncomfortable in the necktie, jacket, and hat, which had been deemed to befit the occasion, sweating profusely and wondering what the hell he was in for. The sight of my unprepossessing figure, wilted by four days of jolting and fasting, took him slightly aback, and I think he wondered whether the hat, at least, could not have been spared. Alexander Vladimirovich and I sat down to supper. I had no appetite and could eat and drink little. Vodka, Ryabinovka, a berry liquor, river fish, salmon, cold meat, radishes, cucumbers, cheese, hard-boiled eggs, bread and butter, soup, beer, steak, fried potatoes, fried eggs, cake, and tea were all successively set before me. Each refusal was taken as an indication that the respective dish was not good enough and served only to stimulate my host and the waitress to new feats of hospitality. I had to listen to the first of those cries of, Mr. Cannon, why don't you eat? You don't like it? What? which were to pursue me through and out of Siberia. The construction and operation of one of the world's greatest opera theaters in a remote and still straggling community like Novozibirsk seemed to me to be a rather breathtaking venture. It is interesting to recall in this connection that the funds for the enterprise were refused by the central government and were therefore put up entirely by the oblast district itself. There could be no more flamboyant a repudiation of the past, no more arrogant expression of confidence in the future than the erection of this almost mystical structure on the remote banks of the Ob. There are undoubtedly tremendous engineering and artistic talents in the people of Siberia. I have no doubt that much more will be done in the next few years to elevate human life on the steppes and in the forests of Siberia out of the squalor. But that this life can ever be elevated at one stride to the grandiose conception of the Novozabirsk Opera House, I would doubt. And unless it is, the building must remain what it is today, an incongruous dream out of relation to its own surroundings. My host, Mr. Borodulin, proposed that we do Novozabirsk in one evening. Of this occasion, Kennan would recall, for one lovely evening I was, to all intents and purposes, a member of the Soviet governing elite. He evidently had a position of considerable importance in the party, which gave him a local prestige out of proportion to his official title. We first repaired to the new railroad station, certainly one of the greatest in the Soviet Union, where we forced an unshaven and somewhat bewildered station master to show us the place from top to bottom. As Soviet stations go, it was not a bad one. I was favorably impressed by the rooms for women with small children where they had nurses and doctors, showers and playrooms. The impression would have been better if one woman had not pulled at the station master's coattails and howled that she and her children had been there for days and days and had never been able to get a ticket to move on. From there we went to the park to see the Isadora Duncan dancing troupe. The audience seemed pleased enough but I was personally glad for Isadora Duncan that she had not lived to share the experience. We ended up at the circus where all that remained was the lion-taming act, in which the lion took raw meat from the mouth of a female lion-tamer. The appearance of the latter was so formidable that we were inclined to give the lion the edge on bravery of the two. This act, however, accompanied by somewhat dolorous sounds of the band, made us both drowsy, and we decided to terminate our coverage of Novozabirsk nightlife.
Kuznetsk, June 20. We went to the Palace of Culture, which is simply a labor union club. The building had been turned into a military hospital during the war and had only recently been reconverted for use by labor union members. It had various rooms for amateur theatricals, musical organizations, chess, etc. There was a good library of several thousand volumes. On the top floor, there was a technical museum devoted to the metallurgical plant, with models of all the shops, specimens of the raw materials, finished products, etc., in one room, there was a great book mounted on a pedestal with considerable formality in which were registered the names of Stakhanovites at the plant. Stakhanovites were Soviet workers who achieved far beyond the required norms of their factories. Since 70% of the young workers at the plant are now understood to be Stakhanovites, I must assume that only the leading ones enjoyed the honor of being registered in this way. Upon leaving the museum, we came upon a large hall in which exhibits were being put up on the walls in preparation for the celebration of the anniversary of the German attack on Russia. To my amusement and to the acute discomfort of my hosts, some of the exhibits were beautiful large-scale charts showing the plant production figures which had been so carefully concealed from me up to that time. The result was that we marched through that hall at a fast clip, and I was not encouraged to linger over the individual exhibits. Every reasonable observer understands the strain which the war placed on Soviet life and the sacrifices which had to be made. There are few of these wartime difficulties which would not meet with sympathetic and tactful understanding on the part of any fair-minded foreigner, if placed frankly and honestly before him. But what is annoying is the unceasing insistence on the part of the Soviet official that what they are showing is an advanced and highly democratic form of union organization obviously superior to anything that exists in Western countries. As long as this arrogant and unintelligent pretense is maintained, the open-eyed foreign observer will naturally tend to view with skepticism and some irritation the scanty and carefully chosen revelations of Soviet trade union activity which are served up to him, and he will find it much harder than otherwise to forgive his hosts for the glaring inadequacies with which their system, judged by Western standards, still abounds. On Thursday, June 21, I returned to Novosibirsk. From the housekeepers who had looked after me during my stay in Stalinsk, I parted with a mutual show of emotion which would have done justice to a residence of months instead of days. I had one day to spend in Novosibirsk before I could start for home. I suggested a swim. We rattled down to the banks of the Ob in the Gorky Fliver. I undressed and swam, and then we sat on a rock in the stinging Siberian sunshine. Little naked boys poked along the shore in a leaky old rowboat, as boys will do everywhere. Downstream, the long freight trains crawled slowly eastwards across the bridge on the main line of the Trans-Siberian. The cars and locomotives silhouetted like little black toys against the bright sky. Across the river, you could see the other trains lined up and waiting for their chance to cross. Far upstream were the faint outlines of the other bridge, the new one, for the coal trains from Stalinsk. The beach we sat on was stony and unimproved. Behind us was a bathhouse, but it was run down and faded and obviously closed. The guide assured me that someday there would be great improvements here, wonderful parks and bathhouses and athletic facilities. That the effort would be made I did not doubt. I only wondered whether again, as in the case of the Opera House, Russian imagination and Russian dreams of grandeur, unencumbered as usual by any desire to connect past and future, would not cut loose from all connection with reality and begin some fantastic colossus of a project, build part of it hastily and with bad materials, never finish it, and then leave the beginnings to rot away, or be used for other utterly incongruous purposes." Meanwhile, the Ob, of course, would continue to flow its tranquil course toward the northern sea, and probably, regardless of what marvels had or had not been constructed on shore, for countless summers naked little boys would continue to find leaky old rowboats and to pole their way up and downstream on summer days, shouting and splashing, cutting their feet on the rocks, and making astounding discoveries about the nature of rivers and the contents of river bottoms. I had decided to return by air. I sat next to a little old working woman who had the hands of a man who was a member of the Central Committee of the Union of Building Trades, 
and who was going to Sverdlovsk for a meeting. She was illiterate, but bright and alert. She talked at length during the flight to Omsk, and her observations on the flight and on life in general had all the pungency and charm of the mental world of those who had never known the printed word. When we stopped for an hour or two at Omsk in the blinding heat of midday, I shared my picnic lunch with her under the shade of the tail fin of the plane, and she made me read aloud to her from Alexei Tolstoy's Peter the First. Gradually, we were joined by other passengers, and before the time finally came for the takeoff, I found myself reading to half the plane's company. We arrived at Sverdlovsk in a pouring rain. Kennan and the other passengers were stranded for a while at the airport outside Sverdlovsk. One of my fellow travelers was the party secretary, Mr. Borodulin, with whom I had done Novosibirsk one evening. We had encountered each other again in the plane like old friends, and he now stuck by me loyally. He succeeded in wrangling a room with four beds for the two of us, and in keeping out several other importunate passengers who were looking for a place to sleep. His method was very simple. Looking them quietly in the eye, he would say, You take those bundles of yours and get out of here. There must have been something in the tone of voice which revealed the nature of the authority behind this demand, because the invaders invariably withdrew silently and without complaint. The following morning the rain was still streaming down. It appeared that it might be a technical possibility of finding transportation to Sverdlovsk for the day, but there was no assurance that one could get back. The hours of the morning wore on. Borodulin and I got fed up with the uncertainty, and he decided to turn on the heat. He found a telephone, and for half an hour he jiggled the receiver and shouted. His efforts were Herculean and successful. About an hour later, the crew appeared from somewhere, looking slightly shamefaced. The truck was rolled up. We drove out to the leaky Douglas, got the motor started, and soon were off into a solid bank of cloud, destined for Kazan. There was no assurance that we would get to Moscow but the director of the airport at Sverdlovsk had concluded that his Sunday would be more peaceful without us. At Kazan, we were bustled off once more to an airport hotel. Moscow, it seemed, was having a victory parade, and the Moscow airport would accept no more planes that day. We would have to stay overnight. Again, Borodulin and I snatched the best room and barricaded ourselves against all comers. In the late afternoon, we were sitting in the commercial buffet, which was a room with two or three tables, a little buffet stand, and a few stale cakes for sale at staggering prices. A lady passenger of middle age in a well-cut gray traveling suit, who had quietly and without question associated herself with Borodulin and me as the most privileged and influential element among the passengers, casually undertook to raise, by a mere telephone call, a car which would take us around Kazan and show us the sights. This rash boast brought the buffet girl to her feet from behind her little table. And just where in hell, she asked with crushing weariness, do you think you would raise a car in the city of Kazan? Our traveling companion looked at her challenger with a steely eye. From the NKVD, she replied. NKVD is the secret police. The buffet girl quickly disappeared again behind her cakes. The telephone call was made to the head of the NKVD in person, but an hour went by and the car failed to materialize. We decided to start out on foot. We walked as far as an amusement park. Evening was upon us and the crowds were gathering there for what was scheduled as a popular stepping out. We borrowed 20 kopeck pieces from numerous strangers for a public telephone. It was finally decided that the car should come to the amusement park. We bought sunflower seeds to eat and started into the park, but soon decided that it was too crowded for comfort and that we would rather see the center of town. We set out down a long, broad, tree-lined street with fine, big buildings that reflected clearly the university town. Some of the buildings had been made into military hospitals. The soldier patients, clad in the frightful flannel garments peculiar to all Russian hospitals, sat out in the front gardens with their accordions, playing, singing, talking, making remarks through the iron fence at all the girls who passed by. It was pleasant and homelike, if slightly vulgar, to be sauntering on the streets of a Volga River town of a summer evening, spitting the husks of your sunflower seeds philosophically before you as you walked, 
Eating sunflower seeds gave you the same sense of bovine calm and superiority as chewing gum. For a moment, I could almost forget that I was a foreigner in a country governed by people suspicious and resentful of all foreigners. But not for long. We spied a jeep, which the lady thought was the promised car. It passed us before we could stop it. We walked all the way back to the amusement park and found it. It was the one, all right. The head of the NKVD was there in person, with a chauffeur. He greeted the lady with great respect, but he was embarrassed to shake hands with me and refused to accompany us in the car, preferring to depart on foot rather than to ride publicly with a foreigner. The following day I sat for a long time on a suitcase in the stern of our Russian Douglas, looking out at the forests and farm country between Kazan and Moscow, and trying to gather together into some sort of pattern the mass of impressions which the past fortnight had left upon me. It was clear that here, spread out below us on the enormous plain, was indubitably one of the world's greatest peoples, a talented, responsive people, capable of absorbing and enriching all forms of human experience, a people strangely tolerant of cruelty and carelessness, yet highly conscious of ethical values, a virile, fertile people with great endurance and vitality, profoundly confident that they are destined to play a progressive and beneficial role in the affairs of the world and eager to begin to do so. Between them and the world outside their borders stands a regime of unparalleled ruthlessness and jealousy. This regime knows better than anyone else what riches, what possibilities, what dangers lie in the people of Russia. It has those people completely in its hand. It is determined that no outside influence shall touch them. For this, it is important that they should be taught not only to fear the power of external forces, but also not to look to them for favors. The Soviet government must always be made to appear the sole source of gracious bounty for the faithful and of righteous wrath for the incredulous or the undutiful. For this reason, the entire system is so devised as to obviate the greediness of its mandated public influence on the people's mind and to turn to the advantage of the Soviet government itself every act of foreign governments or individuals which might affect the people of Russia. The American man in the street, reading of the struggles and sufferings of those Russians who were so recently his allies, feels the urge to help them, subscribes to the Red Cross or the Russian War Relief, does not demur at the extra labor and taxes involved in lend-lease to Russia, and accepts with goodwill the arguments of those who advocate great credits for the Soviet government. How much more must the traveler feel who sees with his own eyes the deprivations of the Russian people and the heroism, the young people working twelve hours a day without comfort or relaxation, the middle-aged people who can recall no security and no peace in their lifetimes, and who have ceased to expect any for the future, the widows and war cripples, the crowded homes, the empty cupboards, the threadbare clothes, the pitiful substitutes for comfort and convenience, and with it all the wistfulness, the hope, the irrepressible faith in the future. Surely here it would seem, in this gifted, appealing people, purged by hardship of so much that is vulgar and inane in the softer civilizations, organized and prepared as no great people has ever been before for the building of a decent, rational society, here, if anywhere, would be a suitable outlet for the practical genius and the yearning to feel themselves helpful to others, which are signal traits of the American character. But the fact is, there is no way of helping the Russian people. When a people places itself in the hands of a ruthless authoritarian regime which will stop at nothing, it places itself beyond the power of others to help. Gifts presented to it can be given only to the regime which promptly uses them as weapons for the strengthening of its own power. If these gifts are passed on to the people at all, it is with the innuendo they were concessions, which the regime was clever enough to extract from the crafty outside world, while foiling the evil designs which lay behind them, and that those who would share in the benefits of them had better keep on the good side of that omniscient power which was so ably defending popular interests. 
On the other hand, blows aimed in exasperation at the regime itself are no help to the people by whom it is dominated. Such blows are promptly ducked and passed on to the people, while the regime, breathing sympathetic indignation, strikes one fiery attitude after another as the protector of a noble nation from the vicious envy of a world which refuses to understand. And if then, in the train of policies of arrogance and provocation, real catastrophe finally overtakes the nation, the regime promptly identifies itself beyond all point of distinction with the sufferings of the people and takes refuge behind that astounding and seemingly inexhaustible fund of patriotic heroism and loyalty which human nature seems to reserve for all such occasions. The benevolent foreigner, in other words, cannot help the Russian people. He can only help the Kremlin, and conversely he cannot harm the Kremlin, he can only harm the Russian people. That is the way the system is geared. This being the case, what does he do? The answer is anyone's. But I should have thought, with the sights and sounds of Siberia still vivid in my mind, that in those circumstances he would be wisest to try neither to help nor to harm, to make plain to his Soviet acquaintances the minimum conditions on which he can envisage polite neighborly relations with them, the character of his own aspirations and the limits of his own patience, and to leave the Russian people, unencumbered by foreign sentimentality as by foreign antagonism, to work out their own destiny in their own peculiar way. Eager to see more of the Soviet Union, Kennan welcomed the opportunity to escort a group of U.S. congressmen to Leningrad and Helsinki, which he describes in the following two entries. Leningrad, September. I had been in Leningrad three days of my life, and yet it was like coming home. I had read so much about it, and through the years I had spent in the Baltic states... I had come to love the flat horizons of the north, the strange slanting light, the wintry bleakness of nature, and the consequent accentuation of all that is warm and rich in human relationships. This is to me one of the most poignant communities of the world, a great sad city, where the spark of human genius has always had to penetrate the darkness, the dampness, and the cold in order to make its light felt and has acquired for that very reason a strange warmth, a strange intensity, a strange beauty. I know that in this city where I have never lived, there is nevertheless, by some strange quirk of fate, a previous life perhaps, been deposited a portion of my own capacity to feel and to love, a portion, in other words, of my own life, and that this is something which no American will ever understand and no Russian ever believe. Helsinki, September 7. We reached the new Finnish border and stopped at the first Finnish station. Here everything was suddenly neat and cheerful. A new station building had been erected, simple and of wood, but with a certain distinctive modern touch. The platform was in good repair and clean. There was a freshly painted kiosk where newspapers were on sale. Food was the only essential not in evidence. But the station was almost deserted. The sky was gray, and everything was a little sad. Our Russian locomotive retired, leaving our sleeping car, together with two soft cars full of Russians, bound for the new naval base at Porkala Ud, to wait for the Finnish train. We had long to wait. I paced up and down the platform in the wind, a slave to the Anglo-Saxon habit of exercise. The Russians stared vacantly out the windows of their car, and on their faces was that same stoical emptiness with which Russians stare out of train windows all over their vast, melancholy Russian world. The sidings were full of freight cars loaded with Finnish goods, being shipped to Russia as reparations. Little cars, wheels and tracks for a narrow-gauge logging railroad, bright with shiny metal and new paint, were carefully stored and lashed on the big gondola cars. On others... There were piles of clean-sawn lumber, neatly cut and carefully stacked. All these contributions bore the mark of orderly, conscientious Finnish workmanship. I wondered at first whether such offerings did not sometimes rouse pangs of shame among the inhabitants of the great shoddy Russian world into which they were moving. 
but on second thought I was inclined to doubt this very strongly. Except for myself, the station platform was almost deserted. A young lithe Finn with a knife in his belt gave side glances of hatred and contempt at the Russian cars as he went about his work as a switchman. Wood smoke from the little switch engine was torn away by the wind and carried across the clearing, its odor reminiscent of the Northwoods at home. A Finnish railway man in uniform rode sedately up to the station building, parked his bicycle, and went inside to transact his business. A peasant cart drove up with a family in the back. The family might well be hungry, but the horse was fat and sleek and trotted with a happy briskness, which no Russian horse possesses. Over the entire scene there lay the efficiency, the trimness, the quietness, and the boredom of bourgeois civilization, and these qualities smote with triple effect on the senses of a traveler long removed from the impressions of bourgeois environment. Moscow, November 24. Went to dinner with the Norwegian military attaché. One of the other guests was a Colonel Studyanov. I had a long and frank talk with him after dinner. After a long comparative discussion of Russian and American agricultural methods, in which he showed himself to be keenly interested and well-informed, we got on to the subject of Russian-American relations and of foreigners in Moscow. I told him that I understood some of the causes of the Soviet reserve toward foreigners, that I knew that there had been many diplomats and other foreigners in Moscow in the course of the last twenty-five years who had been tactless and stupid, and I had no doubt that many had tried to exploit the position in which they found themselves for purposes which were not proper. This did not, however, apply to all foreigners, and I thought that it was the duty of the Soviet government to see that arrangements were made whereby at least those of the foreigners who were honest and well-meaning were treated as they would be anywhere else in the world. I pointed out how much easier it was for us to deal with people like the British, for the reason that anyone in our government could usually sit down with his British counterpart and discuss, frankly, questions of common interest, even to the point of examining the correctness of his own government's policy, without being suspected of treason and without giving false impressions to the other party. I pointed out that with the Russians, this was impossible. I also drew his attention to the tremendous balance wheel which British-American relations have in the form of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of personal associations between nationals of the two powers. I pointed out that at least ten or fifteen thousand of soldiers in England had married British girls during the war that those women were now being admitted to the United States, and that every one of those marriages provided two more people who would protest violently against development of any real trouble between the two countries. I cited as an example the fact that here in Russia, only about a dozen men in the American services had married Russian women, and several of those had not been permitted to leave the Soviet Union in order to join their husbands abroad. I said that to these people he must add in his mind the thousands of Americans who normally lived in London and the thousands of Englishmen who normally lived in the United States, as well as tens and hundreds of thousands of tourists who travel freely in the two countries. The colonel did not deny this, but remarked that while there were high-level differences in matters of policy, no Soviet citizen could be expected to approach contacts with foreigners with anything else than the greatest caution. I replied that if this were true, then any real solution of our problems would be very, very difficult. I neglected to point out, as perhaps I should have, that things were no different in the peak of our wartime association when neither country had anything else in mind but the destruction of Hitlerism. The colonel came back very positively with the statement that this was an incorrect way to approach the question. In our Soviet language, he said, the word difficult does not exist. If a thing is impossible, that is that. But if it was not impossible, then one should never complain about difficulties. I told him in parting that there was a lot to be said for his point of view, but that if we were to shut our eyes to the difficulties and try to make progress along these lines in the face of all the existing obstacles, then both sides, and not only one, would have to give everything they had to the task. To this he agreed. I found myself wondering later whether the frank answer would not have been to say that in the circumstances I would then prefer to classify this task as impossible. 
For as long as personal life of Russian citizens is dominated, as it is today, by a secret police organization which stands above the law, which is hostile to the outside world in general, and which fears to admit the light of day into Russian society, I am bound to say that I do not see how any real stability can ever be introduced into our relations. But this is a good illustration of the reason high diplomats cannot always be frank. The one thing which I must not say as an American representative in Russia is that I despair of the future of our relations. November 26. Talked with the ambassador this afternoon, W. Averill Harriman. Among other things, I told them that I thought we should close the consulate general in Vladivostok in view of the insulting way in which our people have been treated there, their total isolation from the population, the fantastic degree of observation to which their lives are subjected, the floodlight on their house, the eternal face in the window across the street, etc., and in view of the fact that I could not see that we got enough out of the office to warrant its maintenance. The ambassador said that he could not agree to this, that he thought the office was of value to our government and should be maintained. Met later in the day with a group of well-informed foreigners who were engaged in a careful and competent analysis of Stalin's status. Little developed that was at all definite, but one point was brought out strongly, namely that the roseate days of Soviet triumphs at big power conferences are over, and that there could hardly be any further incentive on the part of those who rule Russia to thrust Stalin forward into the tripartite arena. This would apply whether Russia is actually being ruled by Stalin himself or other persons acting in his name, which is debatable. It would offer one plausible explanation why he should retire somewhat from the scene at this moment. I am one of the few foreigners in Moscow, if not the only one, who feels that it is questionable whether Stalin is still the dictator that people think he is. I suspect that power lies in the hands of a group within the Politburo, of whom Beria and Molotov are the strongest figures. Lavrenti Beria was head of the secret police, while Molotov was minister of foreign affairs. Both were longtime henchmen of Stalin. I think it likely that not only will Stalin be eliminated from the limelight, abandoning his position as chairman of the Soviet of People's Commissars, but that Molotov will also not wish much longer to have to face the representatives of the foreign world in person on one occasion after another, and that he will abandon the Foreign Affairs Commissariat, perhaps after the elections, to someone else, taking over his old position of chairman of the Soviet of People's Commissars. December 5. Went over to see the ambassador in the afternoon, finally arranged with him that I should be free from administrative responsibilities. After the rancorous London Conference of Foreign Ministers that had been held in September, Secretary of State James F. Burns switched to a more conciliatory stance and proposed holding a conference in Moscow. He held out the possibility of a deal to head off an atomic arms race. In contrast to Burns, Kennan and Harriman had grown skeptical of such efforts to continue wartime cooperation with the Soviets. December 7. Was called over in the morning to Spazo House. Spazo House had been the residence of the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union since Kennan had helped establish the embassy in 1933 through 34. Where I found the ambassador very much upset. He had just received a cable from Washington to the effect that the secretary, James F. Burns, proposed to make a public announcement of the forthcoming foreign minister's meeting that same afternoon, mentioning that the talks would include the subject of atomic energy. This had not yet been mentioned to the Russians, and the ambassador was rightly concerned that they would resent it. December 12. Atkinson was in to see me in the morning to talk about the background of the conference. Brooks Atkinson was a correspondent for the New York Times. And again I felt how inappropriate it was that these things should be discussed by anyone who has as little confidence as I in the efficacy of what we are doing. December 14. This was a lively day. We were expecting the secretary and his party. A full blizzard was blowing. Calls to the Soviet weather people in the early morning brought forth the information that weather conditions were impossible and no planes would be coming in. About 12 o'clock, we were told that the secretary's plane had left Berlin at 11 o'clock. This came from a minor official of the Foreign Office. The Red Army and the airport people said they knew nothing about it. At 1.30, just as I was leaving for lunch, Brooks Atkinson came in and said he had just been told by the British Embassy that they had heard that the plane had turned back to Berlin. 
thinking this, very likely I went home and had a leisurely lunch. Came back to find one of the attaches talking on the phone to a distressed foreign office official who claimed that the plane was coming in now and might arrive at any time at the Central Military Airport. I asked where the ambassador was. They said he had gone to some airport twenty miles south of town because he had heard that the secretary might arrive there. I grabbed Horace Smith and the little duty car, and together we went out to the Central Military Airport. A howling blizzard was blowing, and the field was just one white blur, with no distinction between sky and snow. You couldn't see across it at all. However, a radio sound truck was driving out into the obscurity as we arrived, and there were a number of Russian cars there. We were taken up into the little building at the edge of the field. Two or three journalists came along and joined us. In a few minutes, we heard the sound of motors and looked out to see a four-motored plane passing over the roof of the building. We rushed out on the field. The snow flurry had passed and visibility was better. Dekanazov, Vladimir Dekanazov, was deputy minister of foreign affairs, with one foreign office assistant and a lot of NKVD, was out there. Somebody had put up two iron posts with the Soviet and American flags. The plane, which had managed to land somehow or other, appeared out of the soup, taxiing up the field, wheeled up and stopped in front of us. The gangplank was pushed out through the snow, and we went through with the official reception. The secretary, in a light coat and no overshoes, stood in the deep snow while he said his hellos and gave his little speech over the microphone while the wind howled through the little company. I then took him to the first available car and drove him, together with Ben Cohen and his military aide, to Spazo. Benjamin V. Cohen would help draft New Deal legislation and agreements leading to the establishment of the United Nations, was counselor to the State Department. There, Kathy gave them drinks and soup and kept them busy until the ambassador arrived from his journey. Kathleen Harriman was the ambassador's daughter and hostess. Then I went back to the office to clear up papers. Thoroughly enraged by a telegram from the department asking us to invite the Soviet government to a conference to work out mutual tariff reductions next March, I spent the evening writing an eloquent telegram demonstrating why it shouldn't be done. December 17. Lunch at Spazo, where I sat next to the secretary and had some chance to tell him about some of our minor difficulties. Bolin and Isaiah Berlin came to dinner and we talked until one or two in the morning. Charles E. Chip Bolin, a colleague of Kennan's in the Moscow Embassy in the 1930s, had interpreted for President Roosevelt at the Tehran and Yalta conferences. He had become a top Soviet expert in the State Department. Isaiah Berlin, later a political and social theorist and philosopher, worked during the war in the British diplomatic service. Berlin, who was undoubtedly the best informed and most intelligent foreigner in Moscow, said that the only things he had learned on the occasion of this visit were a. the continued existence of the conflict and outlook between age and youth, b. of the tremendous importance to young people of the feeling of economic security which they have under the Soviet system, and c. the continued vital importance of Marxist dogma and Soviet thought and action. He agreed with me strongly that the American policy must find its expression from now on in action and not in words, if it is to do any good. He was firmly convinced that the Russians view a conflict with the Western world as quite inevitable and that their whole policy is predicated on this prospect. I asked him whether they didn't realize that if the conflict came, it would be the result of their own tactics and their own insistence that it was inevitable. He said no that they would view it as inevitable through the logic of the development of social forces. They would say that possibly some of us foreign diplomats and statesmen might consider ourselves friendly to Russia at the moment, but that eventually we would find out that we were hostile to them, even though we did not know it at the moment. December 19. Was invited by Ambassador to attend the Foreign Minister's Conference this afternoon. Unfortunately, the session turned out to consist of two brief meetings of about five or ten minutes each. Bevan looked highly disgusted with the whole procedure. Ernest Bevan was a leader of the British Labour Party and the Foreign Secretary. And it was easy to see by his face that he found himself in a position he did not like. He did not want to come to Moscow in the first place and was well aware that nothing good could come of the meeting. The Russians knew his position and were squeezing the last drop of profit out of it. As for Burns, Bevan saw in him only another cocky and unreliable Irishman, similar to ones that he had known in his experience as a docker and labor leader. Burns had consistently shown himself negligent of British feelings 
and quite unconcerned for Anglo-American relations. He had conceived the whole idea of this meeting in his own head and had taken it up with the Russians before saying a word about it to the British or giving them any warning that this was to be done. He had offended the British by giving a copy of the Etheridge Report to the Russians, but not to the British Embassy, despite the fact the latter had opened its files to Etheridge when he was here and that his visit was largely at British initiative. Burns had commissioned a liberal journalist, Mark Etheridge, to report on charges of Soviet repression in Bulgaria and Romania. The report was scathing in its criticism of the Soviets. Finally, Burns had come to Moscow with a paper to present to the Russians on atomic energy, which had been cleared with neither of the other powers which shared in holding the secret of the manufacture of atomic energy, and this within six weeks after Attlee's visit to Washington and conferences with the President. Clement Attlee was British Prime Minister and leader of the Labour Party. When Bevan had remonstrated against the presentation to the Russians of any document on this subject, which had not been cleared with British and Canadian governments, Burns had given him two days, namely until today, Wednesday, to submit this document to London and get the approval of the British cabinet. Bevan thought he had the assurance of Burns that meanwhile nothing would be submitted to the Russians, and indeed no other understanding would have made any sense. Nevertheless, on Tuesday evening, with no word to the British, Burns had sent the document into the Russians. Bevan could view this only as an instance of direct bad faith and was furious. Molotov, conducting the meeting, sat leaning forward over the table, a Russian cigarette dangling from his mouth, his eyes flashing with satisfaction and confidence as he glanced from one to the other foreign minister, obviously keenly aware of their differences between each other and their common uncertainty in the face of the keen, ruthless, and incisive Russian diplomacy. He had the look of a passionate poker player who knows that he has a royal flush and is about to call the last of his opponents. He was the only one who was clearly enjoying every minute of the proceedings. I sat just behind Burns and could not see him well. He plays his negotiations by ear, going into them with no clear or fixed plan, with no definite set of objectives or limitations. He relies entirely on his own agility and presence of mind and hopes to take advantage of tactical openings. In the present conference, his weakness in dealing with the Russians is that his main purpose is to achieve an agreement. The realities behind this agreement, since they concern only such people as Koreans, Romanians, and Iranians, about whom he knows nothing, do not concern him. He wants an agreement for its political effect at home. The Russians know this. They will see that for this superficial success, he pays a heavy price in the things that are real. After the meeting, I walked home with Matthews, and he stayed for supper. H. Freeman Doc Matthews, Director of the Office of European Affairs in the State Department. Frank Roberts and his wife joined us. Frank K. Roberts was a friend of Kennan's and his counterpart in the British Embassy. By the end of the evening, Matthews looked so crestfallen at the things that he had heard from Roberts and myself, I felt sorry for him and had to try to cheer him up. In the introduction of newcomers to the realities of the Soviet Union, there are always two processes. The first which is to reveal what these realities are, and the second, which is to help the newcomer to adjust himself to the shock. December 21. Talked to the Bulgarian minister this morning. He began by censuring opposition for not taking part in the election and claiming that they had voluntarily cut themselves off from participation in Bulgarian political life. Being somewhat impatient, I told them that what bothered us was not really questions of parliamentary representation or procedure, but the fact that we were faced there with a regime of police oppression which did not hesitate to proceed in the most ruthless manner against the lives and liberties of individual citizens, and it was our belief that in this atmosphere of terror and intimidation no real democracy could live. He became quite excited at this, and spoke thereafter much more frankly, admitting that the communists were only a minority, but pointing to the desirability of concluding peace and getting Russian troops out of the country lunch with Roberts and Cadogan, and two or three other people from the British delegation. Alexander Cadogan was British Permanent Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs. Chip was there, and I think he and I rather shook Cadogan's composure with our observations on the technique of dealing with the Soviet government. December 23. I went to Spazo to a stag luncheon for Molotov and Bevan, sat next to Tsar Apkin, who was relatively human. 
Semyon K. Zarapkin was a Soviet diplomat. Bevan caused much amusement among the Americans and considerable bewilderment among the Russians by the dour informality of his asides during the luncheon. When a toast was proposed to the king, he added good-humoredly, and all the other dockers. He told a story afterwards to explain this remark. When Harriman raised his glass to the future success of the conference, Bevan assented and added, and let's hope we don't all get sacked when we get home. Molotov left the minute luncheon was over. Later in the afternoon, they were all hard at work again and worked most of the night. This evening, the Russians put on a special performance of Zoluchka, Cinderella, at the Bolshoi. I did not learn about it until late in the afternoon, and, feeling that I ought to be there, took two of the last tickets on the list of those allotted to the embassy. When we got there, the theater was already packed to the last seat. Spotlights were trained on the empty imperial box where the appearance of the foreign ministers was expected, and Molotov and his aides were waiting nervously in the hall outside. As is always the case when the big curtain is down, the hall was stuffy and hot, and people were fanning themselves with their programs. The orchestra were all in their places waiting to strike up the national anthems. I found myself in a box with the ambassador's aide and one of his private secretaries. After we had waited for another fifteen minutes, I said laughingly to the private secretary that I supposed the secretary had forgotten to come. Oh, no, the secretary replied. They are only sitting up in his room at the embassy telling stories and having drinks, and no one dares go in and interrupt them. I immediately tore out of the box and ran downstairs to the administrator's office to telephone. The phone was in use when I got there, and I stood in the crowded office for a moment waiting for a chance to use it. Just as the phone became free and I was about to dial the embassy, a man in the shiny blue civilian clothes, so characteristic of the secret police, came into the office, walked up to me, and said with a slight smile on his face, They have just left. I went back to the box, and sure enough, in five minutes, Mr. Burns appeared, having kept several thousand people, including numerous members of the Soviet government, waiting for something like half an hour. The performance was absolutely first-rate one of the very best I have ever seen, but it fell very flat on the audience. I understand that Stalin was somewhere in the theater, though not in the imperial box. For this reason, the audience, except for the diplomatic corps, was apparently composed almost exclusively of secret police people, who were doubtless afraid that any excessive display on their part of enthusiasm for the performance might look as though they were being diverted from their duties. Chapter 5. Cold War, 1946-1950 through 1950. 1946 Kennan kept no regular diary in 1946. He was, however, enormously productive with his writing. His elegantly phrased and emotionally evocative long telegram of February 22, 1946, was widely circulated by Truman administration officials looking for a comprehensive explanation of Soviet behavior. In the telegram, Kennan argued that the Kremlin, driven by Russian nationalism and insecurities, now overladen with Marxist-Leninist ideology, needed a foreign enemy in order to justify its repressive rule. Negotiations with such an implacable foe would yield little, he insisted. The United States should seek neither compromise nor military confrontation with the Kremlin. Instead, Washington should strengthen U.S. institutions and rebuild Western Europe. Anxious to influence a wider audience, Kennan considered resigning from the State Department. He was enticed instead to return to Washington, give a series of public lectures around the country, and become Deputy Commandant for Foreign Affairs at the newly organized National War College in Washington, D.C. There, Kennan in 1946 through 47, lectured to military and political officials on the prospects and problems of what would soon be called the Cold War. To prepare for his lectures, Kennan read about strategy, listened to the War College talks of political and military experts, and honed his own ideas. He even schooled himself in the scientific principles underlying atomic weapons. From this study, Kennan arrived at the concept that would become known as containment. What follow are Kennan's undated notes from reading and from listening to lectures at the National War College. He used the material in this notebook to prepare his own lectures, 
and to develop the strategic concepts that would inform his thinking for decades thereafter. Having returned to the United States in May, the Kennan family settled in Washington. They spent most weekends at their farm in East Berlin, Pennsylvania. Notes on Bernard Brody, Editor, The Absolute Weapon, Atomic Power and World Order, New York, 1946. The Russians are confident of their own ability to conduct any sort of activities they wish on their own territory, despite all international undertakings to the contrary, without detection. They are no less confident of their ability to detect and reveal, through their widespread intelligence networks in the other great industrial nations, any attempts on the part of those other nations to violate such international undertakings, and they know that they can rely on the power of public opinion in those countries to require the respective governments to desist from such attempts. The Russian proposals for exchange of information and for the mutual renunciation of atomic weapons were drafted in the light of these considerations and are designed to give the USSR the facilities, particularly the know-how, for the production of atomic weapons while denying them to the capitalist world. Our task is to plan and execute our strategic dispositions in such a way as to compel the Soviet government either to accept combat under unfavorable conditions, which it will never do, or withdraw. In this way, we can contain Soviet power until Russians tire of this game. Does not the significance of atomic weapons mean that if we are to avoid mutual destruction, we must revert to the strategic political thinking of 18th century? Total destruction of enemy's forces can no longer be our objective because, A, in the best of circumstances, i.e., that the Russians lack atomic weapons or facilities for employing them against us, it implies on our part a war against the Russian people and the eventual occupation of Russian territory, and, B, in the worst of circumstances, the virtual ruin of our country as well as theirs. Therefore, our strategic political aims vis-à-vis -vis Russia should be limited to a. Preventing the power of the Soviet government from extending to points vital or important to U.S. or British Empire, and b. Without forfeiting the confidence and friendship of the Russian people to bring out the discrediting of those forces in Russia who insist that Russia regard itself as at war with the Western world. Can we afford to forego the disarming or destruction of Soviet armed power as a strategic objective? Yes, we must forego it, for either the disarming or the destruction would imply the assumption by us of political authority and responsibility in Russia. It is doubtful whether we could or would wish to put forth the physical effort necessary to achieve such authority, and it is certain that we would not be morally competent to exercise it to good effect, our effort must therefore be to convince the Russians that it is in their interest to disarm themselves by acceptance of an international atomic energy authority. On reading Clausewitz, Kennan concluded that the 20th century trend toward all-out war had become outdated. Karl von Clausewitz, On War, 1832 The thinking about total war has been overthrown by two recent revelations. One, atomic weapons, which may make war of annihilation impossible, and two, increasing political commitments of victory in great power warfare. War of annihilation, or overthrow, spells enormous and lasting political responsibility for the victor, which is scarcely apt to be desirable. Even in the case of Germany, it is questionable whether a war of destruction was desirable. Chip says it could not have been otherwise, Charles E. Chip Bolin, that the U.S. cannot fight a political war. In Russia, it is certain that we cannot undertake a war of destruction or annihilation. Against Russia, we must wage a political war, a war of attrition for limited objectives. Our people are unused to this and do not understand it. Thence, the value of U.N. We are in peculiar position of having to defend ourselves against mortal attack, but yet not wishing to inflict mortal defeat on our attacker. We cannot be carried too far away by the attractive conception of the flashing sword of vengeance. We must be like the porcupine, who only gradually convinces the carnivorous beast of prey that he is not a fit object of attack. 
In the lecture, Measures Short of War, part of which follows, Kennan outlined many of the strategies and concepts that would undergird U.S. policies in the Cold War. The major national strategy, to be effective, has to be related not as before just to the area of violence, but also to this other area in which the acts of the adversary, though not involving direct violence against us, nevertheless are really acts of war by intent. How do we determine intent? We cannot determine it with scientific exactitude. That does not mean that we should despair of determining it at all, or at least of making a working hypothesis. And as a basis for such a working hypothesis, we might say the following. An act of war is any measure taken as part of a policy which aims at the total destruction or subjugation of the state power of another state or its reduction to a degree incompatible with national honor and integrity. This definition allows for undeclared wars, as well as for declared ones. It also allows for the two main kinds of wars. One, wars of annihilation. Two, wars for limited objectives. We have been accustomed to waging war with acts of violence, or not waging war at all. Others have made no such distinction on many occasions. We ourselves certainly came very close to waging war by measures short of violence during the months just before Pearl Harbor. We were forced into that position by considerations of self-defense, because the Germans were, in effect, waging an undeclared war against us, i.e., they were pursuing a policy which aimed at least at a radical reduction in our state power, and one which certainly would have been incompatible with our state security. In this lecture, now, I must deal with acts short of violence. But I object to calling them acts short of war, because they can be every bit as much acts of war, by intent and by consequence, as artillery or air attacks. Totalitarian mentality represents a mutation of species, it is thus like a virus always present in body politic, dangerous only when powers of resistance are weakened. In old days, it could not take on its modern form, even where successful due to deeply ingrained feeling for a hierarchical concept of society, lack of modern police weapons, and attendant necessity for relying on feudal subordinate and holding together any structure of power. Requirements, therefore. A. Totalitarian element which is always present. B. Exhaustion of old spiritual and social order. C. Absence of any new order embodying for individual a plausible sense of community. D. Modern technical instruments of despotism. Kennan interrupted his notes in thinking about geopolitical strategy to chart his personal strategy. Notes. Personal. What do you want? Adequate income. Ability to live in country part of year. Ability to travel. Some privacy and quiet. Ability to contribute to intellectual and cultural life of times. Independence of choice. What follows are Kennan's notes on a lecture by Bernard Brody. Grand Strategy. Drop the word grand. Lecture should be entitled The Theory of Strategy. A Sermon. Text. Mahan. Defining Objects of Naval War College. What is practical training? Someone said if you want to attract men to colleges, give them something that will help them pass exams. War will be a sterner school. Is a college practical? Lack of deep and systematic study of strategy. We have retrogressed. Mahan was retired after 40 years of service with the rank of captain. His later promotion and retirement was routine. Is it a science? Is it not an exercise or common sense? Comparison of strategy and economics. Even such a truism as that wealth to be enjoyed must first be produced is not understood by many influential people. Ergo, truisms of strategy also must not be taken for granted. Highest type of strategy is that which so orders resources of nation that war may, if possible, be averted, or if inevitable, be won moral, that we must have theoretical study on a high level as a part of this institution. After listening to many lectures, Kennan jotted down my own comments. In what follows, he enunciated some of the ideas expressed in his February 1946 long telegram, 
and again in an article he wrote that would appear in Foreign Affairs in July 1947. 1. Impossible to distinguish between security and world domination. 2. Only two possibilities for a relief of Soviet pressure. A. Internal dissension, which would temporarily weaken Soviet potential and lead to a situation similar to that of 1919 through 1920. B. Gradual mellowing of Soviet policy under influence of firm and calm resistance abroad. But this will be slow and never complete. 3. Most important thing we can do is to think out a constructive program for Western Europe which can give new hope and new vision to tired and bewildered peoples of Western Europe. We have regarded that area only as a potential subject for an agreement with Russia. 1947 To the extent that writing in the diary was a way for Kennan to vent his frustrations and disappointments, he apparently had little need of it in 1947. The verse that follows constitutes the entirety of the diary during the year when he reached the pinnacle of his career in government. He became the nation's most renowned Soviet expert. Secretary of State George C. Marshall appointed him the director of the newly created policy planning staff, a post he assumed on May 7. Assisted by a devoted staff, Kennan crafted policy statements on a variety of issues. Though his recommendations were not always followed, they were respected. In July, Foreign Affairs published, under the pseudonym X, Kennan's The Sources of Soviet Conduct, in which he likened Soviet expansion to a wind-up toy car that had to be contained. Kennan's authorship soon became known and his national reputation was made. Much of the thinking that underlay the Marshall Plan was his. In Paris, he played a key role in the negotiations, leading to the plan for massive aid to rebuild Western Europe, including West Germany. Kennan's silence, at least in the diary, regarding personal problems, suggests that here, too, he found satisfaction. It would not last. Homeward bound at dawn over mid-Atlantic, Paris trip, August 27 through September 5. From out this world of stars and mists and motion, the dawn, impatient of the time allowed, probes sharply down the canyons of the cloud to find the fragments of an empty ocean. Let not this growing hemisphere of light seduce the housebound pilgrim to station. He may not hope against the dawn's inflation to see his darkness passing like the night. The endless flight on which his plane is sent will know no final landing field. Content be he whose peace of mind from this may stem, that he, as fortune's mild and patient claimant, has heard the rustling of the time god's raiment, and has contrived to touch the gleaming hem. 1948 Despite his standing as America's premier strategist of the Cold War, Kennan in 1948 began diverging from the Truman administration's policy. In 1947, he had quietly criticized the global claims of the Truman Doctrine. Far better, he had thought, to focus on aid to Greece and Turkey. Though he advocated covert operations and black propaganda and carefully controlled situations, Kennan also saw the Cold War as a limited engagement. Confrontation with Moscow should be political rather than military, and avoided in areas of marginal importance, such as China. Moreover, Kennan suggested in February the recovery already underway in Western Europe meant that the time might soon be ripe for serious negotiations with Moscow. In describing the diplomat best suited to conduct such negotiations, Kennan, in effect, nominated himself. In sum, while most officials in Washington and Moscow in 1948 were escalating the conflict, Kennan though still very much a cold warrior, was beginning to look for ways to ease tensions. Washington, January 22. Regarding nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize, we decided that no member of this government should make such a nomination this year. I am afraid that there will always be trouble over the allotment of this award. Peace is not an abstraction and cannot be treated as such. There is no such thing as just peace. Everybody wants peace. 
From that standpoint, Stalin might be said to deserve the award more than anyone else, having worked harder and more intelligently than any of the rest of us for the particular type of peace in which he is interested. It must always be asked, what kind of peace? Whose peace? There was another meeting devoted to the question of the secretary's speeches. I held out for a minimum of speaking engagements. I felt that present arrangements spread the secretary much too thin, cheapened his word and lessened its public effect, diverted him from more important duties, and constituted an uneconomic drain on his strength. My own opinion is that he should never speak unless there is something highly important and reasonably new to be said. We should cultivate a state of affairs where every word he speaks will not only be read, but studied eagerly by the entire world. Most of the others were against me in this, but I did succeed in having the number of his engagements for the coming period drastically reduced. The public appearances are not to be more than one a month for the next three months. January 23. People continue to come to me with alarmed reports of the state of affairs in Congress and the press. The bitterness against the department, the determination that the European aid program shall be cut down in amount and removed from the Department of State. I have no objection to the establishment of an executive apparatus outside of the regular Department of State organization for the administration of this program, but the program is primarily political in intent. If the day-by-day -day administration of it is removed, formally or otherwise, from the effective control of the Secretary of State, and if officials are sent abroad to administer the program without being subordinate to the authority of the chief of the mission in their country of operations, then a situation will have been created in which it will be futile for anyone to attempt to achieve a coordinated and effective United States policy toward Europe. If the aid program, furthermore, is cut to the point where it is no longer basically the program evolved by the Paris Conference, then it will have lost its real significance and will no longer accomplish the purpose for which it is designed. In response to Marshall's June 1947 invitation, Western European nations gathered in Paris to draw up a list of needs for reconstruction. Kennan and other U.S. officials worked unobtrusively to shape the overall structure of the European requests. If either of these contingencies materializes, I see no reason why I myself or any of the others of us who are concerned with United States policy should continue to try to accomplish anything useful within the framework of government service. For the damage done will then be past the capability of any individual to remedy by direct action within the government. And the most that anyone could hope to accomplish would be to bring about some public understanding of the reasons why this country had failed so miserably to cope with any of the foreign policy problems in the post-war period. And those reasons will strike deeply into the relationships between the executive and legislative branches of the government, as well as the attitude of public and press toward the institution of diplomacy itself. Talk this afternoon with Joe Alsop. Joseph Alsop and his brother Stuart were influential columnists who reproached me bitterly for the situation in Congress and insisted that the Secretary had never spelled out in an adequate way to the members of Congress the strategic realities underlying the Marshall Plan proposal. I argued with them at length about the extent of our responsibility for the education of Congress in these matters. I pointed out that personally I had entered a profession which I thought had to do with the representation of United States interest vis-a-vis -vis foreign governments, that this was what I had been trained for and what I was prepared to do to the best of my ability, that I had never understood that part of my profession was to represent the U.S. government vis-a-vis -vis Congress. My specialty was the defense of U.S. interest against others, not against our own representation. I resented the State Department being put in the position of lobbyists before Congress in favor of the U.S. people, and I felt that Congress had a responsibility no less than that of ourselves toward the people. We were not their keepers or their mentors. It was up to them to inform themselves, just as it is up to us to inform ourselves. I recognize regretfully, however, that few will agree with this standpoint, and that we might have to see what we can do to make somewhat plainer to members of Congress the overall implications of the question which they are being asked to decide. January 27. Sat in this morning on a conference concerning presentation to Congress of the bill for aid to China. The dilemma is this. We all know that this aid cannot materially affect the course of events in China. We are obliged to put the bill before Congress by virtue of our past commitments 
and of the pressures that exist in favor of aid to China. If, in presenting it, we tell the truth, which is that the Nanking government is doomed by its own inadequacy and that its power is destined to disintegrate regardless of our aid, we demolish at one blow its remaining prestige in China, hasten enormously the process of disintegration, and lay ourselves open to the charge of having treacherously undermined Chang's prestige and killed his government by our own action. Chiang Kai-shek led the corrupt and unpopular nationalist government in China, which in October 1949 lost the civil war with the communists. If, on the other hand, we hold out any hope to Congress that the bill can accomplish anything positive from the standpoint of U.S. foreign policy, we will only be faced a few months hence with incontrovertible evidence that this objective has not been achieved and with renewed reproaches for having urged Congress into another Operation Rat Hole. January 28. In a State Department memorandum on the dispute between Arabs and Jews over partitioning the British Mandate of Palestine, there was no hint of criticism of the Zionists, who were apparently blameless. The solutions toward which the memorandum pointed were all ones which would have put further strain on our relations with British and Arabs, and on the relations between British and Arabs. Such a policy could proceed only at the expense of our major political and strategic interests in the Middle East. Finally, it seemed clear to me that any further gratuitous effort this government might make at this time with a view to pushing the execution of the partition plan, and the United Nations resolution does not call on us to do anything of this sort, could hardly fail to engage still further our direct responsibility in the matter, and to bring us closer to the day when we would be obliged to consent to the use of outside force as a means of enforcing the partition scheme. It is clear that once anything of this sort begins, there is no stopping point short of a state of affairs in which we would really have taken over the major military and police responsibility for the maintenance in Palestine of a state of affairs violently resented by the whole Arab world. I cannot conceive that this is in the United States' interests, or that it would be tolerated by the United States people. I therefore see nothing to be gained by starting in that direction. All in all, I have come to doubt that any arrangement for Palestine worked out by outside powers and enforced either physically or morally by the international community can ever prove satisfactory. Unless the inhabitants of Palestine, both Jews and Arabs, and the international elements which stand behind them are finally compelled to face each other eye to eye without outside interference and to weigh, with a sense of immediate and direct responsibility, the consequences of agreement or disagreement. I think they will continue to react irresponsibly in the face of the proposed solutions, and there will be no one that can command their loyalty and cooperation. It may be that there will be bloodshed in the wake of a negative American policy, but we Americans must realize that we cannot be the keepers and moral guardians of all the peoples in this world. We must become more modest and recognize the necessary limits to the responsibility we can assume. January 30. Talked at lunch with a gentleman just returned from Japan, who told me some disturbing things about the influences behind our policies of extreme democratization and deconcentration of economic life in Japan. Of all the failures of United States policy in the wake of World War II, history will rate as the most grievous our failure to approach realistically the responsibilities of power over the defeated nations, which we ourselves courted by the policy of unconditional surrender. End of Diary for 1948 1949 Kennan concluded that the occupation of Germany by the four victor nations the United States, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and France, should end, except for the retention of limited military bases. He preferred the reunification of a neutral Germany, over setting up West and East Germany as rivals, each allied with one of the superpowers. He hoped that reuniting Germany would pave the way for a Soviet military pullback from most of Eastern Europe. With these ideas meaning skepticism from Dean Acheson, who in January 1949 succeeded Marshall as Secretary of State, as well as others in the Truman administration, Kennan went to West Germany to assess prospects. Viewing the destruction in Hamburg, a city that decades earlier had beckoned him in a mystical way, made Kennan question whether any war was worth the toll it extracted. 
such anti-war feelings would intensify in later years. March 10. Written to a lady, a fellow transit passenger on a Europe-bound plane stranded overnight at Bermuda. Bermuda, the salutation. Frown not, fair pilgrim, on this magic isle, where unseen fairies toll the bells of night. Dismiss not lightly, nor with scornful smile, the things that strike the ear and meet the sight in this implausible, unlikely land. Fresh lawns, dark cedars, picture postcard sky, a limpid sea, strange objects on the sand, white roofs in moonlight, and the aching cry of strings of lights along a distant shore, across a darkened sea. Do not deplore these things and others just because they lie amid the vast dread ocean of a dream. The island's real, and real, I trust, am I. The distant continents are what they seem. Her reply. What seems to you the frown, the smile of scorn, dismissal, the deploring of a dream, are none of these. The islands are forlorn, not for their magic or because they seem unreal, but just because one cannot stay more than an instant in such happy air before each is impelled upon his way, aware of loss but saying, I must not care. This is the sadness of a bitter time, and this the final but unfinished rhyme. Berlin, March 12. Late in the evening I took a long walk. The streets were silent and empty and utterly dark. This was once the fashionable suburb of Dahlem. The private villas, those which had escaped the bombing, stood out dimly in the shadows. What pretense, what eager hopes, what plans for personal happiness and prosperity lay behind the building of each of these houses? Whatever were these hopes and plans, they were now dashed. Today the villas stood mute and dark and cold. If Germans lived in them at all, they camped in them like barbarians in the palaces of Italy. There seemed little prospect of doing anything else. It was hard to tell whether this was in itself good or bad, deserved or undeserved. Whatever it was, every one of those dim architectural forms spelled a broken dream, spelled one more bit of frustration for people who had once felt the call of hope and initiative. However you looked at it, it seemed a pity. Back in the club, I could not sleep. I have lived in this city many years in its better days, and the immensity of its ruin overwhelmed me. From my window, I watched the events of the night. In little groups, the guests emerged and departed in their cars. Soon the last inebriate colonel had found his way into his jeep. Finally, the musicians assembled with great grumbling and scolding of their own latecomers and rode off in an incredibly overloaded jalopy over which they appeared to dispose. And then the tall, bare poplars, the same patient poplars which had waited and waited through the final years of the Weimar Republic, and the Nazi era, and the war, and the bombings, and the arrival of the Russian army, stood alone again through another night, until the battered cars of the first early subway train came clattering past, through the open cut a few yards away, and the sky lightened to the dawn of a gray, soggy March Sunday over airlift Berlin. In protest over the progress toward unifying the U.S., British, and French zones of Germany into an independent state, the Soviets in June 1948 had blocked the Western Allies from sending trucks and trains through the Soviet zone to supply West Berlin. The United States responded with a massive airlift until the Soviets relented in May 1949. In the afternoon, we drove around town. The sky was the typical winter overcast of northern Germany. A gusty wind swept around the street corners, ruffled the puddles of melted snow, and caused the pedestrians to stagger for their balance. The city looked little different than it had three years ago. The ruins, for the most part, still stood in awful and imposing desolation, 
the piles of rubble flowing down to the sidewalk, twisted iron beams and the remnants of walls standing out above them, portions of rooms hanging giddily in the air like stage settings. Only here and there, it seemed, had rubble been cleared away on the little narrow-gauge railways set up for that purpose. The massive gutted walls of the technical high school still frowned gloomily on the vast open space before them. The burned-out steel skeleton of the curtain tower of the Charlottenburg Opera House was still silhouetted high above the skyline of the surrounding buildings. There was little animation on the streets. Here, a little line of people waited patiently before the entrance to a movie. There, a cluster of young boys huddled in the shelter of a broken wall. Once, in the course of the twenty-mile drive, we saw a bus. Two or three times, we passed streetcars. They were unpainted and dirty and had wood in place of window panes. March 14. Talked this morning in the office with two of the American journalists. I asked them why they stayed here in the western sectors of Berlin. After all, this was only an island now, remote from the main current of world affairs. They were hard put to it to answer the question. They could only fall back on the general consideration that Berlin was a hot spot where someday something would have to happen, and that here one was close to the Russians and had opportunities to observe what they were thinking and doing. But the question rather shocked them. They were dominated by the same state of mind as our foreign service people who were startled at the question as to why we still maintained large sections of their office and of military government in Berlin where it only constituted additional strain on the airlift. They could only reply that it was unthinkable that they should leave. The Berliners would think they were deserting them. Near Frankfurt, March 16. Up early and went for a walk before breakfast, to the amazement and concern of the German personnel. A blanket of dampness and low cloud still hung over the wooded hills. I went down the drive, out of the main gate, and into the village. This was a suburban-type village, not a farming community. The square houses stood behind high fences. The yards were used as gardens. Wood piles, garden tools, chickens, and the stalks of last year's cabbage still yielding Brussels sprouts all testified to the primitiveness of life and the vigorous efforts of self-help and subsistence gardening to which people had been driven by the years of hunger and hardship. It was early in the morning, but people were already on their feet. Housewives were heading for the market with their shopping baskets. White-collar workers with the usual long raincoat and briefcase bulging with the morning sandwiches clanged shut the little sidewalk gates as they set forth on their bicycles for the day's work. Children were on their way to school with their shiny knapsacks on their backs, and the sight of these knapsacks suddenly brought back a tinge of the sense of strangeness and alarm with which I myself, as a boy of eight, first went off to school in Kassel in the year 1912, amid a horde of German boys with similar knapsacks, Boys who plainly felt so wondrously and securely at home in a world I neither liked nor understood. After breakfast, back to Frankfurt to attend another meeting. This time it was a meeting of the three military governors. Only three sides of the square of tables were populated this time. The French general, who was the chairman, sat with his cohorts along the middle side, the British and ourselves along the wings. The meeting was one in which there was a good measure of disagreement. The French general, functioning in his role of chairman, could not have acted or looked otherwise had he been the renegade son of a degenerate French noble family of the ancient regime, acting as a military governor for Napoleon somewhere across the broad expanse of Europe. He kept a constant smile on his face, but it was obviously not a smile directed to others. It was a smile of some inward amusement— an almost unbelievably sadistic and arrogant amusement. I'd seen nothing like this in anyone since the officers of the European armies before World War I. You could not look at this man without recalling the known facts concerning the fantastic establishment of luxury in which he had surrounded his own person and the disgraceful plundering and carpet-bagging which he has not only tolerated but apparently inspired in his own command. You could imagine that it was with this same degenerate smile that he would dismiss German pleas for a more sensible and decent treatment, 
or inflict some act of arrogance on his own subordinates in the French establishment. Toward General Clay, he was supercilious and indifferent. General Lucius Clay was military governor of the U.S. zone in Germany. He made no effort to conceal his intention to appeal their differences to governments or his confidence that the governments would decide in his favor. In the face of this performance, any differences of opinion which we may have had within our own American circle about German policy faded completely as far as I was concerned, and my heart went out in gratitude and admiration for the integrity and seriousness and respect for human values and responsibilities which rang out in every word stated on the American side. Hamburg, March 18. The real destruction we did not come to until we had passed the harbor and the business district and entered the large residential districts east of the Ulster River. Here was sweeping devastation, down to the ground, mile after mile, it had all been done in three days and nights in 1943, my host told me. Seventy-five thousand persons had perished in the process. Even now, after the lapse of six years, over three thousand bodies were estimated to be still buried there in the rubble. In the ruins of Berlin, there had seemed to be a certain tragic majesty. Berlin had been a great cold city, an imperial city, haughty and pretentious. Such cities invited the wrath of gods and men. But poor old Hamburg, this comfortable, good-humored seaport community, dedicated like so many of our own cities to the common-sense humdrum of commerce and industry, for Hamburg it seemed a great pity. And here, for the first time, I felt an unshakable conviction that no momentary military advantage, even if such could have been calculated to exist, could have justified this stupendous, careless destruction of civilian life and of material values, built up laboriously by human hands over the course of centuries, for purposes having nothing to do with war. Least of all, could it have been justified by the screaming non-sequitur, "'They did it to us!' and it suddenly appeared to me that in these ruins there was an unanswerable symbolism which we in the West could not afford to ignore. If the Western world was really going to make valid the pretense of a higher moral departure point, of greater sympathy and understanding for the human being as God made him, as expressed not only in himself, but in the things he has wrought and has cared about, then it had to learn to fight its wars morally as well as militarily or not fight them at all, for moral principles were a part of its strength. Shorn of this strength, it was no longer itself. Its victories were not real victories, and the best it would accomplish in the long run would be to pull down the temple over its own head. The military would stamp this as naive and would say that war is war, and that when you're in it, you fight with every means you have or go down in defeat. But if that is the case then there rests upon Western civilization, bitter as this may be, the obligation to be militarily stronger than its adversaries by a margin sufficient to enable it to dispense with those means, which can stave off defeat only at the cost of undermining victory. Berlin, March 20. Despite occasional snow flurries, the weather was brighter than last week. It was suddenly the difference between winter and spring— the heavens were no longer all one tone. There were dark clouds and light clouds, and between them gleamed a new sky, the pale blue sky of spring, on the existence of which one had almost ceased to believe in the endless dragging northern winter. Even the children noticed it. On my way to the subway station, I passed three of them, walking an Airedale dog. Oh, look, the little boy was saying, in the dark cloud is the night fairy and the light cloud is the day fairy. The Airedale caught the hope and excitement in the boy's tone and looked eagerly at the others and strained at the leash to show that he was one of the gang and ready for anything. You are right, my little fellow, I thought to myself. There is a day fairy and a night fairy, a light cloud and a dark cloud. 
And which of these clouds will hang over you and overshadow your life in the days of your maturity? Which fairy will wield the wand over you? Is the great question. The answer will depend partly on you, since none of us is without will and responsibility who is not completely a prisoner. But it will depend more on us Americans, for we have won great wars and assumed to ourselves great powers, and we have thus become the least free of all peoples. We have placed upon ourselves the obligation to have the answers, and anyone can come up and put a nickel in us and ask for an answer, and the rules of the game require us to give one. This, too, you will eventually discover, and according to the answer we give, you may get mostly the day fairy or mostly the night fairy hovering over yourself and your future. And I'd watch that one if I were you, come to think of it, because we aren't too sure about all these things ourselves, and I wouldn't stake too much on the soundness of our answers. This sentence is crossed out. It was plain that if only somehow the inward influences of health and hope could be brought to these children, if it could be shown to them that somewhere at the end of this afternoon, whenever the March sun penetrated the snow flurries, there were such things as freedom and security and rewards for work accomplished, and the chance to walk down the broad vistas of beauty and warmth in the human spirit, if these things could be done, then the ruins like the charm of a wicked sorcerer, would lose their power over these children, and the day fairy would once again come into her own. But whence was all this to come? From the parents? The parents were stoical and hardened and purged of many of their erstwhile illusions, but they were still bewildered, unenlightened people with a terribly restricted field of vision. From us Americans... We were doing our best, but we had no answer yet to the great political insecurity which hung over this area, and our own vision was clouded by our habits, our comforts, our faults and corrupting position as conquerors and occupiers. Near Frankfurt, March 21. Took a last walk through the narrow streets of the little town. Here life was better, unquestionably, than in the great cities of Berlin and Hamburg, the town had been untouched by the bombings. The great allied establishment of the Frankfurt area was all around them, dispensing jobs and marks and keeping up a high level of economic activity. But not even the best will in the world could concede that this was a good-looking people. The war seemed to have drained it of youth and spirit, and far too high a percentage of those who crossed your path were obviously the same old small-town burghers of the pre-war period, civil servants and pensioners and white-collar workers and petty tradespeople. These people had been the backbone of Nazism. Nazism had made them horrible, or had brought out the horror that was in them. Now defeat and frustration had made them grotesque. With their hollowed gray faces, their thin, gaunt figures, their long, flapping knickerbockers and Jaeger hats, they reminded me, for some reason, of awkward aging beetles who had survived some sort of flood and catastrophe and were still stubbornly crawling around the haunts from which they were supposed to have been removed. In the evening, I drove down out of the hills to Frankfurt to take the train to Paris. It had been a fine, sunny day, the first day of good weather since I came to Germany. Now, although darkness had fallen... The sky was still bright in the west, and the stars were out. In the villages, people were out strolling, enjoying the first evening of fine spring weather. There was brisk vehicular traffic all along the road, and most of it German. I thought of the whole bizonal area stretching off behind us in the dusk. Bizonia was the combined U.S. and British zones of Germany and it seemed to me that you could hear the great low murmur of human life beginning to stir again, beginning to recapture the rhythm of work and life and change. After years of shock and prostration, here were tens of millions of human beings of all ages and walks of life, reacting, as human beings always have and must, to the myriad of stimuli of heredity and education and climate and economic necessity and emotion. Whatever we did 
they would no longer stand still in thought or in outlook. Nothing could keep them from seeking again some outlet for the basic need of the human being to feel that he is doing something important and fruitful and necessary. Would we be able to feel our way into this sea of human reaction and human will, heretofore so repugnant, so little interesting to us, would we be able to realize that we are the doctor on whose understanding the recovery and health of this patient depend, without which recovery and health there may be no unity and no success for the Western world? Would we be able to roll up our sleeves to overcome our own distaste and to study with cool objectivity the anatomy and pathology of this tremendous body politic which had wrought so much havoc in our Western world? Would we be able to steer its development into cooperative and constructive lines? Would we be able to give it the sense of participation, the sense of being needed, which it so desperately required? Or would we turn our backs upon it in anger and revulsion, and leave it no choice but to grow again outside of us and against us, in the spirit of those bitter lines by Goethe, with which the German Communist Party once used to close its meetings, you must rule and win, or serve and lose, suffer or triumph, be anvil or be hammer. In the darkened streets of the suburban villages, in the bustle of the Frankfurt station, in the lights of the little station platforms of the plundered French zone, as they slipped past the train windows, there were no answers to these questions, and the misty darkness which hung over the sleeping countryside of the Rhineland was heavy with uncertainty. Washington, August 23. This morning, the question of the U.S.-British talks on Britain's financial difficulties finally came up for discussion in the morning meeting with the Secretary. I pointed out that at the present moment, with a great question mark hanging over the solidarity of Russian rule in the satellite area, and with an extremely tense and unpleasant situation in the Far East, it would be catastrophic if anything happened to disrupt the spirit of confidence and solidarity and the reality of economic stability and progress in the Western world. Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia was openly defying the Kremlin. The decades-long civil war in China was nearing an end, with the communists triumphant under the leadership of Mao Zedong. This, however, was exactly what would happen if something drastic were not done about the British situation. If the British went home empty-handed and in despair, I had no doubt that the Labour government would fall soon thereafter to the accompaniment of a tremendous din of recriminations and bitter words against this country. It seemed to me that there was very little we could do to help the British in the short term, for any help that required legislative action could not be expected in less than a year on account of the congressional situation. And what we could do for them by administrative action was really very little. No matter what came out of these discussions, therefore, the British would have to return to take some very bitter and difficult measures on their own hook in the weeks following the discussions. But it seemed to me that everything depended on the spirit in which they did that. If they went back feeling that the talks had yielded nothing and that we were going to give them no help at all, even in the long term, the worst results could be expected. If, on the other hand, we could give them the hope that even though we could not provide the short-term answers, we would be willing to help them face the long-term aspects of their problem. I thought the entire picture might be a different one. I pointed out that their dollar drain arose from two factors. A, their position as banker for the sterling area, and B, the adverse UK balance of trade with the dollar area. As to the first... I suggested that perhaps they ought to cease trying to be the bankers for at least a portion of the sterling area, and the respective countries ought to come direct to the U.S. for their dollars. This would mean headaches for us, yes, but it would at least create clarity and public understanding where today there is confusion. As for the British adverse balance, that was a question of adjustment of the British economy to the economies of North America— and I thought that we ought at least to agree to join them in appointing a commission of inquiry to determine what institutional changes, if any, might be made in the relations between the three countries, U.S., U.K., and Canada, which would ease this adjustment and prevent each single component of it from being made a particular issue and bone of contention in the relations between the respective countries. 
Undersecretary of State James E. Webb came to my office and said, Mr. Atchison was a wonderful man, but he was austere and aloof and did not seem to establish a real personal contact with the president and his entourage. If he tried to operate alone, he could not carry the opposition of the other people around the president and Louis Johnson and of the congressional circles who were already beginning to attack him personally in a way they would never have dared to attack General Marshall. Louis A. Johnson was Secretary of Defense. He sometimes wondered how it would work out with the secretary so reserved and so remote from the White House circle. Besides, the secretary was a very tired man. August 30. I went out to the secretary's house in the country this evening for a dinner in honor of Chip. We talked particularly about the Yugoslav-Soviet crisis. Chip shares my feeling that while common sense should inhibit the Russians from any resort to direct violence, this is one matter which has really aroused the emotions of the men in the Kremlin in the most extraordinary way, and that anything might happen. August 31 spoke very bitterly to journalist Stuart Alsop after lunch about the campaign of vilification which his brother Joe had carried on for years against John Davies and told him that as a result of this smearing, Davies was now going to be transferred to work in some other field, which simply represented a loss of one of the best political minds we had from the field where it could be most useful. John Patton Davies, Jr., a friend of Kennan's and a foreign service expert on China, Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin was pillorying Davies as treasonous because he had reported accurately on the failings of Chiang Kai-shek's government. When I got back to the office, Joe phoned me in white heat about this and talked for three quarters of an hour straight on the subject. September 1. Was interrupted for an hour by a visit of the French ambassador Bonnet, who seemed to be preoccupied lest the result of the U.S.-U.K.-Canadian discussions be the establishment of some body on which only those three countries were represented. Henri Bonnet. This would leave France out and give the impression, he feared, that she was being abandoned by the Anglo-Saxon powers. I tried, evidently without much success, to reassure him about this, yet at the same time to impress upon him our feeling that the French themselves must take the lead in developing union on the continent, leaving the British outside. I stand in continued wonder and exasperation at the irrationalism of the French, who are supposed to be the most rational of peoples. They want to be in on everything, even those things which are troublesome and painful and do not require their membership. They want to be in on things where they can contribute nothing and have nothing to gain, rather than have anyone do anything without them. They profess to fears which make absolutely no sense in the light of even the most cursory glance at reality and insist that those fears be taken seriously by others. Why in the world they can think that we would have spent ten to fifteen billion dollars in Western Europe and gone through the anguish of negotiating an Atlantic Pact and trying to get that and a military aid program through Congress, if our purpose had been to abandon France, surpasses my imagination. September 8. Spent the morning with John Davies and Dorothy Fosdick, drafting some observations for Mr. Jessup and his group about the suggestions that we should encourage the Chinese to appeal to the United Nations against the violation by the Russians of the clauses of the Sino-Soviet Treaty of 1945, and that we should ask the members of the United Nations to reaffirm at this time the principles of the Nine Power Treaty, Washington Treaty, of 1921. Davies and Fosdick were members of the policy planning staff. Philip C. Jessup was a State Department legal expert. We opposed both of these suggestions. The first we opposed, largely on the grounds, that what we did at Yalta with respect to Manchuria could only have meant to the Russians that we were restoring to them the position which Russia had enjoyed there before the Russo-Japanese War, and that a step of this sort on the part of the Chinese would hopelessly confuse and entangle our policies with respect to the Soviet Union with our relationship to the national government of China. The second we opposed, because we felt that it would bind us more than the Russians and would only lead to another revelation of the helplessness of the UN. September 13. This morning I learned from one of our officers who had been authorized to inform me of the matter that we had received indication that an atomic explosion had taken place in the Soviet Union. The officials said that the scientific investigation of the available evidence was continuing and that we should know the facts in a few days. Jeb is still skeptical about my own thesis, 
that unification of the Western world should proceed in two parts, with the U.S., U.K., and Canada constituting one part, and the continental countries the other. Gladwin Jeb was a British diplomat. Jeb feels that in the relationship between the U.K. and the Western European countries, there is something tangible at hand, an edifice which is actually rising and which we should not sacrifice in favor of other edifices, which are still only matters of the imagination. He does not feel that there is any chance of the Eastern European countries being freed from communist domination within the foreseeable future, and I gathered that he would not wish this to happen, since in his view it would only complicate the consolidation of Western Europe. His is the pragmatic, tentative British approach, distrustful of logic and of hypothetical considerations, and directed primarily to the short term. I must still disagree with him. I see no future in relationship of the UK to Western European countries which cannot be shared by the US and Canada, and which excludes by implication the countries of Eastern Europe. September 19. The whole raison d'etre of this policy planning staff was its ability to render an independent judgment on problems coming before the Secretary or the Undersecretary through the regular channels of the Department. If the senior officials of the Department do not wish such an independent judgment or do not have confidence in us to prepare one which would be useful, then I question whether the staff should exist at all. This lies in the nature of our work. When Secretary Burns called upon the Atchison Lilienthal Group to prepare for him a staff opinion on our policy with respect to the international control of atomic energy, he did not insist that it meet with the unanimous and detailed approval of the assistant secretaries before he was interested in reading it. David E. Lilienthal, former chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, head of the Atomic Energy Commission. Similarly, when Secretary Marshall first asked this staff to do work on the problem of European recovery, what he wanted was the staff's opinion, and not a record of the extent to which the staff could find agreement with the various departmental chiefs on this subject. This afternoon, it became known that the technical study of the evidences of an atomic explosion in the Soviet Union had been completed, and that the conclusion of the scientists was that such an explosion had taken place. It was their belief that it was an atomic bomb. Mr. Webb thought that the President might wish to announce tomorrow that such an explosion had taken place. The time being thus short, I obtained his authorization to get together a group at once, which would examine the problem of what answers should be given throughout the executive establishment to the numerous subsidiary questions which would undoubtedly be asked the moment such an announcement were made. My thought was that if we could arrange a uniform set of answers to be used by all the officials of the executive branch of the government— we could do much to control the reaction to this announcement. Accordingly, I got together three or four people at my house in the evening, and we threshed out the elements of a set of questions and answers along these lines. September 21. It is a curious thing how great an influence is exerted on the character of negotiations by the number of people present. They may all be the most trusted of persons, and the relationships between the members of each team may be ones of the greatest intimacy. Yet if there are more than half a dozen people around the table, there is general hesitation and stiffness and formality. September 22. This morning, Mr. Paul Palmer of the Reader's Digest came to see me. He told me that he had been talking to people around town and had been impressed with the amount of preventive war psychology. He found a good deal of this sort of thing in the Pentagon. He wanted to know what I thought of it. I talked to him for 15 or 20 minutes, and he then said that if I would put in the form of an article substantially what I had told him, they would run it as a feature article in Reader's Digest and pay me $5,000 besides. I should normally have discouraged him, because no one else among the responsible officers in the department has any interest in this sort of medium for getting the government's views before the public. However, in the present circumstances— with the knowledge that the news of the Russian atomic explosion would somehow or other reach the public in the near future, I thought it best not to discourage him entirely and make another try at getting authority to print such an article. It is quite obvious that the news from Russia will add a great impetus to this sort of unrealistic thinking about a preventive war, unless something is done to head off this reaction. September 24 
Judging from this morning's papers, the reaction to the announcement about the Russian bomb was highly satisfactory. A few people naturally jumped to extreme and dangerous conclusions and made statements which can only be harmful to an understanding of the realities of the situation. But for the most part, people took it calmly and the press did a good job of placing the event in the proper perspective. September 26. This morning at 12.30, Mr. Webb took me to see the president, ostensibly to report to him on the progress of our negotiations on atomic energy. The president looked slightly tired, but was his usual likable self. I could understand how such strong loyalties could develop between him and his associates. I was glad, upon reflection, that I had had so little contact with him, for I would not like to be in a position where personal loyalty and affection forced me to close my eyes to the obvious deficiencies in the conduct of foreign policy in this period, and to profess enthusiasm for what must remain a confusing and ineffective method of operation. Americans seem little able to accustom themselves to the thought that their security must rest on the intentions rather than the capabilities of other nations, and are drifting toward a morbid preoccupation with the fact that the Russians conceivably could drop atomic bombs on this country, regardless of the question as to whether it would be profitable or otherwise for them to do so. Europeans, judging from the foreign minister's statements, still labor under their own similar preoccupation with the specter of invasion, closing their eyes to the fact that their own domestic communist parties represent the grimmer and more real danger, and that their own jitteriness about an invasion the Russians have never intended to conduct plays into the hands of those very communist parties. Belgian Foreign Minister Paul von Zeeland There was a great to-do this morning over a new state of hysteria into which the French have succeeded in working themselves. The French Prime Minister had called in Bruce and told him that the events of the past week had indicated that there had been an historic policy decision of the U.S. government to the effect that we would henceforth move only in company with the British and Canadians, leaving France alone on the continent with the Germans. Bruce, the U.S. Ambassador to France To back this up, the French pointed to several things which had happened, including statements allegedly made by the Secretary to Schumann, the British devaluation, our talks with the British over the pound and dollar question, etc. Robert Schumann was the French Foreign Minister. This was accompanied by the appearance in this morning's post of an article by Walter Lippmann accusing this government of exactly the same thing and citing, in support of his accusations, an article by the Alsop brothers in which I had been quoted as favoring a special U.S.-U.K.-Canadian relationship. It was quite obvious that Lippmann's article had been inspired by the French here in Washington, and I could not help but feel that perhaps it also reflected a certain amount of pique over my failure to keep my appointment with them last week. My only reaction to this sort of thing is one of impatience and disgust. The idea that after the years of work and sacrifice involved in what the executive branch of this government has done with respect to the European Recovery Program, the Marshall Plan, the Atlantic Pact, NATO, and now the Military Assistance Program, we would still be under the onus of trying to persuade the French at frequent intervals that we are not about to abandon them, seems to me to have rather dismal implications. September 28. We discussed the problems relating to the Japanese peace treaty. As in so many other instances, I had the feeling that I was inflicting disappointment and discouragement on others by my inability to go along with ideas which generally commend themselves elsewhere in the department. I cannot agree that we ought to make ourselves a party to the formal assignment of Formosa to China, when we know that this means only injustice and misgovernment to the natives of the island for decades ahead. I cannot agree that we should insist on a Japanese promise to be democratic and to observe human rights when I know that we have no serious intention of insisting that they live up to such a promise once they have signed it. Talked this afternoon with Mr. Webb about my own status and told him of my desire to leave government service next June and to be permitted to work on long-term studies in the interval. I expressed the wish that I might be relieved of the title and responsibilities as director of the planning staff. This he did not agree to, but he undertook to give as much responsibility as possible to NHTSA and to make it possible for me to be relieved of current staff work to some extent. Paul M. Nitsa was Kennan's successor as head of the policy planning staff. September 30. 
The morning was marked by new claims staked out for time and energy in the coming period. Nitsa and Webb both think that we must work on a reappraisal of U.S. policy in the light of the Russian progress in atomic energy. The result of this study would be the April 1950 National Security Council Memorandum, NSC 68, authored by Nitsa, which painted the Soviet threat in dark colors and urged a fourfold increase in U.S. defense spending. The policy planning staff wanted completion of the study on our stance toward European Union. In the light of these demands, I had to cancel my plans for visiting the United Nations this fall and to reconcile myself to the fact that efforts on my part to get away from Washington always produce more trouble than success. Reflecting on this development, I realized that I faced the work of these remaining months with neither enthusiasm nor with hope for achievement. October 4. Talking with Ambassador to India, Loy Henderson, left me with a feeling of high uneasiness about any attempts we may make to cultivate a better relationship with Nehru and the Indians at this time. Their views about us are so badly fouled up with arrogance and ignorance, with false assumptions about American imperialism and about the comparative aspects of our relationship to Europe and Asia and to the white world and the colored world, that I would almost despair of trying to achieve at this time any relationship to the Indians based on a corrupt appreciation of the nature of our country and of its aspirations. I have the feeling that with respect to India, as was recently the case with China, things must get a lot worse before they can get better. What I would like to say to Nehru would be something like this. We feel that you people have permitted your minds to be filled up with a whole series of grievous unjust misconceptions concerning our country. As long as you entertain those misconceptions, we see little possibility of a closer relationship and even some danger in seeking it. This is primarily your concern, not ours. It is you who will be the sufferers if you stubbornly misinterpret to yourselves the important realities of this world. You think that in the ideas we have been expressing with regard to Southeast Asia, we have been pursuing some selfish American aim connected with a power struggle between the U.S. and the USSR, in which each is seeking some pattern of expanded dominion over other nations. This is a grievous mistake on your part. If the U.S. is trying to make the peoples of Asia conscious of a stake, which they have in their own independence from communist ideological and political domination, it is because it is trying to take an enlightened and far-sighted view of world stability, and not because it has some special acts of its own to grind. Viewed from a narrow interpretation of American security and interests, I am not sure that there is any reason for the U.S. to want to oppose Russian expansion into Southeast Asia. And if you insist, you can possibly succeed in preventing us from exerting any useful influence in that part of the world and leaving it, yourselves included, a prey to Russian pressures. You will then find out in the hard way and the painful way who is the friend of the Asiatic peoples and who is not, and you will learn that there is a difference between playing with the ruthless fire of Soviet imperialism and playing with the mellow and modest aspirations of the older and more mature Western world. Now, we are not going to woo you or cultivate you. You are the newcomers on the international scene. It is up to you to determine the quality of the relationships you wish to establish. If it embitters you that you cannot receive economic aid from a people whose motives you distrust and malign, we cannot help it and we are prepared to take that bitterness in our stride. When this present phase of world affairs has passed, you will at least have learned to respect us, whether or not you have learned to understand us. October 6. Spent the evening browsing in the new biography of Stalin by Isaac Deutscher. Stalin, A Political Biography, 1949. Kennan attached credence to the claim that Stalin, as a young man, had collaborated with the Tsarist secret police. While undoubtedly a serious and comprehensive work, carrying the story to a later date than any previous effort has done, I could not find that it added very much to our knowledge of Stalin's life up to his assumption of supreme authority in Russia, and I was not at all sure that Deutscher had done all that could have been done to get to the bottom of some of the more obscure phases of Stalin's early career. October 7. Spent most of the rest of the morning in a very intensive discussion within the staff on the question of the Austrian Treaty. From 1945 to 1955, Austria remained divided into U.S., Soviet, British, and French occupation zones. Since we examined the matter the other evening, two new factors have been added. 
First, further discussions with the Russians, plus some further reflection on our part, had made it appear that the position the Russians were taking was not seriously at variance with that which had been agreed at Paris. Second, the Austrians had shown us the draft of a letter which Gruber intended to write to the secretary on this subject. Karl Gruber was the Austrian foreign minister. The letter was aggressive, resentful, and blunt. It impugned our motives for hesitating to conclude the treaty on the present Russian terms and insisted that we do so. 1. I now feel that the Austrians are in a very poor position to defend their independence in the face of Russian pressures. 2. In the light of Gruber's views, I feel that the Austrian government has pretty well signed away the claim that it had, and which I have always sincerely acknowledged, on our sympathy and assistance. 3. This drives home so strongly to me the terrible unforgivableness of getting ourselves into situations of this sort, where we have lost the independence and integrity of our national action, that I would prefer a return to the historic policy of neutrality and isolation to a repetition of the series of mistakes which led us into our present position in the matter of the Austrian Treaty. October 12. In a discussion with military officials about ABC weapons, atomic, biological, chemical, they suggested that if our forces were to be expelled from the continent in a future war, the use of ABC weapons by the Russians might make it impossible for us to return. Similarly, it might be only through the use of ABC weapons that we could prevent our own expulsion. Since they expected that our superiority in the ABC weapons was now at its maximum power, they pointed out that we could conclude from this that the present would be the most advantageous for us to accept an agreement outlawing the use of such weapons. I cannot overcome the conviction that thinking in these terms reflects a vast overestimation of Russian capabilities and a misunderstanding of Russian intentions. But I cannot prove this conviction, and the matters in question are too important for anyone to dare act on a hunch. October 17 through 21. This week was more full of ideas than of events, and can be treated accordingly. The first category of ideas were those relating to what we call, for want of a better name, European integration. That embraces a whole bundle of questions, grouped around the following ones. Do we want to see closer integration among the European countries, today, perforce, the countries of Western Europe? If so, do we wish to see it carried to the point of abandonment of sovereignty? And again, if so, when and among what countries? And, regardless of what we may want, is it politic to urge anything like this at the present time? Paul Hoffman is leaving in a few days for Paris, where he must give the opening speech at the meeting of the OEEC. Paul G. Hoffman oversaw the administration of the Marshall Plan. The Organization for European Economic Cooperation was a European-based organization that helped coordinate the Marshall Plan while promoting the integration of Western Europe. Everyone feels that things are at a turning point and that the attitude we adopt at this moment will depend not alone on the purpose and function of European Recovery Plan aid in the third and fourth years of the Marshall Plan period, but whether there will be any such aid at all. ECA officials feel that if the European countries will not at least bind themselves to some program of economic union aimed at the creation of supranational agencies for certain key functions in the control of economic life, there is not much likelihood that they could use further aid effectively. The Economic Cooperation Administration, an agency of the U.S. government, administered the Marshall Plan. ECA could therefore not recommend it to the Congress very enthusiastically, and there would be little chance of getting the appropriation. ECA would therefore have us bring strong pressure on the Europeans at this time. Since the British are hardly in a position to participate in this sort of arrangement, they would have the continental countries proceed without the British. All this brings dismay to the European office of the State Department, which feels that this is all too hasty and abrupt, that there is no need for any such intimate economic union, and that any suggestion that the continentals proceed without the British will frighten the French and do political damage over all Western Europe. My own position is somewhere in between. I am not sure that the economic arguments for an early step toward real union are very compelling. I have deep feelings, however, about the political necessity of creating in Western Europe an international framework, 
which would bridge national sovereignties to such a degree as to give a different aspect to the German question by providing a home for the German people other than the national home, and thus lifting German horizons beyond those national limits with which the Germans have shown themselves so incapable of coping. October 24. An unprofitable day, from the standpoint of office accomplishment, taken up with a long argument in the policy planning staff in the morning about the USA itself and the relation of domestic and foreign policy, a lunch with Bill Bullitt, then dinner at the Swiss legation. The staff argument centered around my contention that we are a society which has no control over the direction in which it is moving, socially and technologically, and no assurance that the currents in which we are being involuntarily born are not ones which carry us away from our national ideals and the foundations of our type of representative government. We argued particularly about the labor movement and whether it had in it the elements of any real understanding of what constituted progress in human society or whether its concentration on higher wages and more leisure, without regard to the uses to which they might be put, was not merely a demagogic and basically reactionary approach. The latter was my idea. I think the others largely disagreed. Bill Bullitt talked about the problem of European integration. He felt that de Gaulle, with a certain amount of friendly interest and counsel from us, would have been prepared to take real leadership in Europe in the direction of an integration adequate to provide a definite framework for the solution of the German problem. Charles de Gaulle led the Free French Movement during the war and the French government in 1944 through 46. Our failure to take advantage of this opportunity he blamed on FDR and his violent aversion to de Gaulle. He felt that today the governments of the center were essentially paralyzed by the left socialist group. They could not run France with them, and they could not run France without them. On the Far East, we managed to stay fairly well clear of the painful subject of China. He warned in the strongest terms not to pin any hopes on Nehru and the Hindus. Build on anyone else you want, he said, on the Muslims, if you will, but not on the Hindus. He said he would rather found a policy on the Senegalese than on the Hindus. He said people who still insisted on letting 30 to 50 percent of the food of the country go to sacred animals could never develop India economically. And intellectually, they were brilliant, but unsubstantial. November 7. This was a day of comings and goings. The secretary and Paul Nitza left in the middle of the afternoon for Paris. Before they left, Vyshinsky, down in Washington for the November 7 celebration of the Russian Revolution at the Soviet Embassy, paid a courtesy call on the secretary. Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Vyshinsky had been state prosecutor during the terrible purge trials of the late 1930s. I sat in on the conversation and had the impression that Vyshinsky was really somewhat abashed and lacking in self-confidence in these surroundings, and in the secretary's presence. Not that it means anything now, but I am convinced that he is a bourgeois at heart and secretly would prefer to be Mr. Acheson's first assistant than Soviet foreign minister. It is much too late for this, of course. The shadow of his participation in the purges hangs over him, along with other shadows of his past, and binds him with bonds stronger than any prison bars or any emotional loyalties, to the terrible, implacable, and contemptuous masters to whom he has sold himself. November 8. The U.S. policy of building up West Germany as a more or less permanent state fills me with forebodings. This means that we do not really want any agreement with the Russians about Germany, now or for an indefinite time to come. But this, in turn, means no agreement with the Russians on anything of any importance. It means that we both carry on for an indefinite period with military commitments extending into the heart of Europe, that there can be no withdrawal for either of us without the other's military influence being sucked, as it were, into the resulting vacuum, that any Soviet military withdrawal from Eastern Europe as a whole becomes increasingly unthinkable, that the wedge across Europe gets driven deeper and deeper, that the settling down of this turbulent world into another period of relative stability becomes more and more unlikely, and that it becomes daily more difficult to see how this deadlock can ever be resolved by peaceful means. Let us make no mistake about this. Germany is the key to the situation, and present Western policy with respect to Germany leaves room for no plausible peaceful settlement with the Russians. In the face of this policy, 
the German question could be settled in a manner favorable to us only by an internal collapse of Soviet power. And a continuation of the deadlock, which is what we are steering for, must become increasingly difficult for the West, because the U.S. cannot indefinitely satisfy the gap in the food and raw material requirements of the heavily industrialized areas of all Western Europe and the United Kingdom. But the bargaining power of the West will probably decline from now on in trade matters. Eventually, there must be a considerable expansion of East-West trade. All in all, our policy on the continent takes us along a street to which there are only three outlets, a Russian collapse, a disintegration of our own position, or a terrible war. November 11. After dinner with a recently emigrated Russian couple, they were full of enthusiasm for life here, confident that nothing could be worse than the things they had been through, eager to throw themselves into the new life. I admired this attitude and was grateful for it. It was a much better one than you would find with many of the displaced persons, but it was clear that they were incapable of knowing or even imagining the real nature of the strains they would have to bear in this highly competitive, confusing, and, for a Russian, essentially lonely society. To survive here calls for certain types of strength which are not demanded even by the hardships and dangers of life in the Soviet Union. November 15. I cannot help feeling the irony of my being called upon for suggestions about how to make a go of things in the western sectors of Berlin at this stage of the game. I, having been the one person in the department who always insisted that the Berlin problem was not soluble in terms of a divided military occupation, that it could be solved only by a retirement of the respective Allied military forces in such a way as to throw open an area, including Berlin, which would be contiguous with both zones of occupation and leaving this area to be governed by the Germans themselves. Such a solution is, of course, now impossible, and probably it was impossible at the time I advocated it, because it is not likely that we would have had French agreement even if the Russians had consented to make tolerable arrangements. But we might at least, it seemed to me, have made it clear that this, the only sound solution, was the one we preferred, and that while we would take the alternative one, if others insisted, we did so skeptically and reluctantly, and the responsibility for its success rested with those others, and not with us. Princeton, November 15. Took the morning train to Princeton, lunched at the Princeton Inn, then walked out to the Institute for Advanced Study, to see Robert Oppenheimer, formerly head scientist of the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer was director of the Institute for Advanced Study, where Kennan in 1950 would come to live and work. Talked to him for an hour and a half, both about international control and about the problem of whether to proceed with the development of the super bomb. The Truman administration was trying to decide whether in the wake of the Soviet development of an atomic bomb, to build a much more powerful weapon, the hydrogen bomb. Kennan and Oppenheimer were opposed. It was Princeton as I remembered it from the moments of my greatest loneliness as a student. I walked out to the back street, far off campus, where I had rented a furnished room during my freshman year, when I was seventeen years old, and looked up at the window in the back of the clabbered rooming house. A light was on in the room, Perhaps some other student was now there, much like myself, in many ways, and yet, aside from individual differences, surely with some subtle, undefinable differences in outlook. Those are the differences which mark the distance between generations, and they are the great and important mysteries, for they are an integral part of the total mystery of change. I realized that I was surrounded here by men for whom the people of my generation were partly nuisances and, at best, regrettable and temporary necessities, that they were skeptical about the difficulties which had stood in our paths and unimpressed with our achievements. In their minds, we were already consigned to the ash heap of history. Would they soon be rising after us, crowding us, pushing us impatiently toward that ash heap? Yes, some of us they would be pushing, those of us engaged in the struggle for money or for other forms of power, but those of us to whom it had fallen to try to see behind the realities and to unravel the relationships of our civilization, we would not be pushed. There is plenty of space where we stand, 
space to the point of loneliness and terror. And any who work themselves into our vicinity, old or young, will soon feel the protecting covering of the generations falling ominously away from them, and they will huddle together with us and with the curious ones of all times and ages, seeking warmth and company before the coldness and the endlessness and the silence that confront them. Washington, November 18. Meeting of the Foreign Service Examination Board, with further efforts on the part of some of us, to save the principle of professional diplomacy from the envious talons of people ignorant of the meaning of the term. Poor Foreign Service, whose honorary head I now happen to be. You will always be defenseless in a democratic society, and every time your members begin to grow intellectually and imaginatively into a thoughtful and constructive concept of their own functions, they will attract envy and resentment by their differences and will eventually be discouraged and embittered into resigning and they will leave behind them the mediocre spirits who will then dominate the service. And people will continue to say, how can you ask us to support the foreign service? You haven't got any good men in it. In this way, American diplomacy will move along, for better or for worse, with always a few young men advancing just enough in experience and understanding to realize what the profession might be with a little support and then paying the penalty for this dazzling appreciation by being criticized as de-Americanized and condemned to ignominy and frustration before they can make this appreciation the basis of any constructive effort. Went out to dinner at the home of some friends, where one of our former colleagues in Moscow showed us a series of colored movies taken in the Soviet Union. What stood out to my mind was how silly all the foreigners looked compared to the Russians, People generally look silly when they are posing for amateur movies, but it was clear nevertheless from these pictures how idiotic most Western foreigners must ordinarily appear to the denizens of the Soviet Union, with their endless drinking and partying, their preoccupation with the physical comforts, their desperate pursuit of distraction from boredom, their obvious lack of any serious interests. November 19. Pondering today the frustrations of the past week, it occurred to me that it is time I recognized that my planning staff, started nearly three years ago, has simply been a failure. Like all previous attempts to bring order and foresight into the designing of foreign policy by special institutional arrangements within the department. Aside from personal shortcomings, the reason for this seems to lie largely in the impossibility of having the planning function performed outside of the line of command. The formulation of policy is the guts of the work of the department, and none of it can successfully be placed outside the hierarchy which governs operations. No one can regiment this institution in the field of ideas except the secretary. He can take as much independent advice as he likes from outside the institution. He can take it orally from special assistants or counselors or other official advisors. But when it comes to any formalized staff effort, Anything that has to be put down in writing and is designed to serve as a major guide for action, the operating units, the geographic and functional units, will not take interference from any unit outside the line of command. They insist on an effective voice in policy determination. If one of them cannot make its voice alone valid, it insists on the right to water down any recommendation going to the secretary to a point where it may be meaningless, but it is at least not counter to its views. The only way the thing will work is if a secretary of state will thresh out a basic theoretical background of his policy and then really set up some sort of an educational unit through whose efforts this system can be patiently and persistently pounded into the heads of the entire apparatus, high and low. November 20. If the French are unwilling to move toward a normalization of Germany's position in Europe, and if none of the Western European countries besides Germany is in a position to take any leadership in the direction of European Union, and if no one there has any ideas how this can be done, and it is therefore all very premature and impossible, then this is very unfortunate for the Continentals, for it means that they have no real chance of coping with their responsibilities, that in the end the continent must be dominated by the Germans or the Russians or a combination of both, and that a sound U.S. policy would have to aim at an early readjustment to this sad state of reality. In other words, I would like to call their attention to the fact 
that while it may be very true that they lack the will and the understanding to do the things we are pressing them to do, there is no satisfactory alternative to their doing these things, and their confession of helplessness is not something we can all cheerfully accept and take in our stride, but the evidence of a grim and ominous situation, more tragic for them than it is for us. November 21. This afternoon, the department announced that it had approached 30 other countries presumed to have consular or diplomatic representatives in communist China and had requested them to intercede with the Chinese communist authorities for the release of our consul in Mukden, Angus Ward. Held under house arrest and charged with espionage by the victorious Chinese communist government, Ward and his staff were finally released in December 1949. I had not known of this decision before its announcement and was hard put to answer telephonic and other inquiries about it which came to me late in the day. To my mind, this is a good example of how we should not behave. The Chinese communists are under no obligation to us. It is our own fault that we left our consul there when the place was taken by the communists. This is a straight bilateral issue between ourselves and them. If we were prepared to behave like a great power we would treat it as a bilateral issue and not make ourselves ridiculous by asking a lot of weaker powers to assist us in solving it. I am constantly amazed at the manifestations of the stubborn belief on the part of some of my colleagues that we are wicked if we act alone on our own responsibility, but are moral and praiseworthy if we place ourselves timorously in the company of a lot of others and pretend that we are just one of the crowd. At dinner tonight I had to listen to sharp criticisms of our policy on Formosa, to assertions that we should be taking the island under our own wing, and to charges that if the military and naval authorities had been consulted, the State Department would never have been able to get away with such a pusillanimous policy. It was not easy for me, who recommended months ago that we take this bull by the horns and assume responsibility for the island, to defend our failure to do so. And it was even harder to refrain from pointing out that our failure to do so was largely the result of the unwillingness of the National Defense Establishment to assume the attendant military responsibilities. November 22. Pondering further the reasons for my own sense of frustration in my present position, I realize that the heart of the difficulty lies in the fact that my concept of the manner in which our diplomatic effort should be conducted is not shared by any of the other senior officials of the department, and that the secretary is actually dependent on these officials, for better or for worse, for the execution of any foreign policy at all. Even if he shared my views, he would not be able to find others who did. And lacking such others, he would have to operate through people whose philosophy of foreign affairs would necessarily be a different one. The fact of the matter is that this operation cannot be unified and given real purpose or direction unless a firm theoretical groundwork has been laid to back up whatever policy is pursued, and unless the persons most concerned here and in our delegation in New York and in our occupied areas establishments and in our field offices have all been thoroughly and severely indoctrinated in this theoretical groundwork so that they all have the same understanding of what it is that we are trying to do. Since our present governmental system lacks the disciplinary authority for such indoctrination, it can come really only through an intensive educational effort directed toward our public opinion in general, and particularly toward the work of our universities. All this impels me to the thought that if I am ever to do any good in this work, having the courage of my convictions, it must be outside the walls of this institution and not inside them. 1950 In 1950, Kennan took a fact-finding trip to Latin America. He found little to like in the people, their culture, or the land. This was also the year that he began to shift from State Department advisor to scholar at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He nevertheless played a key role in shaping the Truman administration's response following North Korea's invasion of South Korea on June 25. Along with the entries for 1949... The diary for 1950 is unique in its detailed coverage of Kennan's involvement with top-level foreign policy. Though he remained a key player in 1949 through 50, growing frustration with the direction of policy and the way it was made led him, it seems, to vent in the diary. In 1946 through 48, when he had been at the height of his influence, the diary suffered. Before 1946 and after 1950, 
He wrote about foreign policy, but not as an insider. Kennan's belief that others might someday read his diary also shaped its content. Innate discretion, honed by a career as a diplomat, inclined Kennan against putting down on paper sensitive details about foreign policy or about his personal life. And yet, throughout his life, he burned with a desire to have his prescience recognized, preferably by the president and other top officials. But if not, then by the public and by posterity. Washington, January 8. Began the day by reading the draft of a speech to be given to the press club by the secretary next Thursday on Far Eastern policy. This was the speech in which Acheson would declare that South Korea remained outside the U.S. defense perimeter in the Western Pacific. The secretary would later come under fierce attack by domestic critics for supposedly inviting the June invasion by North Korea. Found it dull and sanctimonious and therefore worked in the afternoon and evening on the beginning of a draft of my own. January 9. Met late in the afternoon in the secretary's office to consider a plethora of messages from Club and Pei Ping concerning the orders he had received from the Chinese communists to turn over to them the building in the U.S. compound, which now houses the consulate general, as well as certain other American properties. Oliver Edmund Club a China expert at the State Department, was later falsely accused by Senator Joseph McCarthy of sympathy for the Chinese communists. Pei Ping was the name for present-day Beijing, favored by the U.S.-supported government of Chiang Kai-shek. I pressed strongly for a firm refusal on our part to do this, coupled with a statement that if they seized the property, we would withdraw all representation at once from communist China. The decades-long Chinese Civil War ended in October 1949 with victory for the Communists, who established the People's Republic of China. Washington would not recognize that government for three decades. I argued this and was supported by the Far Eastern Office on the grounds that if they wanted us there, they would probably not push it to this extreme. If they did not want us there, there was no use trying to stay anyway. This position was adopted. I feared that it means that the rest of our personnel in Chinese communist territory, who never should have been left there anyway, will probably become hostages and perhaps even prisoners. But I see no way of avoiding this. Any indication of weakness on our part would merely invite new outrages on the part of the Chinese communists, and eventually we would come to the same result. January 11. We were all much interested by news this morning of strong evidence of Tito tendencies in the Japanese Communist Party. In 1948, the communist leader of Yugoslavia, Marshal Tito, had declared his independence from Moscow's influence. This bears out my view that Tito's heresy will have the effect, in the end, of making Moscow's control over the communist movement roughly coterminous with its military power. Diary Notes of Trip to South America February through March. February 19. The train was moving through the approaches to St. Louis, just east of the Mississippi, a grim waste of crisscrossing railroads, embankments, viaducts, junk lots, storage lots, piles of refuse, and the most abject specimens of human habitation. In St. Louis. On this particular afternoon, the riverbank was inhabited by six stray dogs, a bum who sat on a piece of driftwood and held one of the dogs in his lap, two small colored children with a bag of popcorn, and a stranger from Washington who sat on another piece of driftwood and sketched a cluster of four abandoned craft tied up by the shore. To wit, one scow with gasoline drums, one dredge, one dirty motorboat, and one genuine old showboat, still in use but slightly self-conscious. The colored children hovered over my shoulder, chattering pleasantly and dropping popcorn down my neck as they watched the progress of the drawing. The faint sunshine slanted in upon us across the rooftops. Railroad trains clattered along both sides of the river and across the high bridge upstream. A gull came ashore to dabble in the slime between the cobblestones, and the river moved lazily past, a great slab of dirty gray water, gleaming here and there in the sunshine curling and eddying and whispering quietly to itself as it went along. I walked back through the old business district, a district of narrow, dark streets, of sooty, fortress-like bank buildings, and hotels which once were elegant. 
The trouble with American cities is that they have grown and changed too fast. The new is there before the old is gone. What in one era is functional and elegant and fashionable survives into the following era as grotesque decay. These cities have never had time to clean up after themselves. They have never had time to bury their dead. They are strewn with indecent skeletons in the form of the blighted areas, the abandoned mansions of the gay nineties, the old railroad and waterfront vicinities, the houses by the railroad tracks. Mexico City, February 23. On the main avenues, the ostentatious, anxious demonstration of wealth by an ever-changing nouveau riche, which boils up like foam to the surface of a society that calls itself revolutionary. Off the main avenues, the people, the demoralized, urbanized people, the wiry, swarthy little men, violent in temper, lacking in self-respect and self-confidence, overcompensating by a dramatized romantic abandon and ferocity and personality, yet addicted in large part to every sort of chicanery and petty graft. The women, tiny, pathetic, unhealthy-looking. The children, imp-like, with dusty bare feet, with sores and scabies, all of them ridden in large part with inherited and intestinal diseases. These people have lost the virtues of their Indian villages and have never learned the restraints which alone could give reality to the pretenses of the city. February 25. The officials of the Mexican government had been friendly, polite, and hospitable. We had our problems with them, too, but that was quite another matter. Here on these streets you felt neither friendliness nor hostility, only a contemptuous indifference, rooted in experience too profound for any ready analysis. It would have taken the patience and fortitude and persistence of a saint to fathom these murky human souls with their century-old burden of oppression and frustration, and to find out on what sort of terra firma, if any, one could begin to erect the foundations of confidence and hope and self-reliance and understanding. We, at any rate, were far from this point. And there was, it seemed to me, little evidence that time was working in our favor. The excellent work being done by our experts in improvement of agricultural and industrial practices, in public health, etc., was evidently destined to run head-on into the population problem as soon as their success began to affect the birth rate. Meanwhile, just on the mountains between there and Cuernavaca, already badly deforested and eroded, at least four fires were burning by my own observation in the remaining timber, probably deliberately started. And there was no question but that soil was slipping away and water tables falling at an alarming rate over important parts of the country. This did not promise basic changes in those conditions which had made Mexico a bitter, tragic country, and which had buried so deeply in the Mexican soul those qualities which enable man to entertain the thought and hope of a way out of his squalor and ignominy. Cathedral of the Virgin of Guadalupe, February 26. In the scene of the procession, as it moved past us, there was an overwhelming electric starkness that rocked the spectator like a bolt of lightning. The gross, bleary faces of the priests the desperate intentness of the kneeling, scurrying women, the heads of the choir boys thrown back, and their faces uplifted as they sang, their child eyes glancing upward at the great Roman columns and vaults with their gold ornamentation, the dirty, bursting shoes sticking out from under the priestly and choral robes and shuffling over the worn flagstones. Here was the full-throated utterance of the human mass, with all its age-old vitality, with its spiritual dependence, its will to believe and its readiness to submit to the organization and regimentation of that same will. I drove back to the airport, still saturated with the penetrating eloquence of this scene. I have never taken offense at the thesis of the Roman Church that many men require a spiritual as well as a profane framework of law, a moral order founded on an appreciation of the dilemmas of birth and death and of the requirements of social living, a moral order drawn up by those who are wiser and more experienced than themselves and capable of channelizing into the body of spiritual law the ponderous experiences of the millennia of human progress. For many people, it is always better that there should be some moral law, 
even an imperfect one or an entirely arbitrary one, than that there should be none. For the human being who recognizes no moral restrictions and has no sense of humility is worse than the foulest and cruelest beast. This procession in Mexico City, 1950, was ominously reminiscent of one held many thousands of miles away, one day in the 19th century, on the dusty outskirts of a Russian village, and recorded so brilliantly by Rapin in his famous canvas. Religious procession in Kursk province was painted by the 19th century populist-minded artist Ilya Rapin. The church will have to plunge deeply into its fund of Christian tradition to find the understanding, the selflessness, the inspiration, and the true charity which alone can save it in such countries as Mexico from the ills which befell the church of the Eastern Rite in Russia. I did not find those qualities in the faces of those who walked in this procession, any more than Ripon found them in that nineteenth-century crowd moving out of the village to supplicate the Almighty for rainfall to relieve the parched fields. Guatemala City, February 26. The ambassador met me there, and we talked about his problems with the local communists, who are probably stronger in that country than in any other country in Latin America. The U.S. ambassador to Guatemala was Richard C. Patterson, Jr. In 1954, the CIA would overthrow the democratically elected left-leaning government of Guatemala. Panama City, February 27. I stayed overnight with the ambassador in the spacious new embassy which the government has built. The U.S. ambassador to Panama was Monet B. Davis. We talked at dinner about scorpions and snakes and Panamanian communists. Caracas, February 28. Here was a tropical country in the subsoil of which reposed great quantities of a liquid essential to the present stage of industrialization in the U.S. Americans were extracting this liquid and hauling it away. The local population had not moved a finger to create this wealth, would have been incapable of developing it, and did not require, for its own needs, the thousandth part of what was apparently there. However, for the privilege of being able to enter and extract this liquid, our firms were paying hundreds of millions of dollars annually into the coffers of the Venezuelan government, a sort of ransom to the theory of state sovereignty and the principle of non-intervention which we had consented to adopt. The traffic could bear it. Prices of oil permitted it. The companies could pay this tribute and still make money. There was plenty of oil under the ground. Perhaps this could go on for a long time. There were signs that the competitive position of high-priced Venezuelan oil was falling off, but important iron deposits had been found, and new capital was already pouring in for their development. Still, one could not avoid the conviction that some day, somehow, there would inevitably be a terrible awakening, a day when the morphine of oil company or steel company royalties and taxes would no longer enter the system of Venezuelan economy, when the country would be thrown back upon its own resources, and when someone would have the unpleasant task of dealing with a terribly disoriented and intellectually debilitated population. It would behoove us to think about that day and to anticipate it. Incidentally, all of nature in Venezuela was a bilious yellow-brown. Trinidad, March 4. Coming to Trinidad from Central and South America, one senses clearly the difference between English and Spanish colonization, even when it involved superimposition of a colonial strata onto a colored native population. The colored people of the West Indies, while by no means adjusted to or satisfied with British rule, make an impression of relaxation and self-respect and placidity by comparison with the violent characteristics of people in the Spanish colonized areas. Rio de Janeiro, March 8. The Brazilians have acquired, from the humane and cosmopolitan Portuguese, who were their founding fathers, a gentleness which, in my view, is the essence of civilization, and for which one can only bear them respect and affection but they are no more free than other Latin American peoples from the addiction to a pathological urbanism, out of all proportion to their resources and strangely devoid of real content, an urbanism that moves them to come to the city to spend their money and to invest in urban real estate, that which they cannot spend. In this sense, there is a certain sad futility which hangs over this continent. 
and he who would understand it must picture to himself these spectacular luxury districts of the great South American cities. Montevideo, March 10. There is more self-respect here, more relaxation. Uruguay is spared the racial problem, has a large mixture of that Italian ingredient which seems so healthy and constructive for South American cultures. People are quiet and decently dressed and seem to be going normally about their business instead of seething with frustrated hatred and indignation about this or that. Yet wool exports to the United States are paralyzed by a communist strike for no other reason than they do go to the United States, and we are conceived to be suffering somehow by their absence. And the long rows of warehouses near the railroad station are patrolled by mounted police, lest the strikers get at the stocks of wool and destroy them. Miami, March 20. I ate breakfast at the airport restaurant and then was driven in by the State Department representative to the railroad station. There I had to change my reservation at the ticket window. The attendant was new, and his buddy, who was breaking him in, gave him advice on how to transact this business. Their attitude toward this work in hand was characterized by that relaxed, unemotional, but utterly objective and self-respecting attitude, which is the mark of our people. The basic reliability and decency and common sense which sprang from the performance of this simple transaction struck me, the traveler, coming in out of the heavens from the tense, charged confusion of another world, with the brilliant force of contrast, and I went out onto the station platform with a sense of deep gratitude and of happy acceptance of this American world, marked as it is by the mediocrity of all that is exalted, and the excellence of all that which is without pretense. Princeton, June 10. It is with reluctance and as an act of self-discipline that I address myself again to maintaining a set of personal notes. So much of life seems a repetition of the known, but with the coming departure from government work there will be a need for a self-imposed discipline of thought, for a greater independent effort to achieve quietness and detachment from environment. Without this, too much to flip by. After lunch, we went on to Princeton. I was going to stop off there for a day at my class reunion. Driving around in the baking heat of mid-afternoon, we finally found the 1925 headquarters at one of the eating clubs on Prospect Street. A brilliant undergraduate was checking in the libraries. He checked my name off the list and coolly asked me for $75. I was horrified. I was head over heels in debt. I couldn't have raised $75 by any stretch of the imagination. I fled and repaired in panic to the Institute, the Institute for Advanced Study, which Kennan would make his academic home for the next half century. Here, fortified by Oppie's genial serenity, I made arrangements to have a telegram sent from my office in Washington, expressing regrets at my inability to attend. Oppie is J. Robert Oppenheimer. Unhappy with his diminished influence in the administration, Kennan was intent on leaving government but as the following entry shows, he was willing to stay on if he was awarded the most prestigious ambassadorship to Great Britain. Under Secretary of State James E. Webb, who was close to Secretary Acheson, did not seem eager to pursue the matter. The London Post was a plum usually granted to a wealthy political donor, such as the businessman Walter S. Gifford, who succeeded Ambassador Lewis Williams Douglas. Washington, June 14. There was a long meeting on psychological warfare, then talked to Mr. Webb, who said he was still hoping that I would get tired of private life very soon and return to the department, and that for that reason he was holding the position open. I told him that I really thought it was better for me to be outside of government at this time, and that I was planning to be away at least for the full academic year. I told him that plans for the more distant future would depend somewhat, of course, on what use they could make of me. Only one thing I would mention, which I had already spoken to him about, namely that if there were really no other alternative to having some completely unqualified person follow Douglas in London, I would be willing to do that rather than see a post of such great delicacy and importance misused in this way. Mr. Webb said he had already spoken to the secretary about this, but that they considered the post was so expensive that I would not be able to afford it. In the afternoon, I received Mr. Heindel of the Social Science Research Council, 
whose desiderata and purposes in coming to see me remained, after his visit, as fuzzy to my mind as much of the language used by the social science school among the academicians. Richard H. Heindel. I had spent an hour on the train on Monday going through the papers he sent me, and from these I gathered that there was a certain feeling of frustration in the social science world over their inability to be of assistance to the government in its foreign policy tasks. They feel that they are the discoverers of some new technique for the uncovering of knowledge about the world, and that the government ought to have use for this. They had been promoting concentrated programs of area study in various U.S. universities, which I think is all to the good and much needed as a backstop for study and for governmental understanding of foreign countries. But I told them that I was suspicious of collective effort in this field, in the sense that I felt that while the work of many people could contribute to appreciations which would be valuable, those appreciations would always have to stem from the mind of a single person and could never be greater or wider than that. In other words, there is no collective substitute for plain individual wisdom. The social science techniques may contribute to that type of wisdom, but they cannot replace it or improve upon it. I asked Club whether it had never occurred to him that the present situation bore a strong resemblance to the period between the Boxer Uprising and the Russian-Japanese War, a period marked by violent anti-foreign feeling in China, by a forced withdrawal of the Japanese from the mainland picture, and by consequent rapid Russian penetration of Manchuria and Korea. He said that he agreed with the parallel, but that if it were to be carried to conclusion, the Japanese would have to be given the wherewithal to play their part again in the Far East, as they had done at the time of the Russian-Japanese War. To this I replied, Precisely. And the discussion ended on that note. June 25 After glancing at the headlines of the Sunday papers announcing the attack of the North Korean forces against South Korea, I changed clothes and hurried down to the office. Found the secretary in conference with a group of people including Jessup, Rusk, and Matthews. State Department advisors Philip C. Jessup, Dean Rusk, and H. Freeman Matthews. They had spent a good part of the day, as I gathered, arranging for U.N. action, and now the Security Council, having acted with almost unbelievable speed, and passed a resolution calling on all its members not to assist the North Korean forces, but rather to help the U.N. in its efforts to prevent this aggression, they were getting down to the consideration of what the U.S. action should be. When my views were asked, which was shortly after my entry into the room, I had to plead unfamiliarity with what had been discussed and done so far. I said that one thing seemed certain to me, that whatever else happened, it would be impossible for us not to take prompt steps to assure that Formosa did not fall to the communists, since this, coming on top of the Korean attack, would be calamitous to our position in the Far East. We continued our discussion until about 6.15, when the secretary went to the airport to meet the president. It had been arranged that the secretary, accompanied by a few of the senior officials of the department, would have dinner with the president and with a number of the military leaders. This had been arranged before I got there. After the secretary had left for the airport, I was told that he had specifically said that he wanted me present at this occasion, but his secretary said that she was certain that somehow or other my name had not been included on the list which was sent to the White House, and that she also knew that only a certain number of places were available for the dinner, and that there would be no room for extra plates. I therefore went home for supper and returned later in the evening to be on hand when the secretary got back from Blair House. This occurred about 11 p.m., as I recall it. He said that the president had given orders that the 7th Fleet was to start north from the Philippines and had authorized the Navy to move other units westward from the Pacific coast to reinforce it. He had authorized MacArthur's headquarters to give air cover for the evacuation of American citizens from Korea. Finally, he had placed the strictest injunctions on everyone that there was to be no further discussion of this matter pending further decisions. June 26. This morning, in addition to attending the War College commencement, I sat in on an extensive discussion in the Secretary's office on the attitude we should adopt in the Korean matter. This discussion went on most of the noon hour and carried over into the afternoon. I stated it as my deep conviction that the U.S. had no choice but to accept this challenge and to make it its purpose to see to it that South Korea was restored to the rule of the Republic of Korea. The question of what we should commit to this purpose 
was simply a question of what was required for the completion of the task. I reiterated my view that something also had to be done about Formosa, pointing out that this matter had great urgency. This whole question was discussed at length, and the others present, who were the senior advisors in the department, all gave their views. My own concept of the reasons why I felt we should take the position I advocated was expressed in a paper I prepared during the course of the day on a question which had been advanced last night by the President. The President had said that he wanted to be advised at once on any prospects for further Russian action in other areas, and it had been decided earlier in the day that the task of preparing the State Department's position on this point would be assigned to me. I, therefore, after discussions with the policy planning staff, prepared during the course of the day the following paper, which constitutes in itself a pretty good picture of the background of my own thinking. At about 3.30 in the afternoon, the secretary broke off the discussions we had been having with him and said that he wanted time to be alone and to dictate. We were called in about 6.30 p.m., and he read to us a paper he had produced, which was a first draft of the statement finally issued by the president, and which was not significantly changed by the time it finally appeared the following day as the president's statement. I think this fact is of historical significance, since it shows Mr. Atchison's advocacy of the course actually taken by this government was not something pressed upon him by the military leaders, but rather something arrived at by himself, in solitary deliberation and in the knowledge of all that was at stake. By the time we had been over the secretary's draft, it was already after seven, and he was due at the White House early in the evening. All of us who were in conference with him therefore went with him to the Metropolitan Club, where we had a hasty supper. Since it was decided the same group should go to the White House as had gone the night before, I stayed away and went home for a short rest. I arrived back at the State Department at the exact moment that the secretary and the others returned. The situation was as follows. The president had approved the statement in principle, but the text of it was to be finally worked out by the Department of State and Defense and be ready for release the following day about 12 o'clock, by which time the president expected to have received and consulted with congressional leaders. Meanwhile, it had been understood that the Joint Chiefs of Staff would at once issue orders to our forces in the Far East, implementing the decisions set forth in the statement. We therefore immediately set about the final polishing up of the statement, and were busy with this until after midnight. When it was finished, the text was telephoned to the defense establishment in order that we might get their comments the first thing in the morning and submit an agreed version to the president. We then faced the question of communicating to Chiang Kai-shek the decision with regard to Formosa. Obviously, it would be improper and undesirable for him to receive this news only from the press and radio, and some communication would have to be made to him at once. June 27. During the course of Monday's deliberations, I had brought up the problem of what we would do in case our forces operating in Korea were to be opposed by Soviet forces identifiable through their uniforms or insignia. I had stressed the importance, in my view, to our recognizing that this would create a new situation, calling for a new set of decisions. Otherwise, it would be possible for us to back into a war with Russia without meaning to do so, simply through the execution of the orders already given to our forces and designed to meet only a local situation. Accordingly, I had been asked by Mr. Webb and the others to put my views on this subject in writing in order that the matter might be broached to the defense establishment. Therefore, I got to work on this first thing in the morning and produced the following paper. After slight modifications by the secretary, Jessup, and others, this was discussed early in the afternoon with the secretary of the Army, Pace, who undertook to lay the matter before the defense establishment, Frank Pace, Jr., it was understood that he would not use my contribution as a State Department paper, but would present it merely as some personal thoughts of mine. That took up a good part of the morning and the early afternoon. The President's announcement was made about 12 o'clock. About half an hour prior to that time, Perkins, the head of the European office, phoned me in some perturbation that he had, arriving at that moment, all the envoys of the North Atlantic Pact countries whom he had been instructed to receive for the purpose of communicating to them the text of the President's statement, but that he had been given no briefing whatsoever on what to say to them and did not know what to do about it. George W. Perkins, Jr. The Secretary, Rusk, Matthews, and Jessup had all gone to the White House to be present when the President spoke to the Congressional leaders, and they were therefore not available to give him any help. 
I therefore agreed to go up and speak to the ambassadors myself, and did so at once. There was quite a group of them, since most of them had brought at least one assistant. Perkins first read the communique over to them twice, so that they might all take careful note of its contents. He then gave the floor to me. I had given no prior thought about what to say to them, and had no instructions, so I had to ad-lib, and did so along the following lines. First I analyzed Soviet motives, stressing the possible relationship of the Korean move to the problem of the Japanese peace treaty. I also pointed out that the timing might have been determined by the simple fact that they had by this time concluded the training and equipping of the North Korean forces to a degree where they considered them adequate to the task. I then said that in deciding to employ our own forces there, we were not acting under any strong convictions about the strategic importance of the territory, but rather in the light of our analysis of the damage to world confidence and morale, which would have been produced had we not so acted. I analyzed the probable consequences of a failure on our part to act in their relation to Japan, to Formosa, to the Philippines, to Indochina, and to Europe. I told them that we had no intention to do more than to restore the status quo ante, and no intention to proceed to the conquest of northern Korea. I said that if the Soviet Union threw its own forces against us, that would create an entirely new situation, both internationally and from the standpoint of our own internal decisions in this country, and would call for a review of our entire position. I explained the relationship of our action to a resolution which had been passed by the United Nations Security Council, saying that while we considered that we were acting in pursuance to and in the spirit of the Security Council resolution, we also recognized that we were in a peculiar situation in this respect inasmuch as we had a special responsibility arising out of our status in Japan and were the only one of the members of the United Nations except China and the Soviet Union who had forces in that immediate vicinity. I said that I could conceive, therefore, that what might constitute our duty in pursuance of the Security Council resolution might be different from what other countries would consider their duty to be. We were well aware, I said, that in what we were doing, there was an element of grave risk. We were convinced, however, that the risks of our failure to do this would be greater still. There were a few questions afterward, and then the meeting broke up. I had the impression that the effect had been favorable, and that the ambassadors were, by and large, sympathetic to our action and to the considerations I had set forth to them. Later in the afternoon, one of the officials of the press section phoned me to say that he had heard that I had given a very successful presentation of our position to the envoys of the Atlantic Pact countries, and to ask whether I would not give an off-the-record briefing along similar lines to a group of selected correspondents. I said that I would be pleased to do it if instructed to do so, but that I would not wish to make the suggestion myself. Word came back later in the day that the secretary had disapproved of the idea and had phoned the president, who also disapproved. So nothing came of it but I could not help feeling that it was a mistake not to give to the press the most complete presentation of the background of our action. June 28. At the usual meeting with the secretary the first thing in the morning, Mr. Webb said that in the evening he had discussed with people in the Pentagon and with the president the questions I had raised with regard to the possibility of our encountering Russian forces, and that he had encountered a feeling in both places that MacArthur's orders were quite sufficient, and he should carry them out regardless. General Douglas MacArthur. I said that never have I ever spoken about anything at that table in the secretary's office, about which I felt more strongly than I did about this, that we were dealing here with a matter of the utmost seriousness, and it was of the greatest importance that we know at all times exactly what it is that we were doing, and not let ourselves get carried into anything by accident. Rusk then said that a meeting had been arranged later in the morning with some of the people from the office of the Secretary of Defense, and that we were to talk the matter out there. When we met with the defense officials, who included two assistant secretaries of the Army and two or three officers, I made the initial statement on this subject again, and emphasized that what I was interested in was getting everyone in our government, including General MacArthur's headquarters and the men on the planes and the ships, to realize that if they encounter Soviet forces— this would constitute a new situation requiring new decisions, and that they should therefore, while continuing to defend themselves and to terminate successfully the engagements they were in, make it their main concern to get back and report what had happened, 
and should not needlessly aggravate these conflicts with Soviet forces until this government had had an opportunity to review the situation. I pointed out that if we did not make this distinction clear and went on the basis that our existing orders would be followed out, come what may, and required no amplification, then we would be assigning to the Russians or to chance the decision as to whether there would be a new world war. This, I said, was a decision of which we had no right to divest ourselves. Much more was at stake than just Korea or even just the interests of the U.S., and if we were to be led into such a conflict, it should be by the most grave and deliberate decision on our part. The upshot of the meeting was that we drafted a brief statement, setting forth the gist of this position, and the defense officials took it back for consideration in the Pentagon. Immediately after lunch, I went to the White House for a meeting of the National Security Council, attended by the President. Here, this same question of the possible widening of the conflict was discussed. Secretary Johnson said that they were not averse to giving MacArthur orders along this line, but that they wanted to wrap them up in a set of orders having a wider scope, rather than issue them to him as an isolated order. They said they would proceed rapidly with this. No objection was voiced. General Vandenberg set forth the difficulties which the Air Force was facing by virtue of weather and other factors, and showed how their situation would be eased if they were able to operate north of the 38th parallel. General Hoyt S. Vandenberg was the Air Force Chief of Staff. After returning to the department, we met again with the Secretary, Dean Acheson. In the course of the conversation, I said that I thought we might consider an alteration of our position about the 38th parallel to the following effect, that while we would continue to state it as our purpose not to reoccupy any territory north of the parallel, we would not limit our forces to operations south of the parallel, but would say that they would operate anywhere in Korea where their operations might promote the achievement of the mission set forth above. This suggestion was generally welcomed. In fact, it was clear that other people had been thinking along the same lines, and I can claim no originality for the thought, but I think it was instrumental in determining the establishment of a favorable State Department position on this point. In the middle of the day, Wednesday, Avril Harriman and Chip Bolin arrived from Paris, and Chip threw himself into the work at my side, helping me with problems I faced. June 29. Upon arrival in the morning, I ordered the establishment of two intelligence analysis teams, one for the intentions and attitudes of the Soviet government, and the other for the same thing with respect to the Peiping government. The code room sent down the telegram copy of Moscow's report on the reply to the Soviet note. It was unprovocative and appeared to be dictated primarily by a resolve to keep Moscow's responsibility in the affair entirely disengaged in the formal sense. At the same time, we got word of a highly bellicose and inflammatory statement issued by Chow En Lai, constituting the nearest thing in communist practice, the communist governments never declare war, to a declaration of war against us and calling on the peoples of the East to rise up against us. Chow En Lai was premier of the People's Republic of China. While it seemed to me that this statement must have bent the bow of moscow Peiping relations pretty far, and might turn out to be something of a blunder on the part of the Chinese communists, it indicated, when taken together with the Moscow reply, a pretty clear pattern of Soviet intentions, namely to keep out of this business themselves in every way, but to embroil us to the maximum with their Korean and Chinese satellites. All day the news from Korea was most discouraging. The South Korean forces are rapidly melting away and leaving the task to us. The picture was brightened only by two things that happened to me during the day. I was stimulated early in the morning by overhearing a radio program in which, immediately following the reading of the news from Korea, a colored woman sang a song with the following refrain, Save that Confederate money, boys. The South shall rise again. When we went in the morning to the National Security Council offices, which are in the old State Department building, I observed to Matthews, while we were riding up in the elevator, that if we hadn't moved out of that old building, all these things would never have happened. To my surprise, the colored elevator woman turned around and said with great firmness and enthusiasm, That's right, sir. June 30. On arrival at the office, I was called right into Matthew's office for conference. The secretary had gone to the White House and wanted our advice on certain matters immediately upon his return. The matters were these. 
Chiang Kai-shek had offered 30,000 troops for the support of the Korean venture. What should our answer be? It was our view, based on the advice of one of the intelligence analysis teams which I had established, that the Generalissimo's offer of troops was probably motivated by three considerations, namely, one, his desire to establish himself in the eyes of the American people and the world as a full-fledged fighting ally and to recoup his own prestige abroad, two, a desire to place Chinese troops on the Korean Peninsula, so that in the event that the Korean conflict enlarges into World War III and the U.S. successfully drives back the North Koreans and Soviet armies, Chinese troops will be in a position to move into Manchuria, and three, a wish to get off the island Chinese forces, of whose loyalty he is not completely confident. We were told that our military people did not want to have these forces. They would arrive without supplies or ammunition, it would be of doubtful political reliability if they met Chinese communist forces, etc. We also discussed the question of what line to take with regard to Chow's flamboyant and bellicose statement issued yesterday, placing communist China, in effect, in a state of hostilities with the U.S. I said that it seemed to me that the Russian game was obviously to play their Asiatic satellites against us, that this was placing a great strain on Soviet satellite relationships, that these relationships, therefore, consisted the weak point against which we should drive. I therefore proposed that we take a position roughly as follows and assert it with a powerful propaganda campaign. We refuse to permit ourselves to be provoked into any conflict with the Chinese people by the screams of this desperate clique in Peiping, which is being revealed more clearly every day as a group of irresponsible puppets sacrificing the blood and treasure of China for purposes which have nothing whatsoever to do with Chinese interests. The news from Korea was very bad. During the night, General MacArthur had asked permission to throw in ground forces. He had been authorized provisionally to throw in one regiment and had been told that he would receive further orders as soon as the matter could be discussed with the president. One more matter was discussed at this early morning conference, namely the question of our attitude in case, as seemed probable, a proposal were to be made in the United Nations for high-level four-power conferences. Bolin made the point that the danger involved in discussions with the Russians had always been previously that such discussions might have the effect of standing in the way of firm action on our part. Now that we had acted, there was no further danger in discussion, and we should show ourselves ready at all times to talk matters over. This was approved, and our position was determined accordingly. Chip and I were in agreement on what I had hoped I would have an opportunity to add in my statement to the Secretary, namely that as the conflict widened, it was absolutely essential that we take steps on mobilization here at home, which would put us in a position to stand the attrition of such a widening military situation in the Far East. July 1 the usual morning meeting was begun with a long intelligence briefing, which made it pretty evident that from now on the task was solely ours, the Korean army having pretty well collapsed, and that in view of weather prospects, the Air Force would not be able to develop anything like its maximum capabilities. I said that, in my opinion, the Russians had placed us over a barrel, in a position where, if we could not fulfill our mission in southern Korea with existing forces— and could not reinforce them without danger of depletion of our present small establishment, we had no alternative but to adopt measures of at least partial mobilization. I said that I could not judge whether the Russians were aware that this was the choice they were confronting us with, and wondered about this, for it did not seem to be in their interests to force us to improve our military posture. But I did wish to emphasize that we had to go through with our purpose in Korea, come what may and that if this called for more than we could afford now to give to the venture, we had no choice but to mobilize greater strength. I pointed out that if our commanders had been told toward the close of the recent war in the Pacific that all Japanese resistance would cease and the only task then was to cope with an army of 90,000 Koreans with 100 tanks and small air support and to occupy Korea to the 38th parallel, they would have considered it a small operation indeed. This, I said, was proof that our ability to cope with this situation was a question of our will and not of our capability. Following this meeting, the secretary suggested that he, Avril Harriman, Chip Bolin, and myself go out to Leesburg and talk to General Marshall. General George C. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff in World War II, would become Secretary of Defense in September 1950. 
A phone call was put through to the general, and it was arranged that we should come for lunch. We departed immediately and got out there soon after one o'clock. The general was in fine form. We sat on the lawn under the trees and had our business talk then and there over our events of the week and the position in which we found ourselves today. The general listened very attentively and silently, as he always does when a problem is being exposed before him, and then gave us his views vigorously and without hesitation. Pointing out that all of his statements were based on the very scanty information which the secretary had just been able to give him, and not on any detailed background of fact, he said that there could be no doubt about the proper course for us to pursue. We had begun this thing. Now we had to go through with it. His greatest worry had been that for the sake of Korea, we might have risked an alienation of public opinion in Western Europe, which was the area of the greatest real strategic importance. What we had told him had relieved his fears on this point, but he was deeply disturbed over what he understood to be the attitudes in the defense establishment, particularly with their relation to the Department of State. He did not feel that we needed to send more in the way of military support to MacArthur. It was a common failing of commanders in the field to ask for more than they needed, and MacArthur was far from being an exception to this rule. He should be told to do this job with what he had. He could do it if he applied himself to it. The depletion of the forces on Japan was not dangerous. Any amphibious action against Japan would be a great undertaking and a very risky one in the face of any sizable air and naval defense. He was particularly concerned about the initial tendency of the Air Force to think that they could do this all alone. That, he said, was the same old thing. The Air Force and the Navy were full of ideas about how they could do things, and their functions were indeed tremendously important. But when it came down to the last analysis, you could never get along without the little fellow in the mud. Also, he felt that our people had made a mistake in the organization of the Korean Army. He had begged them to organize it along the lines of the Philippine Scouts, using experienced, older American non-commissioned officers and filling up the ranks with Koreans. Instead, they had insisted on trying to build up a new army from scratch, officer corps and all. Nevertheless, he was not discouraged, and he felt that this might turn out to be a good thing in many ways. On the way back to Washington, we talked matters over and agreed that it was important that the general should have an opportunity to state his views to the president in the very near future. Mr. Harriman undertook to get in touch with the president and to make the suggestion. But we agreed that it would neither be fair to the general nor wise for any of us to try to relay the general's views to the president. July 3. Chip, who had worked over the weekend, told me that there had been some discussion of a desire on the part of the Air Force to send a large contingent of B-29s to the Korean theater, at the cost of a certain depletion of our reserve strength in these planes. He was worried lest this might reflect in part a preoccupation on the part of the Air Force with their own prestige and a desire to recoup for their failure up to this time to stop the North Korean army. If any such motives were present, he was afraid that the Air Force, once it had the planes out there, would want to roam farther and farther afield in their bombing activities and that this might lead to wider complications which we had not bargained for. He was much upset, and I think rightly so, because when I stated this view before a large meeting on Sunday, Averill Harriman had said that this reminded him of the wartime days when he and his advisers had discussed matters of this sort in Moscow, and that then, as now, there had always been timid voices which he had had to override. Chip was much worried about this, because he felt that it was essential to our usefulness that we should feel free to give our honest opinions in instances of this sort without their becoming the occasion of offensive interpretations. It seemed to him particularly unjust that such a reproach should come from Averill, and above all with a reference to the wartime days, for actually during the recent war the sides were usually just the reverse of that, and it had generally been Chip and I who had been obliged to argue with Averill for a firmer policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. He was also afraid that this signified the beginning of another unhealthy relationship between the State Department and the armed services, similar to that which had prevailed during the last war, a relationship in which the State Department had no say in the determination of policy and hesitated to state its views on policy matters for fear of being accused of obstructing the war effort. July 9. Chip told me about the Russian approach to the British for suggestions concerning the mediation of the Korean matter and of his anxieties, lest the British mess the thing up. 
Chip pointed out, quite correctly, I think, that Stalin, with his contempt for small peoples, must assume that the ultimate outcome of U.S. intervention will be a reversal of the military fortunes of the North Koreans, and that he is therefore holding open the possibilities of a settlement which would prevent the communist reverse from going too far. July 12. I said that I thought the most dangerous feature of this view was the assumption that what the Russians might do in the future was somehow without relation to the attitude we would take at this time. I had a long talk with Chip Bolin in the evening. Discussion hinged on the difficulties we had encountered in arriving at an agreed position within the government about probable future developments. In general, the nervousness and consciousness of responsibility is so great around Washington that it is impossible to get people to set their signatures to anything as risky and as little founded and demonstrable fact as an analysis of Soviet intentions based on the subjective experience and instinct and judgment of persons like Chip and myself. Plainly, the government has moved into an area where there is a reluctance to recognize the finer distinctions of the psychology of our adversaries, for the reason that movement in this sphere of speculation is all too undependable, too relative, and too subtle to be comfortable or tolerable to people who feel themselves confronted with the grim responsibility of recommending decisions which may mean war or peace. In such times, it is safer and easier to cease the attempt to analyze the probabilities involved in your enemy's mental processes or calculate his weaknesses. It seems safer to give him the benefit of every doubt in matters of strength and to credit him indiscriminately with all aggressive designs, even when some of them are mutually contradictory. In these circumstances, I was inclined to wonder, and I think Chip was too, whether the day had not passed when the government had use for the qualities of persons like ourselves, for the effort at cool and rational analysis and the unfirm substance of the imponderables, for an estimate of our Soviet adversaries based on their possible weaknesses as well as their possible strengths. In the somewhat childish and abusive atmosphere of a democratic society, already disbalanced by McCarthyism, there was use only for the cruder and the starker concepts. July 14. I have become slowly and reluctantly convinced of the necessity of accepting the analyses of our intelligence agencies, which tell us that Germany, the Low Countries, and France, at least, could not really be defended against the Soviet invasion. While I think this represents an oversimplified view, and rests quite possibly on an exaggerated picture of Soviet military strength, I cannot prove my position and I realize that our government has no choice but to operate on the basis of these analyses. But if this is the basis on which we are going to operate, then what is the use of pouring these arms into Western Europe? Surely the main deficiency on the Western side, and the decisive one, is the continued military prostration of Western Germany. If we are unprepared to remedy this deficiency, then what avail will be these military shipments to the secondary military powers of Western Europe? I have always approved of some military aid to Western Europe as a morale builder and a symbol of U.S. support. But to pull great quantities in there is another thing. If there are serious initial Soviet successes, as we are obliged to expect there will be in Germany, then France will probably go by default. And all of the successes of the United States in the Russian front will be put under a shock for its capture. Possibly this is too gloomy a view, but I hope it is. It is the only one warranted to date by the state of French public opinion we have observed. The jitteriness, the readiness to assume independence on others, and the tendency to blame everyone but themselves for their situation. July 17. Nitza dropped in to see me, very tired, harried, and worried. The effort to chart out a tentative set of ideas for our reactions to other possible Soviet moves had bogged down completely in the NSC. National Security Council. The military would not cooperate by sending anyone of real authority to participate in the discussions. We were still stuck on the analysis of the situation, and have not even gotten to the question of the possible courses of action. And the State Department itself had as yet done no adequate preparatory work on this latter subject. The initial work along these lines ought, he considered, to be done jointly with the responsible military planners, but there was no forum for it. All this, I thought, was nothing other than the failure of the President to assign clear lines of individual responsibility and authority. 
leaving the key portions of the executive apparatus to wallow around in the subtle impediment of the committee system. I found on my desk this morning an intelligence estimate about the military situation of Formosa, which disturbed me considerably. I feared that we were failing to take sufficiently seriously the threat to the island, or relying too much on the Chinese forces on the island, and relying on ambiguities to exist with respect to the question of military reconnaissance. I therefore drafted a memo urging the department to do three things. To wit, one, make sure that the defense establishment was fully aware of the seriousness of the danger of a successful communist move against Formosa. B. Make sure that they understood that the Chinese troops on the island would be quite unreliable in the event that any communist forces at all were to succeed in landing there, and that we were therefore entirely on our own in this business. And C. Make sure that there were no misunderstandings between the defense establishment and ourselves about questions of reconnaissance along the Chinese coast with a view to spotting preparations for an invasion attempt. As far as I can see, it makes not the slightest difference whether or not the Chinese communists come into the UN, and the fact that they might come in would be no reason, in my opinion, why we should feel obliged to have diplomatic relations with them. I hate to see what seems to me a minor issue on which we should never have allowed ourselves to get hooked become something which the Russians can use to our disadvantage in the Korean affair. I was shouted down on this. Mr. Dulles pointed out that if we were to do this, it would look as though we were retreating on the Chinese communist issue in the belief that we were thereby buying some Russian concessions about Korea. John Foster Dulles was the Republican expert on foreign policy who had become Secretary of State under President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Secretary Dulles would humiliate Kennan, who still had some time before retirement. Dulles not only neglected to appoint Kennan to a new position, he also neglected to inform him of that decision. That this would not be the case, and that the Russians would still not agree to anything satisfactory about Korea, and that it would therefore look to our public as though we had been tricked into giving up something for nothing. I recognized the force of this and realized that nothing can be done. But I hope that someday history will record this as an instance of the damage done to the conduct of our foreign policy by the irresponsible and bigoted interference of the Chinese lobby and its friends in Congress. Had a long talk with John Foster Dulles this afternoon. He was preparing a memorandum urging that we give immediate attention to the rearmament of Germany and Japan. I pointed out to him what I felt to be the significance of police forces as a means of bridging the gap between our need for creating strength in those quarters on the one hand and the fears of our allies on the other. July 20. Another matter which I raised at the Secretary's meeting this morning was the question of our policy toward Germany at this time. I pointed out that to the extent that we were forced to occupy ourselves militarily in other areas, the amount of energy and resources which we could devote to the problems of occupation in Germany and Japan might at any time be significantly reduced. I said I thought we should not rule out the possibility of a situation in which there would still be no invasion of Germany, and yet we would be forced to reduce our occupational and directive effort. This was already happening in Japan. For this reason, I thought it urgently important to move ahead rapidly with putting the German and Japanese regimes on a fully independent footing, able to carry on successfully without us. On July 15, General MacArthur launched a daring and stunningly successful amphibious landing at Incheon, behind North Korean lines. With the fortunes of war suddenly reversed, MacArthur began driving north of the 38th parallel into North Korea. In this next entry, Kennan predicted the disaster that would befall U.S. and South Korean forces in November-December. The Communist Chinese, alarmed at the Americans advancing through North Korea up to their border, intervened with a huge number of troops. The resulting debacle was one of the worst in U.S. military history. July 21. We must remember that what we were doing in Korea was, although for good political reason, nevertheless an unsound thing and that the further we were to advance up the peninsula, the more unsound it would become from the military standpoint. If we were actually to advance beyond the neck of the peninsula, we would be getting into an area where mass could be used against us, and where we would be distinctly at a disadvantage. This, I thought, increased the importance of a clear concept of our being able to terminate our action at the proper point, 
and it was desirable that we should make sure that we did not frighten the Russians into action which would interfere with this. July 24. I had a long session with two officials of the department on the subject of the propaganda lines, which we should follow in the event that we should find ourselves in a state of general hostilities with Russia. I urged that our propaganda effort be rigidly divided into that which was addressed to peoples under enemy control and that addressed to peoples elsewhere. As far as those people behind the Iron Curtain were concerned, it was my proposal that we should treat them from the beginning on the assumption that they were allied with us in our struggle against the political power under which they lived. Proceeding on this assumption, I urged that we make our broadcasts to them as businesslike and concise as possible, and addressed strictly to the requirements of their own situation. Since radio listening and attention to other media of our propaganda would always be dangerous for them, I proposed that we exclude all extraneous material, in order that the risk to them from receiving our propaganda might be reduced to a minimum. I argued that we did not need to convince them of the iniquity of the Soviet powers, that they knew much more about that than we did. We also did not need to waste breath trying to persuade them of our own virtues as a nation. They would be less concerned about all that than about the question whether we were going to liberate them or whether we were going to fail to liberate them. The main point to be emphasized with respect to the war was the inevitability of defeat and disaster for Soviet power. We would do well, I thought, to show at all times a solicitude for the safety of our listeners. We should therefore tell them at the start that they should not listen unnecessarily, i.e. that they should divide this labor with others if they were confident that they could trust them, and that they should be careful not to provoke their own authorities prematurely, but should take very good care to register in their memories the names and faces of all those acting as agents for Soviet power, so that there would be no confusion when the day finally came. With respect to the countries outside the Soviet sphere, I pleaded for a differentiated approach. There was no use, I thought, in talking about freedom and human rights to people who had never known either. Again, I urged a soft peddling of propaganda about our own virtues, with the one exception of the element of strength. I felt it much more important to convince others that we were strong than to convince others that we were right or idealistic or virtuous. July 25. This afternoon I received a phone call from Hamilton Fish Armstrong, Armstrong was editor of Foreign Affairs, who spoke along the following lines. In the X article, published three years ago, I had set out the policy of containment. It had been followed only in Europe. The significance of the Korean affair was that we were now beginning to follow it in Asia as well. He was calling to ask me to write a second article, this time under my own name, spelling out what this policy meant in terms of Asia. How are we to capture the offensive in that continent? How are we to get around the dilemma of the support of discreditable and reactionary leaders? What were the lessons of our China policy in this respect? How could we exploit the forces of nationalism for the purposes of the free world, rather than permitting them to be exploited by the communists? What should be the boundaries of our line of containment? How tightly should they be drawn? What was the range of the effectiveness of sea power and air power as projected into the Asiatic landmass? I made no effort to give him any answer to these suggestions on the spot, but arranged to see him when I go up to New York in a week or two, thinking that I would give him my answer then. In the evening I dined at the Canadian Embassy. Franks made it evident that their great objection to our China policy lay in our commitment to Chiang Kai-shek, which they viewed as something forcing the Chinese communists into the arms of the Russians. British Ambassador Oliver Franks I pointed out to him that Formosa could not be regarded only as a part of the Chinese problem, but must be regarded as part of the whole Far Eastern picture, and that whoever said Formosa must go to the communists to facilitate the emergence of an independent Chinese communist policy vis-a-vis -vis Moscow was really saying that all of the Far East and the Western Pacific, including possibly Japan, must be abandoned to communism if necessary for the same purpose. Franks said that the British people took a longer view of these things, that their calculations were fixed rather on what the situation would be in the year 2000, and that in the stolid advance toward such long-term objectives, they were prepared to take in their stride whatever trials or reverses might come. He thought that in the long run, China was more important than Japan and ought to be given priority in our thinking. 
This, I said, terrified me, because China was an entity which would never, in my opinion, be dependable from the standpoint of Western interests. Japan, on the other hand, might conceivably be made so. Chip and I were partly amazed and partly amused to hear Avril Harriman, when I spoke about the McCarthy business, say, You fellows in the State Department had to learn the necessity of coming clean with the public about your own mistakes, that you could not go on putting out white papers as you did in the case of China, whitewashing the mistakes you had made. You would have to establish a completely frank relation with the public and not pretend that you had always been right, etc. Neither of us accepted the challenge, for we saw no point in arguing the question of responsibility for China policy, but both of us at once reflected on the fact that the State Department had had no knowledge whatsoever of the Yalta Agreement at the time it was concluded, that the Department remained ignorant of the nature of it for a long time after that, that Avril had been one of the President's advisors at Yalta, and that while the Yalta Conference was going on, the Acting Secretary of State, in his innocence, had been wiring the American Embassy at Chongqing, warning them to avoid by all means anything that smacked of efforts on our part to mediate between the Russians and the Chinese. Chongqing was the wartime capital of nationalist China. July 28. In all the discussions of the morning, I found myself for the most part in a lonely position of single opposition to the views of my associates. The main point at issue is the recognition of the Chinese communists in the United Nations. I can see, myself, no fundamental objection from the standpoint of U.S. interest to the seating of the Chinese communists, provided we still wish to cling to the principle that the U.N. is a universal organization and can eventually be of some use in the adjusting of relationships between East and West by means other than a major war. The seating of the Chinese communists would, in my opinion, constitute no new reality of any great significance. Our insistence on the retention of the Security Council seat by the Chinese nationalists was a source of confusion and unclarity in Asia. Our motives were being widely misinterpreted, and it was being alleged that our purposes were governed by ulterior and imperialistic motives. This view was rejected by Bolin and Dulles, primarily on the ground that it would confuse American public opinion and weaken support for the President's program looking toward the strengthening of our defenses, and this view was eventually upheld by the Secretary. I said that I could very well understand this, but that I shuddered over the implications of it, for it implied that we could not adopt an adequate defense position without working our people up into an emotional state, and that this emotional state, rather than a cool and unemotional appraisal of national interest, would then have to be the determinant of our action. The position we were taking seemed to me to imply acceptance of the theory that in the last analysis the UN would not be universal, but would be an Article 51 alliance against Russia. It seemed further to imply that the basis of our policy in the Far East, from here on out, would be an emotional anti-communism, which would ignore the value to ourselves of a possible balance between the existing forces on the Asiatic continent, would force everyone to declare himself either for us, including Chiang Kai-shek, or against us, that this would break the unity not only of the non-communist countries in Asia, but also of the non-communist community in general, and would be beyond our military capacity to support. It rested, I said, on the encouragement in the minds of our people of a false belief that we were a strong power in Asia, whereas we are in reality a weak one. Only the very strong can take high and mighty moral positions and ignore the possibilities of balance among the opposing forces. The weak must accept realities and exploit those realities to their advantage as best they can. With Bolin and Dulles, as I say, the objections were laid to public opinion. With Rusk and some of the others, I think there was a real sense of moral indignation about the Chinese communists. These people, after all, are treading now the paths which we old Russian hands were treading over twenty years ago in our first experiences with the Soviet dictatorship. We were not unaware then, and we are not unaware now, of the fundamental ethical conflict between their ideals and ours, but we view the handling of our end in this conflict as a practical matter, similar to many other matters with which diplomacy has had to deal through the course of the centuries. We have learned not to recoil from the struggle for power as something shocking or abnormal. It is the medium in which we work, as the doctor works in the medium of human flesh. 
and we will not improve our performance by failing to deal with its real nature or by trying to dress it up as something else. In our own consciences, in our own concept, that is, of our obligations to ourselves, we Americans may be profoundly aware that we are right. In our participation on the international scene, we are only one of the contenders for the privilege of leading a national existence on a portion of the territory of this world on reasonably favorable terms. Other people are our enemies, and we must deal with them accordingly. But let us recognize the legitimacy of differences of interest and philosophy between groups of men and not pretend that they can be made to disappear behind some common philosophical concept. July 31. Secretary Acheson said that he wished me to make it my function to keep abreast of all information bearing on Soviet attitudes and views and to be able at any time to give the others an estimate of probable Soviet reactions to any moves we might make. This constitutes a much more direct responsibility than I have heretofore had in connection with the handling of the Korean matter and will make it necessary for me to give much more in the way of hour-to-hour -hour attention to developments in the military and diplomatic fields. Following the secretary's meeting, a member of the planning staff dropped in to tell me that he had learned from one journalist, who had learned it from another journalist, that Mr. Dulles had said to journalist number two that while he used to think highly of George Kennan, he had now concluded that he was a very dangerous man, that he was advocating the admission of the Chinese communists to the United Nations and a cessation of U.S. military action at the 38th parallel. August 1. In the afternoon, I watched by television the session of the Security Council, which has been awaited with such tense anticipation. The flickering screen gave me a headache and hurt my eyes, and I wondered how children could possibly be permitted to sit for hours every day staring into these squawking boxes. August 4. Was somewhat annoyed at a suggestion made by Dean Rusk in my absence Thursday morning, to the effect that it might be desirable to get three prominent outsiders in to examine the material which had accumulated with respect to Soviet intentions in order to get a fresh judgment as to whether the Russians were planning war. It seemed to me that the only concept which could underlie such thinking was that the most valuable views on this subject were to be obtained from people who knew the least about it. If this were accepted, I reflected, perhaps after I had been out of the department long enough to forget a very great portion of what I now know— I might be accepted more cheerfully around here as a pundit on questions under discussion. August 14. The Republican members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee today published a joint statement attacking the foreign policy of the Democratic administration with relation to the Far East. Never before has there been such utter confusion in the public mind with respect to U.S. foreign policy. The President doesn't understand it. Congress doesn't understand it. Nor does the public. Nor does the press. They all wander around in a labyrinth of ignorance and error and conjecture, in which truth is intermingled with fiction at a hundred points, in which unjustified assumptions have attained the validity of premises, and in which there is no recognized and authoritative theory to hold on to. Only the diplomatic historian, it seems to me, working from the leisure and detachment of a later day, will be able to unravel this incredible tangle and reveal the true aspect of the various factors and issues involved. And that is why, as it seems to me, no one in my position can contribute very much more to an understanding of U.S. foreign policy unless he first turns historian, earns public confidence and respect on the study of an earlier day, and then gradually carries the public up to a clear and comprehensible view of the occurrences of these recent years. August 22. Held a press conference this afternoon in connection with my departure from the department. In reply to a question about how we can achieve our objectives without a major war, first, while being adequately prepared for every eventuality, we should never make the mistake of regarding war as inevitable and of underestimating the chances for peace. Second, we have to maintain an adequate defense posture for ourselves, if necessary, over a long period of time. Third, we should give our friends the impression that we are determined people, reliable allies, but that their interest is as strong as ours in the achievement of a more stable and happier world. We must not give them the impression that we have some sort of selfish or ulterior interest in the maintenance of their independence and the maintenance of a firm international attitude in the face of Bolshevik pressures. Fourth, we must keep our flag flying high here at home, 
to demonstrate that we are making a success of our own national life, that we are getting on with our problems and see to it that other people understand what those successes mean. I think that is about all you can do. The main thing I would add is that we should demonstrate that we have the courage of our convictions and that we have confidence in ourselves here in this country. Beyond that, the only thing I would recommend is that we be very careful now that we are entering an area where political and military considerations are closely intermingled, to avoid hasty and emotional judgments, to deal with our problems coolly and carefully, realizing that we are now really for the first time as a nation facing the test of maturity and of world leadership. In reply to a question about why I believe Russia does not want a major war, I said that I thought I could not expand on what was included in the X article and in the Reader's Digest article. I said that I still believed that the actions of the Kremlin, which have caused such great concern to people elsewhere in the world and have led to the troubles we have today, are ones which are based on a deep misestimation on their part of the nature of the world around them and a tragic failure to realize that international progress can never be made on the basis of hostility and hatred and antagonism and can be achieved only by freedom of association among peoples and the principle of live and let live. Was invited this evening to join in a discussion between some of the officials of the department and for senators about our information program and about the proposals that have been made for some staggering increases in the American informational effort. The main audience to which our broadcasts should now be addressed is the audience which actually does most of the listening, namely the privileged and influential members of the ruling group itself. In approaching these people, we need no claims to virtue on our part. There is no point in trying to gain their sympathies. They are hard-boiled creatures with blood on their hands and not, for the most part, people we want to make friends with. Our approach to them should be designed primarily to sow doubts and hesitations and suspicions in their minds about the path of crime on which they are embarked. We must somehow or other insert in their minds the wicked demon of doubt about the wisdom of their leaders, the soundness of their cause, the loyalty of their comrades and superiors, and the prospects of victory. This is dirty business, admittedly, this is political warfare, and no warfare is pleasant. If we want to broadcast to Russia effectively, this is the sort of thing we have to go in for. August 23. Two years ago, when the North Atlantic Treaty was being negotiated, I had written a formal staff paper opposing the admission into a North Atlantic security pact of any single country beyond the North Atlantic area. This had particular reference to Italy. I had stated in that paper that if Italy were admitted, this would constitute a precedent and would almost certainly lead to a series of demands from states still further afield that they be similarly treated. Failure on our part to satisfy these further demands I had written at that time would then be interpreted as lack of interest in the respective countries and as evidence that we had written them off to the Russians. We now had to recognize that having solicited and accepted the Turkish offer of ground forces for the action in Korea, we were, to all intents and purposes, in an alliance with Turkey and under an obligation to assist her in the event she were attacked, an obligation far more solemn and serious than any treaty clause. I could not see what the Turks possibly could stand to gain by being brought into the Atlantic Pact. Princeton, September 10. My first day at the Institute for Advanced Study, I installed myself in my new office with windows looking out over the fields to the woods and had a sense of peace and happiness such as I have not had for a long, long time. December On Friday morning, December 1, Bolin phoned me from Paris. There was no indication that anyone with a deep understanding of Russian reactions was involved at this time in the formulation of our policy. As U.S. troops neared the Chinese border, Communist Chinese leader Mao Zedong ordered his forces to intervene. Suddenly overwhelmed, the Americans reeled southward in retreat. The Truman administration was near panic. He said, I am calling to implore you to go down to Washington and insist on seeing General Marshall, who I know has a high regard for your views, and the Secretary, to try to impress upon them the real considerations which undoubtedly underlie the Russian and Chinese reactions and on which you and I have been consistently in agreement. 
on Saturday afternoon, I received a call from John Davies saying that the secretary wanted me to come and that he had been authorized by Paul Nitza to tell me that. I therefore took the next train to Washington. This was the first time that I had been called upon by the secretary since I left the department in September. I had been in Washington for one day of consultation with subordinate officials in October, but the subject of discussion at that time was only the general considerations involved in the problem of negotiation with the Russians and had no relation to the specific problems of our Korean or general Far Eastern policies. I came to the Department of State at 10 a.m. Sunday morning, December 3, and reported for duty. I joined Mr. Webb and three or four other people for the usual briefing on the battlefield situation in Korea, which was not too revealing. Afterward, Webb talked to me, first in the presence of two or three others, and then alone. He was obviously in a state of considerable agitation. He said that the military leaders felt that a complete withdrawal from Korea was the only alternative to the loss of what was practically our entire ground establishment. They thought that we had perhaps 36 hours for a decision as to an orderly withdrawal. If that decision were not made, the result might be complete disaster and effective loss of the entire force. He said that discussions were in progress concerning the attitude which we should adopt in the United Nations and in the conversations with Attlee, who was expected to arrive the following morning. No course would be decided until we had talked with the British. One of the variants which would be discussed with the British would be a direct approach to the Russians with a view to bringing about a ceasefire in Korea. What they wanted from me, he said, was a view as to the prospects of negotiation with the Russians on this problem at this time. As he left the office, the secretary asked whether I would like to come home with him for supper. I said that I had another engagement at nine, but that I would be glad to come if he did not mind me leaving by that time. Accordingly, we went to his home. The servants had been excused, and the secretary, Mrs. Atchison, and myself had a light supper, which Mrs. Atchison prepared. Before and during supper, the secretary spoke at some length about his problems. Beginning by pointing to a new portrait of himself, which was in the living room, he said that the artist had expressed himself as impressed with Mr. Atchison's imperviousness to the crescendo of attacks which were being made upon him at the time the portrait was being painted, and had tried in the painting to emphasize what he felt to be that aspect of his character. The secretary told this about himself in a humorous vein and ironically, but there was no question how deeply he felt about this matter. He then went on to speak of the strangeness of his position and the fact that at times he felt that he seemed to be the only person in Washington who fully understood the seriousness of the situation in which we found ourselves. On arriving at the office Monday morning, December 4, I sat down and wrote out by hand the following note to the secretary. On the official level, I have been asked to give advice only on the particular problem of Soviet reaction to various possible approaches. But there is one thing I should like to say in continuation of our discussion of yesterday evening. In international, as in private life, what counts most is not really what happens to someone, but how he bears what happens to him. For this reason, almost everything depends from here on out on the manner in which we Americans bear what is unquestionably a major failure and disaster to our national fortunes. If we accept it with candor and dignity, with a resolve to absorb its lessons and to make it good by a redoubled and determined effort, starting all over again, if necessary, along the pattern of Pearl Harbor, we need lose neither our self-confidence, nor our allies, nor our power for bargaining, eventually, with the Russians. But if we try to conceal from our own people, or from our allies, the full measure of our misfortune, or permit ourselves to seek relief in any reactions of bluster, or petulance, or hysteria, we can easily find this crisis resolving itself into an irreparable deterioration of our world position, and of our confidence in ourselves. The Russians had never seen the United Nations' connection with the Korean affair as anything other than a screen for action carried out by this country in its own national interest. Looking at it this way, they were prepared to accept the fact that we could claim some strategic interest in South Korea on the basis of our responsibilities in Japan, but they could not see how we could claim a strategic interest greater than that of the Chinese communists and themselves on the Yalu River frontier. The Yalu River marked the border between North Korea and China. What they were saying, in effect, was, you had your chance to settle this business at a reasonable point. You did not do it. What possible motive could you have had for going further, 
unless it was a thought of making war on communist China. I suggested to the secretary that he might, if he agreed with them, read aloud the main passages of the note which I had written to him this morning, and which I presented to him at that point. This he did, and I had the impression that the thought expressed in them was generally appreciated. I gathered that the secretary proposed to bring the passages to the attention of the president, and Matthews suggested that I might draft something along these lines, perhaps using the identical language as an opening passage for the president's speech later this week. Rusk then introduced the question as to whether we were really obliged to abandon Korea altogether, and whether it might not be a good thing for us to attempt to hold some sort of a beachhead, particularly in the light of what I had said about negotiations with the Russians. I took occasion to reinforce the point he had raised. I was afraid, I said, that perhaps our military leaders were not sufficiently aware of how similar our position had become to that occupied by the British for a long period in the past, and of how necessary it was for us, on occasion, to hold stubbornly on the basis of sheer political instinct to positions which military logic might declare to be useless. One could never know about these things. I recalled the battles in North Africa during the recent war, and the drastic and repeated changes in military fortune which carried the front hundreds of miles back and forth along the North African littoral. Had the British not stubbornly clung to a position just short of Cairo, in the face of discouraging odds, they would never have won their final victory. If we could prove, I said, that we could hold some sort of a line or a beachhead in central or southern Korea, which would pin down a large number of enemy forces, I was not sure that the prospect of continuing such a contest in the face of air attacks on their lines of communications would prove attractive to the enemy. The secretary indicated that he was impressed with these points. The meeting broke up at that point, but shortly afterward I received a telephone call asking me to go to the Pentagon, together with Rusk and Matthews, to talk to General Marshall along these lines. The general recalled his experiences in the past, in the case of Batan and Corregidor, and cited this as an example of the virtue of hanging on doggedly for reasons of prestige and morale. Upon our return to the Department of State, we lunched with the secretary in his office. He said that the president had had no patience with the suggestions that we resolve to abandon Korea, and had felt that we should stay and fight as long as possible. Chapter 6 Princeton and Oxford, 1951 through 1960. 1951. The year 1951 was a turbulent one for Kennan. In April, during the very days when he was at the University of Chicago delivering the Walgreen Lectures, later published as American Diplomacy, his most widely read book, he agonized over the fallout from an apparent affair or flirtation. He was appalled at the growth of McCarthyite hysteria and feared that the nation would blunder into World War III. Though he played a key role in initiating talks that would eventually lead to an armistice in Korea and was invited to become ambassador to the Soviet Union, he felt increasingly uncertain about his purpose in life. A visit to Southern California underscored Kennan's view of American society as childish and abusive of the natural environment. Princeton, April 2. The following notes are thought of as an aid to a process of spiritual self-discipline and reformation. They are designed to help me combat forgetfulness and fluctuations of attitude, to stand as a reproach to inconsistency, to guard against escape into extremes and unreality. They are to stand as the record and reminder of an inner life which, I can only hope, will stand recording. I know of only one prayer I can make that would seem to have any reasonable and satisfactory foundation. It would be that by every bit of discomfort and effort and hardship I may lay upon myself in this effort at self-strengthening, something might be lifted from the pain I might otherwise bring to others. If I might be permitted to expiate in this way something of the damage I have done, perhaps then something might properly and rightly be deducted from the fullness and disastrousness of eventual revelation. If there were not this hope, the situation would indeed be desperate. I should find it hard, even if fortune favored me, to adjust to the consciousness of the jeopardy in which I have placed the happiness of other people. And not being sure that the blow would not still fall, I would continue to feel myself half a murderer. 
to have horror of myself and to place limitations in my own mind on my ability to be useful to anyone else in any personal intimacy. I am like a person who has placed poison in one of two glasses before a person he loves and looks back upon his act with horror and incredulity, but still does not know from which glass the person will drink. I must remember that it is bad for me to look too far ahead. This will be a long process. I must let the victories of one day be enough, and if they come hard to me, and if it seems improbable that I should ever win in the long run, then I must be sure, nevertheless, that I win for today. And I must say to myself, tomorrow it will be easier. If the evil day should come, this is a question, must I not be strong enough not to let it crush me entirely? Must I not say, in one tremendous field of life, the one in which failure was personally most horrible and painful, I have failed. In others I have proven to have usefulness. I will stand outside of myself and, loathing one part of me, nevertheless talk quietly and sensibly and with respect about the rest. April 3 When walking alone, I noticed that when I was forgetful of my problems and limitations, I walked faster. When I bethought myself of them, my pace slackened and I began to walk more like an old man. Someone else, an impartial observer, a doctor, let us say, would be inclined to conclude that forgetfulness was good, awareness bad. And he would be wrong. For me, it is right and necessary that I should become much older in a short space of time. In general, it seems to me, the training of the spirit is most difficult on normal, practical workdays, when the concrete details of life demand attention of a semi-routine sort, and particularly in offices and other places of work, where people wear their professional personalities like uniforms. Then, if ever, habit and forgetfulness are at their strongest. I am somewhat bewildered by the reflection that I have a guilt complex vis-a-vis -vis my family in dozens of small matters that make no real difference. How ironic this is. I must teach myself to have nothing to conceal but that which is really worth concealing. On Saturday evening I leave for two weeks of lecturing in Chicago. I will look upon this as an exercise. I shall live in a hotel on the South Shore. I have left myself plenty of time between lectures and have asked that extraneous social engagements be ruled out. Here there will be all the things that are difficult for me. A strange city, a hotel, solitude, boredom, strange women, the sense of time fleeting, of time being wasted, of a life pulsating around me, a life unknown, untested, full of mystery and yet not touched by myself. Let us see whether I can preserve deliberateness, thoughtfulness, awareness of all that is involved, patience, forbearance. Let us see whether, if I can stand the first day, the next will not be easier. It will be a real test, an opportunity for a real triumph. No, that is an exaggeration. There are no triumphs, only an opportunity to inch a tiny bit along the road. April 4. Woke up with a dream so appalling that had I taken it seriously, I should have had to say to myself, here is something that must undo all that you are attempting. Then, in thinking about it, it dawned on me that the subconscious mind, like the workings of history, is often years out of date in its causality. Even were I to bow before the suggestions that the dream contained, were I to say to the subconscious, You are right, you are unanswerable, I will cut all the faithful knots and follow you, none of it would work out. Ten years ago, it would have not today. How dangerous a guide in later age is then that which is most powerful, or nearly the most powerful, for that remains to be seen, within us. Except insofar as you may have work to do for which certain minimum services from the body are required, what happens to the body is of little importance when you have passed the age of forty-five. The best you can do with it is to keep it as tidy as possible, Limit as well as you can the evidences of its increasing stagnation and obsolescence, and try to see that the light that still shines from it through the eyes does not partake of its sordidness and its obvious decline. 
Beyond that, the vicissitudes and dangers to which it is exposed should not be permitted to trouble you. April 5. These last two days have been bad days, tired, unwell, strained. I have dragged myself around, too ill to be at my best, not ill enough and too busy to stop. The time wasted? No. I have written one whole lecture, rewritten another, talked to a student, talked to Earl, lunched with Oppenheimer, and done a dozen necessary and unavoidable little things. Edward Mead Earl, a specialist on the role of the military in foreign relations, was on the faculty of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, where Kennan was a visiting scholar. But how does one hold to an inner life when trivia and the body take over to this extent? The answer, I suppose, is that one tries all the harder, forces oneself to be composed and to look, even though it may be as through a mist, for the more important realities one ought to bear in mind, and hopes, again, that if one can gain something or even hold one's own today, tomorrow it will be easier. This morning I had another unpleasant dream on the subject of concealment. Unquestionably, there is an abnormality here, a dread of being found out. This can probably be repaired only by making my life such that there is genuinely nothing to conceal, and that means making it such that it will no longer, in a sense, be my life at all, but a certain amount of personal activity dedicated entirely to outside purposes. April 6. I have never been any good at training children or dogs. That is why I am no good at training myself. Chicago, April 8. I went into a drugstore, thinking that, having had no lunch, I ought to get something to eat. The soda fountain counter was wet and dirty. There was no one serving. There was a man pushing the litter off the floor with a wide push broom. I waited until his little heap of paper cups, cellophane wrappers, and cigarette butts had passed under my feet. Then I gave up the idea of eating and went back to the hotel. On the way, I thought of the things I had seen and of the Chicago Tribune I had been reading in my room. It had had an article on communism at Harvard, among other things, which I wanted to clip and send to Grace. Kennan's daughter was a student at Radcliffe College. I also reflected that my grandfather and my mother had come from this town. I heard some boys on bicycles screaming at each other across the street and realized that even the language was unfamiliar to me. So I shuffled along back to the hotel, in the depression born of hunger, plus an overpowering sense of lack of confidence in my surroundings. The small inward voice said gleefully and melodramatically, You have despaired of yourself, now despair of your country. I knew that the challenge, however melodramatic, was not unfair, and that this, too, I would have to learn to bear in my wanderings in the nether regions. April 9. Lay down in my room to rest for the lecture. When I try, as I did then, to bring the spirit to a state of complete repose, shutting out all effort and all seeking, I became aware of the remnants of anxieties and desires still surging and thrashing around, like waves in a swimming pool when the last swimmer has left. And I realize in what a turmoil the pool of the soul usually is, and how long it must lie untroubled before the surface becomes calm and one can see to the bottom. The papers today were full of MacArthur and Truman, and I was full of premonitions of trouble. General Douglas MacArthur, commander of U.S. and U.N. forces in Korea, was challenging President Truman's insistence on keeping the conflict in Korea a limited war. On April 11, Truman relieved MacArthur of his post. Though the president was at first loudly criticized by the public, opinion turned when top generals testified that it was indeed dangerous to expand the war. It seemed to me that we were like a crowd of drunken men on a raft, squabbling and gabbing while we drifted down to the brink of the falls. Soon, I thought, we must all go to war, and how desolate war really is. And with these thoughts in my head, I was struck to encounter in Churchill's gathering storm the following couplet from Sassoon. Siegfried Sassoon was a British poet whose work captured the initial romanticism and subsequent disillusionment of the generation fighting in World War I. 
shoulder to aching shoulder, side by side, they trudged away from life's broad wields of light. Princeton, April 15. I have not written for several days, taken with forgetfulness about personal problems, which became unreal with distance and preoccupation, but also overwhelmed with public ones, flowing from the experience of being in Chicago through this time of the dismissal of MacArthur, and perforce aware of local reactions to it. These impressions, combined with general impressions of Chicago, have left me with some extraordinary appreciations. For the first time in my life, I have become conscious of the existence of powerful forces in the country to which, if they are successful, no democratic adjustment can be made. People, in other words, to whom there is no reasonable approach, to whom the traditions of tolerance and civil liberty are of no real importance, people who have to be regarded as totalitarian enemies. I have to recognize that these people have already become dominant in the part of the country from which I came, that I have lost out here, as have all moderate and reasonable people who try to see both sides, that my homeland has turned against me. It's not, in fact, the same place in the human sense that it was when I was a boy, but rather only the same battered stage on which, for the most part, new sets have been erected and non-actors who do not understand me and tolerate me only because they are unaware that I would dare to disagree with them, play their parts. I am now, in the truest sense of the word, an expatriate. As an individual, my game is up in this part of the world. I am glad I did not go to Milwaukee. I hope never to go there again until McCarthyism has burned itself out there and people are thoroughly ashamed of it. But such a time is not likely to come, it seems to me, for people rarely repent of their political follies and hysterics. They merely exchange them for other ones and persuade themselves that they were right all along. It would be a miracle if, with this combination of personal and public problems, anything remained for me personally in life. Let me recognize that I live at one of those times when it is not given to men to live out quietly the golden days in harmony with nature and at peace with society. This will be a time for leadership or for martyrdom or for both. I may as well prepare myself for it. April 17. In private life, I have come up against fairly formidable barriers. They seemed to me surmountable only with a big degree of dedication to something outside myself. Now I have to face the fact that public life is equally closed. At one time I was an actor in the conduct of foreign policy. I became convinced that I was accomplishing nothing in that capacity, that the problems were deeper, that the answer lay in a direct approach to the public, and in an effort to explain to the public what it was really about. Today even that seems futile. Myths and errors are being established in the public mind more rapidly than they can be broken down. The mass media are too much for us. There is nothing that can be done about it. To correct this, you would have to educate the educators. I must say that I have lost all confidence in the freedom of the mass media. The fact of the matter is that in this country McCarthyism has already won, in the sense of making impossible the conduct of an intelligent foreign policy. The result is that there is no place in public life for an honest and moderate man. I should not be speaking out here in Chicago. It will do no good, any of it. I must stop this public speaking, this writing for publication. But what can I do? Well, consistency is a virtue by itself. I can finish what I have set out to do, the actual intellectual work at Princeton, insofar as time is available. We must assume that war will break out within two years. Our people have no control over the situation, and they will become more erratic as their frustrations increase. Except for the little boy, the best thing that could happen would be that I should go with the services and get myself killed. The Kennan's third child, Christopher, was born in 1949. Farming, otherwise, is the only real outlet and salvation. It is to that that I must steer the course, with a view to taking it up as soon as the pension is earned, or forfeited, for the latter seems more likely. That at least gives a goal, and something to work toward. Meanwhile, the work at Princeton must be finished for consistency's sake. But we'll see Joni through school, and provide the best time for a change. With the fighting in Korea stalemated, 
Secretary of State Dean Acheson asked Kennan to try to open a back channel of communication with the Soviet ambassador to the UN, Jakob Malik. In keeping with his training as a diplomat, Kennan made a detailed record of his conversations and actions. He kept copies of the letters and memoranda he sent and received, and included the most important records in his diary. In the original version of the first memorandum, in the next entry, Kennan had, for security reasons, identified the players only by a letter, such as O. In February 1968, he added a code to identify individuals by name. May through June On Friday, May 18, having been called to Washington by P. H. Freeman Matthews, I talked with O., Secretary Acheson, who asked me whether I would be willing to undertake the project in question, and I told him that I would. It was agreed that arrangements would have to be made by a U.S. official in New York, and that I should see him when I was up there the following week. On Monday, May 21, I talked at length with that official in New York. It was agreed that he would seek an opportunity to communicate again with X, Ambassador Malik, and to suggest that it might be both useful and interesting for him to talk with me. He was to give X, Ambassador Malik, an opportunity to think it over and was to offer to arrange the meeting. On Tuesday, May 22, I found O, Secretary Acheson, and told him that I had started the ball rolling. I suggested to him that he and a tiny circle of his associates sit down immediately and arrive at some clarification to be communicated to me of the areas which might profitably be explored and those areas which it would be better not to have explored at all. I explained that I would be speaking solely as an individual and without commitment of anyone else, but that it was nevertheless obviously desirable that I know what things it would be wise to talk about and what things had better not be discussed. He said that they were planning to do this. I said that I thought that someone, probably F, F was not identified in the code Kennan supplied in 1968, ought to be kept in a state of readiness to come to see me in Princeton at any time to bring me this information. I said that I would want him also to be able to brief me on everything that I should know involving things happening elsewhere, such as the Paris discussions or the Japanese peace treaty discussions, which might have a bearing on the subject at hand. I was sure that X, Ambassador Malik, if he consented to talk to me, would be thoroughly briefed on these matters, and I thought I should be too. May 26. Dear Mr. Zarapkin, Semyon K. Zarapkin was the Soviet's deputy representative at the UN. You will remember our official acquaintance in Moscow. You also know, I suppose, that I am now on leave of absence and engaged in academic activity here in Princeton. I am writing to ask you to be good enough to tell Mr. Malik, whom I know very slightly, that I think it would be useful from the standpoint of both our governments if he and I could meet and have a quiet talk sometime in the near future. I think that my diplomatic experience and long acquaintance with problems of American-Soviet relations should suffice to assure you that I would not make such a proposal unless I had serious reasons to do so. May 31. Mr. Matthews. Malik received me very cordially and pleasantly in a sort of a summer pagoda adjoining his house, and we talked for some two and a half hours. His general attitude toward the visit seemed to be, I am, as a diplomatic representative of the Soviet Union, always happy to meet with worthy Americans and to talk things over with them. He complained, incidentally, that he was isolated, that people were afraid to see him, etc. I naturally told him that I understood his position very well, having served so long in Moscow, even though I personally deplored the decline of normal and free contact between diplomatic representatives and others. I told him that what I had come to talk about was the problem of a possible ceasefire in Korea. I explained my own status and emphasized that as an official on leave, occupying no responsible post in the government, I obviously could not treat with him formally on behalf of our government. I realized, I said, that this problem of a ceasefire was a very complicated one involving numbers of other countries, and that its final solution would require many things besides just such conversations— but I was convinced that if we were able to ascertain that there was some identity of view between our two governments as to how we should proceed toward it, the other difficulties could all be surmounted, whereas if no such identity of views existed, I feared that any efforts to arrive at agreement elsewhere would be apt to be unsuccessful. I wanted to find out, I said, how he felt about this. 
whether he thought that it might be worthwhile for us to talk about these matters, bearing in mind my status, or whether he thought it would be better for us not to do so, or whether perhaps he thought there was some other form where the matter ought to be discussed. While he refused to be drawn out on this question, he did say that unless he had thought there might be some use in our talking, he would not have agreed to meet with me. In the discussion which ensued, he turned the subject time and time again to general political questions, advancing the usual Soviet propaganda theses. It is my impression that his reason for doing this was probably that our conversation was being overheard and recorded. At least I assumed that to be the case, and his words seemed fully in accord with this hypothesis. I tried generally to avoid this type of discussion by saying repeatedly that I was sure we would not agree on these wider matters, and the best we could do would be to see whether we could not get on with the practical matter at hand. What is set forth below, therefore, about our actual exchanges on the subject of a ceasefire represents not a single continuous conversation, but a series of things which came out in the course of this prolonged dialectic exercise. He wanted to know what I thought about the proposal that all foreign troops be withdrawn from Korea. I said I thought that was desirable as a final solution, but did not believe that anything of this sort could be done immediately. The Koreans, I thought, were not in a situation where they would be able to take over the handling of their own affairs at once. I feared that the immediate departure of all foreign troops would only mean the renewal of civil war on the peninsula. Nothing could be worse than to have the whole thing start all over again in this way. I thought that once hostilities ceased, under some sort of ceasefire agreement, we would have to face the question of the future of Korea, but I was afraid that agreement on that would not be easy for us to reach and negotiations might take a long time. What, he asked, did I think my government's position was with regard to the future of Korea? I replied that as I understood it, it was the position adopted by the United Nations in a series of resolutions, namely that Korea should eventually be an independent and democratic state, but I did not think this goal had to be achieved to the satisfaction of everyone concerned on the day following termination of hostilities. He asked on what basis I thought a ceasefire might usefully be discussed. What terms, that is, I thought my government would approve. With the usual disclaimers about not binding my government, I said I thought it might be useful if we could examine the problem on the basis of termination of hostilities approximately in the region where they are now taking place, recognizing that there would have to be some sort of control authority which could give the respective sides assurance that the armistice would not be exploited by the other side for the purpose of amassing new strength and launching a new offensive. When he pressed for further details, I said that unless I knew whether his government was interested in seeing hostilities ended on something like this basis, I did not think any useful purpose would be served by my going into greater detail— I said there would be plenty to discuss under this concept if we both felt in principle that it was a concept worth pursuing. When he brought up, as he did repeatedly, the question of our wider differences with the Chinese communists, I told him that I thought no useful purpose would be served by trying to couple consideration of the ceasefire question with the wider problem. I thought we could make progress only if we took the specific question of a cessation of hostilities in Korea and looked at it alone and without relation to the wider differences concerning general Far Eastern problems. He said that in this case my remarks contained nothing new, and he was at a loss, therefore, to know what to say in reply to them. He did indicate, however, that if I could make more detailed proposals, his government would be interested to hear them. To this I replied, as indicated above, that I thought no useful purpose would be served by my trying to go into greater detail at the time, in the absence of any indication from him of the views of his government on the general desirability of such a ceasefire. I felt that if I were to try, in these circumstances, to go into greater detail about this, I would be only airing views so personal that I did not think they would be useful to him. When I pressed him to say whether he thought that it would or would not be useful for us to meet again, he was evasive but not negative, saying that he thought that it was a good thing in general for people to talk things over, and that he would always be happy to receive me and to pass the time of day. I had the feeling that his reluctance to say anything more definite on this point stemmed from an unwillingness to indicate that he would ask for further instructions from his government. I therefore said that I would like to give further thought to what he had said, and would come back on another occasion at his convenience, if this were agreeable to him. 
When I suggested several different days on which I thought I could do it, he selected Tuesday, June 5, as the most agreeable to him, provided his duties as chairman of the Security Council did not interfere. We therefore left it that I would return next Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m. in the absence of any further word from him. I think I should add that during the course of the conversation he repeatedly turned the talk to the problem of the Chinese communists and our relations with them, going into the usual propaganda line about how sensitive they were, how we had offended them, etc. I think my own replies to these charges are scarcely of sufficient interest to recount. I did say to him that I thought it would be a great mistake to underestimate the extent to which the conduct of the Chinese communists had been offensive to the American people. I was sure, I said, that ten years of good behavior toward this country on the part of the Chinese communist regime would not suffice to wipe out in the minds of many of our people the memories of the provocative and hostile attitude which they had exhibited toward our representatives and toward this country in general in these recent months and years, not to mention their gratuitous and uncalled-for entry into the hostilities in Korea. The frequency with which he introduced this subject and the emphasis which he laid upon it seemed to me a strong indication that it was in this area, namely of its relationship with the Chinese communist government, that the Soviet government felt itself inhibited in discussing the subject of a ceasefire in Korea. June 5. Mr. Matthews, the following is the report which I promised you by phone a few minutes ago. The reception today was the same as the other time, if anything, even more cordial and with a greater freedom of exchange. After some talk about other things, I again introduced the subject of Korea. I said I had thought at length about our last conversation. I could understand, I said, why the Soviet government might not care to express itself in this way on the questions I had introduced. But there was, as I hoped he would recognize, good reason on our part for making the inquiry. If we were to approach with a view to arriving at a ceasefire, the regimes whose forces were opposing us in Korea, a number of questions would certainly arise in which the Soviet government would surely experience an interest, and in which it would be useful for us to know their views. I pointed out, as an example of the problem, the dilemma we would be in if the Chinese communist forces just disappeared again from the Korean scene. Who could give us any assurance in this case that they would not reassemble their forces and intervene again in Korea at some future date. My host then stated that he was in a position to say the following to me. The Soviet government wanted peace, and wanted a peaceful solution of the Korean question, and at the earliest possible moment. However, since its forces were not participating in the hostilities in Korea, it did not feel that it could take part in any discussion of the question of a ceasefire. He did not know whether I wanted his personal advice, but if I did, it would be that the United States government get into touch with the North Koreans and the Chinese communists in this matter. I told him that I found his statement a clear one and would take careful note of it. I could understand, as I had said before, why his government might wish to take this position. I could not tell him what action my government would take, whether or not, that is, it would wish to pursue the line he had suggested, but if it did and if questions arose in the discussions which were of interest to the Soviet government, but on which, in the circumstances, its views could not be directly consulted, then I trusted his government would take note of the fact that an effort had been made on our side to take account of a possible Soviet interest, and our conversations with others would not be taken as an indication that we were trying to solve the Korean problem for all time with no regard whatsoever to Soviet views and interests. I said that if, as matters developed, they felt the need of any further discussion of this sort, I would be glad to be useful in any way that I could. He replied by reiterating that they did not feel that they could take part in discussions of this subject for the reason that he had indicated. I gathered that this was simply because his instructions allowed for no other reply. In order that the department may have a full record of what was said, and not that it adds anything to the picture of Soviet reactions, I may add that I said to him, in the course of this discussion, that I thought we would find it hard to rely on anything the Chinese communists or North Koreans might promise. He could, I conceded, counter this by saying, do you find it easy to rely on what we say? My answer to that would be that I did not believe in the relevance of the word trust to the relations between great powers with conflicting ideologies, but I did believe in the value of what one actually knew about other party. 
The Soviet government, so far as I could observe, was run by people who took a serious and responsible attitude toward what they conceived to be their own interests. The Chinese communists, on the contrary, seemed to us to be excited, irresponsible people, on the consistency of whose reactions there could be no reliance. He replied by charging that we were the people who had excited them, and by complaining about American statements to the effect that no agreement with the Soviet Union was worth anything. I said that, in my opinion, it depended on the subject of the agreement and the extent to which it corresponded to the interests of both parties. I was sure, I said, that he realized that there could be various attitudes towards agreements, even in the communist world, and reminded him of the reassuring words of Lenin to a disturbed party comrade who had deplored the Brest-Litovsk Treaty and had said that at least he hoped it was not being observed on the Soviet side. In the Brest-Litovsk Treaty of March 1918 with Imperial Germany, the hard-pressed Bolshevik government gave up a huge amount of territory so that it could focus on fighting the whites in the Russian Civil War. Lenin, I recalled, had replied, What the hell do you think we are? We have already broken it forty times. In general, the conversation, like the first one, was replete with efforts on the part of the other gentlemen to bring up the global complaint against American policy. So much for the conversation. Now a word or two about my own analysis of it. With regard to the reply, the following seems to be evident. One, it was plain that he had memorized this statement and attached great importance to it. I got him to repeat it before I left, so that I am quite sure of its tenor. There is no question in my mind but that it represented precisely what he had been instructed by Moscow to say. I am also certain that an instruction of this nature on such a subject must have had Politburo approval. It should therefore be taken as a major policy statement of the Soviet government, more significant rather than less, by virtue of the fact that it was intended for communication in a non-public channel. Two, the words at the earliest possible moment are, in my opinion, highly significant. They would not have been used without most careful consideration. They may even contain a note of warning, namely that if Korean hostilities do not cease in the near future, Soviet interests, in the view of the Kremlin, will be adversely affected. In any case, this is a hopeful sign from the standpoint of arriving at an early ceasefire. Three, I take this reply to indicate that Soviet influence has already been brought to bear on the North Koreans and the Chinese communists to show themselves amenable to proposals for a ceasefire. This should not be taken to mean that their attitude in any such discussions will be characterized by goodwill, sincerity, or cooperativeness. They will make all the trouble they can and probably advance extreme and absurd demands initially. I would think it likely, however, in the light of the Soviet reply, that ceasefire arrangements could finally be obtained from them with firmness and persistence on our part, and at a cost in nerves and temper no greater than that which was involved in the final settlement of the Berlin blockade. For it is significant that on this second occasion no mention was made of the wider problems of international affairs in the Far East, such as Formosa, the Japanese peace treaty, etc. I think this may mean that the Soviet government would like to see a ceasefire, even if it did not involve a solution of these wider problems. We would make a mistake, however, in my opinion, to conclude from this that the Soviet government would be willing or indeed able to put overriding pressure on the Chinese communist regime to abandon, initially at any rate, its desire to see these questions coupled with the Korean question. While I would accordingly attach no absolute and final significance to this Soviet omission, I think it nevertheless an encouraging sign and would doubt that the Chinese communists would be able to maintain their position indefinitely in the absence of Soviet support. 5. While the Soviet government has been reluctant to participate directly in discussions looking to a ceasefire, we may expect that its desires and interests will find some reflection in any positions that may be taken by the North Koreans and the Chinese communists. The North Koreans would be more likely to appear as the exclusive mouthpieces of the Kremlin, but the necessity to coordinate their statements with those of the Chinese communists may mean that we cannot take even their statements as the pure distillation of Kremlin views. Nevertheless, a high degree of Kremlin influence will be reflected in any discussions that representatives of those two regimes may conduct, and it will be up to us to figure out where one thing begins and the other thing ends. For whatever it is worth, I would like to add a word about my impression of my host, whom I had not met before. 
I hold him to be one of the better Soviet types, not just a secret police agent like some of his colleagues. I believe that he is substantially sincere in his enormous bitterness and plaintiveness against the conduct of our government. His sincerity having, of course, a respectable admixture of that genius for rationalization which distinguishes the Soviet mind, I told him that he was making a great mistake in viewing the statements and activities of our government as the end product of some Wall Street conspiracy, and that insofar as these views of his might ever have had any relevance to reality, they were at least twenty or thirty years out of date. This made no impression on him, nor did I expect it to. I was just keeping up conversation. He is interested in this country, but tortured in his interpretation of it by his ideology— his genuine disgust with certain manifestations of American life, and the pathological envy and sense of inferiority that overcomes many Soviet personalities when they view our material achievements. The result is a distortion of vision more pathetic than sinister. You see our country, I said to him when leaving, as in a dream. No, this is not the dream, he replied with a certain air of desperation. This is the deepest reality. One word more, for whatever it is worth. I hope that we will not hesitate to grasp at once the nettle of action directed toward achieving a ceasefire. We may not succeed, but I have a feeling we are moving much closer to the edge of the precipice than most of us are aware, and that this is one of the times when the dangers of inaction far exceed those of action. June 19. More and more I feel myself becoming a receptacle for the confidence of other people, Am I not deceiving them all? Especially when I have so little confidence in them. Not in them as good and worthy people, but in the strength and understanding they can bring to the solution of their problems. I have not tried to deceive them. I have never concealed my own views. In fact, were they to read carefully what I have written or spoken for publication just in the past six months, they could be under no illusions about the chasm between my ideas and theirs. But they never do this. They are not sufficiently interested ideologically. They will come to all this only later. Now they only look at me and believe that I am an honest man and are thereby relieved. Have I any right, in these circumstances, to accept their confidence? Kennan included in his diary a copy of the following letter to Secretary Atchison. June 20. Dear Dean, I am taking this informal means to say to you something which is much on my mind these days. I will ask you to forgive the penmanship, which is not improved by a dislocated collarbone, the penalty of my old-fashionedness in riding a bicycle, and my new-fashionedness in riding it too fast. It has long been my conviction that ever since our entry into the Korean hostilities, the dominant elements in the Kremlin's attitude toward the Korean situation have been a. A reluctance to see this situation develop into an outright U.S.-Soviet conflict, meaning a world war, but b. A mortal apprehension of the appearance of U.S. ground forces either in Manchuria or on the Soviet-Korean border, and of any U.S. air action against Soviet strategic positions or facilities in Manchuria, coupled with a readiness to go to great lengths to deter us from any such actions and to resist them if they occur. Nothing that has happened since the beginning of July last year seems to me to have thrown any doubt on this hypothesis. On the contrary, Soviet behavior has confirmed it at every turn. Of course, the Soviet leaders would like to see us tossed out of Korea. That would solve all their problems as far as we are concerned. But having once made their initial mistake of starting this business on the chance that we would not come in, and having realized the extent of their miscalculation... They are now concerned primarily to liquidate the business on terms not too damaging to their prestige or too disruptive of their relations with the Chinese communists. On the other hand, they are congenitally suspicious of our motives and inclined to regard us as unfathomable and unreliable opponents, in the sense that God knows what they will do. Our talk about principles and the U.N. and aggression is to them only a sign of wily hypocrisy and devious motives on our part. And to this must be added the fact that they are pathologically sensitive about their borders and the areas adjacent to them. And for this reason, the presence of our forces in that vicinity for nearly a year has been for them a nerve-wracking and excruciating experience, straining to the limit their self-control and patience. Now, when we went north of the parallel the first time, I believe it was with reluctance that the Kremlin encouraged the Chinese communists to intervene. 
that this was, in fact, a rather desperate measure on their part, taken because the only alternative seemed to be their own involvement, which they did not want. Now that card has been played, and it hasn't worked. Today, if we continue to advance into North Korea without making vigorous efforts to achieve a ceasefire, I fear they will see no alternative but to intervene themselves. And my reason for writing you is simply to give you my impression, which I admit to be instinctive and not supportable by intelligence, that the silence and scrupulous non-interference in the Korean fighting on the part of the Soviet Union may conceal the most extreme turmoil of decision in the Kremlin, and that the hour of Soviet action, in the absence of a cessation of hostilities in Korea, may be much closer than we think. This action would not necessarily take the form of immediate intervention in Korea. It could be diversionary in nature, in which case a renewal of trouble in Berlin or some special effort to capitalize on the Iranian situation would seem the most likely possibilities. But my antennae tell me that if the Korean fighting does not stop soon, we should watch out for trouble. For this reason, I hope the fighting will stop soon, for a war with the Soviet Union would probably prove a catastrophe for everyone concerned, including ourselves, when all was said and done. And the Korean operation has brought us much greater blessings than we seem to realize, even if it stops now at or near the parallel. Whether they show it or not, the Chinese communists have been taught a terrific lesson. Our action in Korea, so often denounced as futile, may prove to have been the thing that saved Southeast Asia and laid the foundation for the renewal of some sort of stability in the Far East. From late June to early September, the Kennens vacationed near Kristiansand, Norway, where they and Annalise's family had a summer house on a peninsula that overlooked a fjord. In late July, early August, Kennan interrupted his vacation to testify before the State Department's loyalty board on behalf of his friend, the China expert John Patton Davies, Jr., Spending much of the summer in Norway would become a decades-long tradition of the Kennan family. Even while vacationing, George kept up a busy schedule of reading, writing, and working outside. En route to Norway, June 30. The adult world is a broken-hearted world since World War II because there is no leadership in it and no inspiration. New York City, August 3. I was annoyed with myself for my habit of staring after women. What could they give me? Nothing but trouble and disillusionment and the dissipation of valuable strength. I must teach myself to remember that I do not really want them, that this habit is a sort of an echo of youth, and a very misleading one at that. In this endeavor, I reflected, I have the best of all possible allies, increasing age. I went into St. Patrick's Cathedral and prayed, and then I walked again down the avenue, and before me and around me was the parade of women going to work. How ready I am, I reflected, for a new seriousness and dedication in life. If I could only see the light, however tiny, at the end of the long road. August 4. I think I detect an affinity between my own state and that of the old continent of Europe, while the great conflicts raged, people thought that great decisions hung by their issue. But when they were over, it was found they had left nothing in their train but weariness and desolation, and that much that was irreplaceable had really died. Stubbornness, it seems, can be an extremely destructive quality. When I reached the stage when my distaste of myself is more intense than my laziness and gregariousness and love of comfort, then I shall be getting on and life may begin to have a content. Physical desire in a man my age is often like the experiment the teachers of psychology used to use as an example, where a finger pressed to the brow for a time is removed, but the sensation and the illusion of its presence lingers after. What is there to be said of a family? There comes a time, with the passage of the years, when one can love only small children, there is no love more certainly transitory than this. It warms the soul only as the faint sunshine of late autumn sometimes warms the body, briefly and without promise. But by that time one is grateful for very little. It is reasonable that I should look forward with a sense of relief to the prospect of again being an ambassador. In July, Atchison had mentioned the possibility of Kennan's becoming ambassador to the Soviet Union in the following year. 
It is just about the only profession one can have these days in which nothing, but really nothing, is either expected or required of you. September 5. As I leave Europe, my only message to myself in the light of this thoroughly wasted summer is, write, you bastard, write. Write desperately, frantically, under pressure from yourself while God still gives you the time. Write until your eyes are glazed, until you have writer's cramp, until you fall from your chair for weariness. Only by agitating your pen will you ever press out of your indifferent mind and ailing frame anything of any value to yourself or anyone else. Think neither of rest, nor relaxation, nor health, nor sympathy. These things are not for you, for you the written word, but in quantity, in order that there may be enough grain among the chaff. The discipline of language alone can overcome your innate laziness and lack of interest. If dislike for oneself were really, as the religious teachers claim, the beginning of virtue in the sight of the Lord, then I should be on the verge of saintliness. I am ill, of course, with the old malady which is a condition and not a disease. But I am resolved that this time I will not cure it by flying from reality, by running away to the phony protectedness of a hospital bed and a nurse's uniform. If I cannot live in the full contemplation of facts, of the mess I have gotten myself into, of the responsibilities I have incurred, of the long road I must go to arrive at something that would make sense in my life, if I cannot live in this natural hardship, then it is high time I ceased to live entirely. Let the damned sword do its worst. Burn through to the surface, if it must. Perhaps then we will finally get some clarity and harmony into this warring combination of flesh and spirit. But let it not be cured by delusion. Pasadena, California, November 4. My thoughts are full of this Southern California world I see below me and about me. It is easy to ridicule it, as Aldous Huxley and so many other intellectuals have done, but it is silly and a form of self-condemnation to do so. These are ordinary human beings, several million of them. The things that brought them here and hold them here are deeply human phenomena, as are the stirrings of anxiety that caused them to be so boastful and defensive about it. Being human phenomena, they are part of ourselves— and when we purport to laugh at them, as though we stood fully outside of them, it is we who are the ridiculous ones. I feel great anxiety for these people because I do not think they know what they are in for. In its mortal dependence on two liquids, oil and water, which no individual can easily produce by his own energy, even together with family and friends, the life of this area only shares the fragile quality of all life in the great urban concentrations of the motor age— but here the lifelines of supply seem to me particularly tenuous and vital. That is especially true of water, which they now have to bring from hundreds of miles and will soon have to bring from thousands of miles away. But equally disturbing to me is the utter dependence on the costly, uneconomical gadget called the automobile for practically every process of life, from birth and education, through shopping, work and recreation, even courtship, to the final function of burial— but alongside the feeling of anxiety I have at the sight of these people, there is a questioning as to the effect they are going to have and the contribution they are going to make to American society as a whole. Again, this is not conceived in terms of reproach or criticism. There is really a subtle but profound difference between people here and what Americans used to be, still partly are in other parts of the country. I am at a loss to define this difference, and am sure that I understand it very imperfectly. Let me try to get at it by overstating it. Here it is easy to see that when a man is given, as he can be given only for relatively brief periods and in exceptional circumstances, freedom both from political restraint and from want, the effect is to render him childlike in many respects. Fun-loving, quick to laughter and enthusiasm, unanalytical, unintellectual, outwardly expansive, preoccupied with physical beauty and prowess, given to sudden and unthinking seizures of aggressiveness, driven constantly to protect his status in the group by an eager conformism, yet not unhappy. In this sense, Southern California, together with all that tendency of American life which it typifies, is childhood without the promise of maturity— with the promise only of a continual widening and growing impressiveness of the childhood world. 
and when the day of reckoning and hardship comes, as I think it must, it will be, as everywhere among children, the cruelest and most ruthless natures will seek to protect their interests by enslaving the others, and the others, being only children, will be easily enslaved. In this way, values will suddenly prove to have been lost that were forged slowly and laboriously in the more rugged experience of Western political development elsewhere. It is not meant as an offense to the great achievements of the Latin cultural world if I say that there will take place here something like a Latinization of political life. Southern California will become politically, as it already is climactically, a Latin American country. And if any democracy survives, it will be, as in Latin America, a romantic Garibaldian type of democracy, founded on the interaction of an emotional populace and a stirring, heroic type of popular leader. When, as in many Latin countries, this sort of political system must operate within the framework of a great ecclesiastical and civil tradition, it is still compatible with a respectable civilization. But what will be the effect where it starts from the wrong end and represents the disintegration of liberty, rather than, as in Rome, the raising of a structure of law and custom from the chaos of primeval despotism. Will it not operate to subvert our basic political tradition? And if so, what will then happen to our whole urbanized, industrialized society, so vulnerable to regimentation and centralized control? 1952 after arriving in Moscow as the new ambassador in May 1952, Kennan took personally the virulently anti-American propaganda posters plastered on the streets. He was indignant at Soviet restrictions that isolated him and other foreigners from officials, intellectuals, and ordinary citizens. He was also dismayed at the Truman administration's lack of interest in serious negotiations with the Soviets on such pressing issues as Korea, Germany, and the atomic arms race. On September 19, while on a stopover in Berlin, Ken invented his resentment by telling reporters that his isolation in Moscow paralleled that imposed by the Germans after they had declared war on the United States in 1941. On September 26, the Soviet newspaper Pravda sharply attacked Kennan. On October 3, the Soviet government declared him persona non grata. He would be the only U.S. ambassador thus expelled by the Soviet Union. Kennan felt devastated and alone, rejected by both Washington and Moscow, two capitals, seemingly able to agree on nothing except further escalating the tensions between them. He despaired that nuclear war was imminent. Princeton, January 1. The President, having announced during the past week his intention to nominate me for appointment as ambassador to the USSR, upon the resignation of Ambassador Alexander Kirk, thereby making me, as far as the public is concerned, already halfway the ambassador, and this being plainly a mission of which some sort of chronological record ought to be kept for historical purposes and for personal convenience, it occurred to me that this day, the first of the new year, might be a good time to undertake it, for the assignment will begin at once to affect my life in various ways, and its execution will in turn be affected by impressions I receive and things I do at this time. The papers today carried the news of a most curious New Year's message that Stalin had sent to the Japanese people. While the complete text was not carried, it was plain that the message had special significance and that it was in terms offensive to this country. Comparing the present situation of the Japanese people with the position of Soviet territory under German occupation in the recent war, when one tries to interpret this move, a number of things spring to mind, including the obvious Soviet discontentment with the terms of the peace treaty, the rivalries between the Moscow and Peking factions in the Japanese Communist Party, and the present military vulnerability of the Japanese islands in view of our preoccupation in Korea, all of which must have been prominent in Stalin's mind. Peking was the English name preferred by the government of the People's Republic of China for present-day Beijing. But all one can conclude is that the Kremlin attaches exceptional importance to the Japanese situation at the present juncture. January 7 and 8 Received a visit Tuesday afternoon from Professor Herbert Frankel, a South African who I understand to be at present a professor at Oxford. He wanted to talk about colonial questions, 
linking his interest to the approach he felt he had noted in the publication of my Chicago lectures, Kennan, American Diplomacy, 1951. He wanted to know what I felt we could do in general about the great arc of underdeveloped peoples spreading from Africa to Southeast Asia, about the development of their attitudes toward the West, etc. Explaining to him that my views were those of no one but myself, I told him that I did not think one could generalize about this problem, there being tremendous differences between various countries and regimes. In most instances, I did not feel that the local popular leaders were capable at present of looking at the problem or discussing it in calm and rational terms. It seemed to me that things would have to happen that would cause them to become conscious, on the basis of their own experience, of their need for ties with the West and of the necessity for regarding Western nations with respect as a prerequisite to the maintenance of such ties. If these things could be brought home to them no other way, I thought the West had no choice but to leave them strictly alone in their own affairs, merely retaining, and if need be by force of arms, those facilities and sources of supply which had already been available to Western nations for long periods of time and had entered into the pattern of our security. In this, I said, the West ought not to be terrified by threats that such and such a country would go communist if it were not cultivated and wooed by the West. The effect of any widespread of communism in that area would certainly be to enhance the centrifugal forces within the communist orbit. The raw materials, except in parts of Africa, were not really vital to us at this time, nor would they be wholly denied to us. And as far as attitudes were concerned, an hysterical and childish nationalism was little preferable to, or different from, what we would see if they were to go communist, so far as our interests were concerned. What we needed were cool nerves, the determination to hold, by force of arms if need be, such strategic and economic facilities as were vital to us and could be held without excessive cost and effort, and a continued readiness to work loyally and helpfully with any group in that part of the world that was willing to recognize the realities of our own position and the respect we deserved as a decent and serious force in world affairs. January 18. In writing today to Reverend John Bodo of the First Presbyterian Church of Princeton, New Jersey, to inform him that I wish to meet with the session and be received as a member of the church, I added the following. I am afraid that even as a member of the church, I shall be a very imperfect Christian, but I find myself weighed down these days with the realization that responsibilities are now being placed upon me so unusual and so vast in their implications that I have no chance of coping with them to any good effect except in a spirit of dedication to purposes higher than myself and greater than myself. What I have to do can be successfully done only from an inner posture of humility, conviction, and self-renunciation. This imposes a duty of preparation and self-discipline for which I need the help of the Church." and I believe I would be guilty of the sin of pride if I did not accept it. I am aware that this is not a fully adequate approach to the duties of a confessing Christian, and that in particular I should be thinking not of myself, but of what I might be able to contribute to the church community. But the burden I am to shoulder is not one of participation in any local community. It is one that I must bear far away and in loneliness." in an atmosphere of the most heartless and contemptuous challenge to everything the Church stands for, where people can even exhibit all the evidences of outward success and power to bolster their thesis, a man is most responsive to appeals to his fears and jealousies and resentments, and least responsive to those sides of his nature that Christianity values. To reside in this place that we can, without exaggeration or poetic liberty, describe as the most impressive example of hell on earth that our time has known, and to reside there as the leading representative and exponent of the world with which the Christian faith is today most prominently identified, is surely a heavy and unusual task for any Christian. And perhaps this one may be forgiven if he concentrates his attention at this time on the problem of how he can best cleanse himself and brace himself spiritually for the ordeal. Kennan included in the diary a note he wrote to Chip Bolin and Dean Acheson, which follows in the next entry. January 23. There is one thing, however, that hangs over me so heavily, and that is my concern at the continued evidences of what seemed to me to be a sweeping and fateful misunderstanding underlying our approach to the peoples of Asia and the Middle East. 
I am no specialist on these areas myself, but the evidence seems to me so eloquent and incontrovertible that I fail to see how its major lesson can be mistaken or questioned. Would you mind if I spoke my mind to you on this subject with complete frankness and informality? Surely one of the reasons for our continued failures throughout these areas has been our inability to understand how profound, how irrational, and how erratic has been the reaction generally of the respective peoples to the ideas and impulses that have come to them from the West in recent decades. This applies particularly to the intellectuals who play so prominent a part in political leadership and in the molding of public opinion. To ascertain the reasons for the intensely anti-American attitudes manifested by these peoples would be to delve deeply into psychological reactions and the origins of various forms of neuroses. I have thoughts about these matters, but will not take up your time with them here. Only one thing I would emphasize. The respective reactions are obviously emotional and subconscious, and not likely to be altered by any attempts on our part to meet them by any verbal appeal to rational processes. If our Asiatic friends are to be brought to a more sober and sensible frame of mind, it will be through their own experiences. And these we can help to condition through our actions, hardly through our words. The sort of actions likely to be useful in this connection are severely limited. To date, it seems to me that most of what we have done has had the effect of pouring oil on the fire, since what is eating at the hearts of so many of our Asian friends is really the question of status, aggravated by a burning sense of inferiority and jealousy of us for our riches and for the relative security of our position, anything that gives them the possibility of demonstrating weakness or vacillation on our part or a degree of dependence on them, indulges their yearning to feel themselves important and is grist to the mill of their preconceptions. The maw into which our favors and concessions and acts of generosity are entering is bottomless. These people can consume an infinite number of our kindnesses, just as they can consume infinite quantities of our material goods. And when all is said and done, there will be no more to show for the one than for the other. On the contrary, favors and kindnesses will be normally hailed as evidences of our weakness, our dependence, and our ignominy, and exploited as proof of the cleverness of those who succeeded in extorting all this beneficence out of the silly Americans. The main psychological effect of our pressing various forms of aid on individual governments will be, it seems to me, to convince the peoples generally in that part of the world that in addition to being white and imperialistic, we are stupid, uncertain, weak, and obviously on the skids of history, and that they are more important than anybody ever told them they were. Let us not deceive ourselves into believing that the fanatical local chauvinisms of the Middle East represent a force that can be made friendly or dependable from our point of view, or one to which we would have any right to engage ourselves in the moral sense. Beginning in 1951, the democratically elected Iranian government of Mohammad Mossadegh attempted to nationalize the rich oil fields and refineries owned by the British-owned Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. In 1953, the CIA intervened to overthrow Mossadegh in favor of the Shah. It may, in certain circumstances, be useful to our short-term interests that such movements should continue to exist and to manifest themselves as independent movements, since nationalistic fanaticism and extremism are obviously less dangerous from our standpoint than an association of respective peoples with the more powerful and disciplined force of Soviet communism, which might be the alternative but both these forces, the nationalist and the communist, are dangerous and revolting. They have similar origins and traits. Both are by nature hostile to us and incapable of contributing anything positive to the type of world we must seek. The Iranian message demanding withdrawal of the British consulates was Bolshevik in tone, spirit, and content, and reflected the debasement and medievalism of international practice common to both movements. If then we encourage nationalism in that area, we should do so in the cold light of calculated self-interest and should let our people know what we are doing. Above all, we should not deceive ourselves into hoping that out of it can come anything with which we ought to be associated either morally or politically. These chauvinistic movements, permeated as they are by violence and immaturity, will breed bloodshed, horror, hatred, and political oppression worse than anything we see today. And the only relevant question is whether they do it in a way susceptible of exploitation by the Kremlin to the advantage of its purposes and the detriment of ours, 
or whether their workings have a different effect. Let us then, first of all, avoid associating ourselves with these forces in any relationships of military alliance. The answer to this will, of course, be, but what of the strategic importance of the territory of these countries, and what of the facilities and privileges we require in that part of the world for the security of the Atlantic community? I fully grant the validity of this consideration, but I draw a sharp distinction between this problem and that of our political intimacy or popularity with the local regimes. To retain these facilities and positions, we can use today only one thing, military strength, backed by the resolution and courage to employ it. There is nothing else that will avail us, least of all attempts to incur the benevolent predisposition of these dreadful characters, who in many instances bear the responsibility for a local political leadership, and on whose bizarre frames the trappings of statesmanship rest like an old dress suit on a wooden scarecrow. The Western world has no need to be apologetic about the minimal facilities and privileges it requires in the Middle East. Most of these have already been in existence for long periods of time, and there has grown up around them a right of usage similar to that of my country neighbor, whom I permit for years on end to drive over my property to reach his own. The thesis to which we acquiesced in Iran, that such arrangements can be cancelled or reversed abruptly on the basis of somebody's whim or mood, is preposterous and indefensible. It is a dangerous distortion of the concept of sovereignty. But beyond that, the British and ourselves have a responsibility of the most solemn and far-reaching nature, which prohibits our being spendthrift and overgenerous with things that represent the strategic assets not of ourselves alone, but of the entire Western world. The commitments we have undertaken to our allies in continental Europe and elsewhere place us in a new position, that of an agent as well as a principal, and charity by consequence is beyond our competence. Such things as Abaddon and Suez are important to the local peoples only in terms of their amour propre, and an artificially inflamed amour propre at that. Abaddon is home to a major oil refinery in Iran. The Suez Canal is an artery of global commerce. To us, some of these things are important in a much more serious sense, and for reasons that today are sounder and better. <laughs> leave these people to their own devices, two things can happen. Either they continue to stew in their own tantrums and furies, exacerbated by the revelation that the United States is not going to continue to fuss over them and tickle their sense of self-importance, and they finally get tired of it or fight among themselves, or they yield in one degree or another to Soviet influence and lose in whole or in part their own power of decision. In the latter event, Pro-Soviet regimes are to be expected, but not necessarily or even probably any attempt at full Soviet occupation, unless there is a world war. In either event, our basic interests can best be guarded if we have quietly and firmly dug in betimes at those places that are really vital to us. Had the British occupied Abaddon, I would personally have no great worry about what happened to the rest of the country. Similarly, if we and the British were to consolidate the position at Suez with utmost determination, relying on no one but ourselves, who would be there to challenge it? The Russians? Possibly. But again, only in the case of a Third World War. The local peoples? Can we really seriously maintain the thesis that at a time when we are spending 30 or 40 billion dollars a year for defense, we cannot, despite the Korean campaign and our other urgent commitments, handle a military problem which the Israeli army was easily able to handle several years ago with very little manpower and with equipment that would surely constitute an infinitesimal part of what we turn out in one year. What I would plead is that we make up our minds at this time precisely what, in physical terms, it is essential that we and the British hold on to in the Middle Eastern area. I don't pretend to know what it is, and I speak here of Abaddon and Suez only by way of illustration, and that we then take steps in whatever manner is most suitable to see that these objects, if they are in any way jeopardized by local hostility, are militarily secured with the greatest possible dispatch. If we do this quietly, with determination, and without being apologetic about it, there may be a great many flamboyant words and a certain amount of brandishing of weapons against us, 
but I doubt that there will be much more. I am afraid we are once more, in this case, up against an ultimate reality of world leadership, the one we see in Korea, and one many of our people don't like, and that is that there are situations in this world where not even worthy and necessary ends can be achieved without the application of force. And not just force applied in great blind occasional surges to the blare of trumpets, but rather taking the form of wearisome, endless, unpleasant vigilance in extremely unpleasant places.